Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Future of Food Forum. I'd ask you to please take your seats, get settled in, and let's get ready to go. I just wanna say welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Harper, so I'll be your host today. I have uh, some counterparts helping me out. Andrea Bond is right here. So if you have any questions or concerns, come to one of us. Andrea can uh, write a little sticky note and give it to me and I'll make the announcement. Okay, um, so I wanna make a few quick announcements before we get into the program. Um, first of all, if you have a cell phone, you may have forgotten to do this because, you know, we've been in a pandemic, but you should put it on silent and uh, ignore it. <laughs> this is a time for you to focus on the here and the now and being here in person. Um, I think if you have any questions about uh, facilities, you can just go straight out and there should be someone out there at the desk that can point you in the right direction. And in terms of masking, I just wanted to make a note that this is um, the standard messaging for the university. It's face masks are expected. And you can check the website of the CDC today to see if we get out of the red zone. We're, we're really close, we're almost there. So fingers crossed. Um, and then I'll ask the speakers, of course, take off your mask. Uh, there will be a lunch today. It's gonna be a box lunch. It'll be served here in this room. And we're gonna have a couple breaks during the morning and the afternoon. We have two breaks. So make sure to check out the posters over here um, and talk to the people who created those posters. I think you'll find them really fascinating and enjoyable. All right, so with those amount announcements, let's go ahead and get started. I wanna say officially, welcome to the Future of Food Forum. Yes, let's. I actually want to ask a question first of you. Uh, I wonder for how many of you, this is your first in-person event of this year of 2022. If it is, please stand up. Is this your first in-person conference? Please stand up. So few of you have already done a, a, some meetings. Thank you, you can sit down. Um, but I think more than half of us, I know for me, it's my, my first time. Uh, and it makes me think back to two years ago when we hosted the first Future of Food Forum in January of 2020, thinking 2020 is gonna be the best year ever. And then we got to 2021 and we thought, let's try this again. So in the fall, we organized this forum, Future Food Forum. We were all ready to go in the fall of 2021. And then, you know, the variants came. So we decided to try one more time. So I think this time we're gonna say the second time is the charm. So here we are in person. Uh, this is gonna be a great opportunity. And so I even wanna say one other thing about the cell phones, besides putting it on silent, there's this amazing feature um, if you push this button for a long time, it actually, you can actually turn it off. I know most people don't know it exists, but there is an off button. So let's turn off our cell phones, tune in to what's going on here, focus on the here and now, and really just enjoy that we're here in person. I mean, it's a minor miracle, right? <laughs> um, okay, so for the first part of our session today, I'd like to welcome to the stage, the Senior Vice President, of IFAS, the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences of the University of Florida, uh, Scott Engel. No, I'm not welcoming Scott Engel. All right, so I am not Scott Engel. <laughs> Scott will join us a bit later this morning. I'm Rob Gilbert, uh, Dean for Research, UF IFAS. And on behalf of Scott, uh, I want to offer you a, a very warm welcome to the University of Florida for this important and timely forum on the future of food and reducing carbon footprint of our food systems. We hope you're able to visit uh, UF during your stay if you're coming from out of town. We're very proud at UF IFAS, uh, being the number one university in research spending in agriculture and natural resources according to NSF data, reflecting our broad programs across agricultural food systems, natural resources, and human systems. However, as proud as we are of our breadth and impact, no one institute or institution can solve the complex problems we face today as a society. Multidisciplinary and multi-institutional collaboration is vital. 
We're very fortunate today to have distinguished speakers from multiple universities, industry groups, foundations, and government agencies, which is fitting as no issue uh, requires a greater marshalling of resources and sustainably feeding our growing population while protecting our environment. I am convinced that working together, we can identify and implement innovative solutions that will strengthen our food systems while providing ecosystem services that reduce our carbon footprint. Please take this wonderful opportunity today to learn from and connect with our speakers. And thank you again for your interest and engagement and welcome to the conference. Thank you. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, University of Florida, President Kent Fox. President Fox joined UF in January 2015 as our 12th president. Under his focused and steadfast leadership, UF has advanced to a top five public research university, and we're now hiring 100 faculty in artificial intelligence. President Fox is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and has received numerous research and teaching awards. Please join me in welcoming President Fox. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, and indeed, what a delight to welcome all of you. Uh, if you're visitors, welcome to the University of Florida. And if you're a part of the University of Florida community, I'm glad you all are here participating in this important forum about how you all, how we feed the world and how we do it uh, in the midst of reducing the carbon footprint of feeding the world. I wanna start with a very special thanks to our keynote speaker, Eric Fearwald. He's CEO of the Syngenta Group, and he's gonna to speak to us by virtual link later this morning. Mr. Fearwald and Syngenta have been out front in embracing the role of agriculture in feeding the world and in, in indeed mitigating the climate change and its impact. So we're gathered here this morning in a, one of our University of Florida signature buildings, the Wright Student Union. And I wanna very briefly draw a connection between this building between global events that are occurring as we speak and between that and the focus of our forum this morning. The building's named after a former University of Florida president uh, and he served as president from 1955 to 1967. But before he was president, he was doing something useful and that was that he was an agricultural economist and he was a government agricultural administrator. During my tenure at the University of Florida, I have enjoyed reading some of the speeches of those that have come before me as presidents. And a little over 70 years ago, in January, 1951, Dr. Wrights addressed an audience that was gathered to talk about agriculture, but his mind was on global affairs. The United States had just entered the Korean War the previous summer. And in his speech, Dr. Wrights was clearly worried about the well-being and the freedom of people in another part of the world. Students have been barraging him with questions about whether they should drop out of the University of Florida to join the armed forces. Business people and other citizens, he said, were hesitating to make plans for the future because of their perceived uncertainty about the world. And in this speech, Dr. Wright said, and I quote, I'm fully aware of the state of confusion, the uncertainty, the strain and tension which confronts most of us at a time like this. Many ask, what can we as individuals do when caught in the web of circumstances which seem so far beyond our control? Now that home, that question hits home right now, given the circumstances around the world, specifically the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the latest report from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was released on Monday. The report concludes that the window for meaningful action to forestall the worst impacts of climate change is closing and that we increasingly face what the report called an atlas of human suffering. Again, quoting from Dr. Wrights in 1951, he said, what can we as individuals do when caught in the web of circumstances which seem so far beyond our control? Well, what I find and uh, appreciate so much about this conference is its answer that much like in 1951, our sharpest minds and most innovative scholars and the industry leaders are putting forth what Wrights called, quote, the greatest possible effort in service, in this case, to the agriculture profession, while keeping the world better and also our democracy, in this case, top of mind. When circumstances you all seem far beyond our control as individuals, we indeed, as a community, 
particularly as scholars and researchers and practitioners, can put human ingenuity to work. We question assumptions, we innovate, we rethink, we conduct research, and through our discussions and our work together, our presentations and the research, we can reduce the carbon footprint of food systems and indeed feed a growing world. You all are charting such a path forward in an absolutely critical domain of human sustenance, both in terms of feeding a growing global population and as you all know, reducing the impact of climate change. And I'm so thankful you all to our university's Food Systems Institute for bringing you all together for these presentations, for your input, for your discussions. And I'm really optimistic because of you all that indeed we will find a way to better our world and the human condition. Thank you all, very best wishes for an inspiring, impactful and indeed fruitful conference. Thank you all. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Adebola Adashogan. He's a professor in the Animal Sciences Department in Ruminant Nutrition. He's director of both the Food Systems Institute and the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems from USAID. From Nigeria, uh, Bola joined us as faculty at UF in 2001. His research focuses on sustainably increasing animal source food production and consumption. He's produced more than 200 referee journal articles and $70 million in grants. He is a Beaufort International Animal Agricultural Award winner from the American Society of Animal Science and past chair of the Council of the Feed the Future Innovation Labs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adeshogan. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, President Fox. It's really an honor to have you here. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Thank you so much for joining us this morning for this um, special event. We are thrilled to have people here from different parts of the world, different parts of the US. We're thrilled to welcome you to Gator Country, sunny Florida. Um, it's cool now, but um, in a few hours, we'll have temperatures in the 80s. And uh, for those of you who don't know, this is probably one of the only places in the US where you have the luxury of using your heater in the morning and your AC in the afternoon in your car. So um, this meeting was organized to address what has been described as the biggest threat to the global economy. That was by Antonio Guterres in 2019, the Secretary General of the UN. President Fox referenced the latest IPCC report that was released this week. And I'm going to read a quote from that report. It says, people's health and livelihoods, uh, as well as property and critical infrastructure, including energy and transportation systems, are increasingly being adversely effect, affected by hazards from heat waves, storms, drought, flooding, as well as slow onset changes, including sea level rise. People and systems and ecosystems least able to cope are the ones being hit the hardest. In Florida here, we face the threat of sea level rise, the rising temperatures. We have had some really hot days. In fact, having temperatures in the 80s at this time of the year is unusual. So at the first Future of Food Forum about two years ago, I was privileged to be invited by Jim Anderson who led that meeting to speak on what will livestock production be like in 2050. And I suggested, or I, I, I mentioned that livestock production will be carbon neutral in 2050. And I think quite a few people were surprised that I would say something like that. So why are we here? We're here because we want to number one, showcase what is already being done to achieve carbon neutrality of food systems. There is a fantastic amount of work that's already been done. Some of the practices already been adopted by our clientele, our industrial partners. Many of them have committed to be carbon neutral by 2040, 2050. And we wanted to showcase what is already being done to tell the story 
because many, many people out there don't understand how agriculture is already working effectively to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Secondly, we wanted to discuss what needs to be done to complement what already has been done to ensure that we have resilient agricultural systems that provide wholesome and healthy food in ways that protect the humans, plants, animals, the environments, and protect um, biodiversity. So we have assembled an exceptional lineup of speakers, captains of industry, whose companies have set deadlines to be carbon neutral, outstanding producers who are at the forefront of adopting carbon neutral practices, distinguished ac academics and researchers who are breaking ground in showing us new ways to mitigate and uh, adapt to climate change. And then senior leaders from funding agencies that have a major impact in improving the world uh, across the globe. And so I would like to urge us to make the most of this opportunity we have to learn from each other, to network and develop new partnerships as we strive to build a resilient, wholesome food system that is carbon neutral, that preserves biodiversity. Thank you and enjoy your time with us today. Thank you, Bola. Everyone knows him as Bola, and that's my boss, by the way. UF is very lucky to have him. Uh, so we're gonna move on with the program, and I'm gonna contradict myself a little bit now and say you can turn on your cell phone if you want, because we would love you to send some tweets and uh, Facebook posts and other things about this hashtag Future of Food Forum. So please go ahead and uh, do that while we're talking. We know you're still focused on the topic of the day. So I'm gonna to welcome to the stage our moderator for the next session, and then she's gonna explain how things are gonna be going. We are gonna have a virtual, oh look, ooh. <laughs> don't look behind you when you're at this microphone. <laughs> I'm very huge, but I, I also wanna thank Bola for making me feel short. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna have a virtual session. Um, you know, we are still uh, coming out of this pandemic. So for various reasons, some people were not able to travel here, but we're gonna make the best of it. Um, I think the rest of the day is all in person. So that's actually pretty amazing. We're able to pull that off. So I'd like to welcome um, a professor here at UF in the Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering, Katie Miliapcho. Katie. So I'm the first short speaker today. Um, I'm very delighted to be here. And I, I'd like to say that the Food Systems Institute is a very important part of what we do in IFAS, as well as what we do in the Agricultural and Biological Engineering Department. Our first speakers, um, hopefully are going to inspire you today. They are gonna talk about solutions, which I think is, is why we're all here. Um, we heard a very inspirational opening from our two um, speakers this morning, and I look forward to hearing our three coming up. They are virtual, so they will be joining us um, via Zoom. The first speaker is Saskia Visser. She's the program director of the Knowledge Development Program for Circular and Climate Neutral Society at Wageningen. Saskia brings partnerships that jointly seek for circular and climate neutral solutions that contribute to the realization of the SGDs. She makes use of the theory of transition management for the large scale implementation of circular and climate neutral solutions. Within the organization, Saskia works on topics like circular agriculture, sustainable food production, climate smart land management and land use optimization. Saskia is currently co-coordinator of the European Joint Program on Agricultural Soils under Climate Change. And I'd also like to introduce my co-moderator, I'm Matthew Johnson, who's with Syngenta, so we're very happy to have him here today as well. So I'll turn it over to Saskia. Yeah. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you. 
Uh, and indeed, I'm very sorry that I cannot cannot be able cannot be present with you uh, physically. Uh, I just got went for the test to fly to the US, and there I turned out to be positive. So good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Saskia Fischer. I'm program manager at Circular uh, Climate Neutral Society, and I'm going to present you something on the work that we are doing within my program on circular agriculture and how the 250 researchers uh, at Wageningen University and research work together to really make a progress in the knowledge development to support the implementation of circular agriculture. Let me start by introducing you a little bit to the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a tiny country in the northwestern part of Europe. You may know it from the tulips and the windmills, but the Netherlands is also very big in producing food. And with an export value of 105 billion euros, we are uh, a nice runner up just after the USA uh, in regard on uh, agricultural export. Well, besides having this very big export and producing a lot of food, we also have our issues related to agriculture and they must be known to all of you. So there are issues related to climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, soil health, uh, and well, all these e examples that you can imagine. And that's why in 2018, our Ministry of Agriculture came with a new vision, a new perspective on agriculture. As he said, agriculture, nature and food are valuable and they should be connected. And very closely following her vision, uh, she said, okay, let's start with a plan of action, really making a systemic change in the way we produce our food. And uh, this plan of action really had a very large commitment to knowledge and innovation. Uh, it requires a solid economic base for producers. And promised favorable legislation and regulation to, to facilitate this transition. Well, always nice to have policy supporting this transition, but then what are we actually talking about if we're talking about circular agriculture? Well, this one of my colleagues, Imke de Boer, Professor Imke de Boer, who, who started describing the vision as he says, okay, we human being, we are requiring biomass, biomass for food and biomass for non-food like clothes and electricity and bioplastics. And this biomass is being produced on our arable land, on the natural waters, on the grasslands and the forest. And the first principle of circular agriculture is, is that we should use all our arable land for the producing of food directly for humans, which means not producing feed for animals. And that's a very big assumption and very big difference if you see that 35% of our Dutch agricultural land is being used currently to produce feed for animals. Well, obviously also in a circular agriculture system, we still have animals, uh, but they are going to be fed from the side flows, the crop residues, the co-products that occur while processing and preparing the food for the humans. And this really brings a new position of the animals in, in the whole circular agriculture production because they transform biomass site flows that humans cannot or will not eat into proteins that are suitable for human consumption. And they also create manure, which is good to improve soil health. Well, then next, uh, there is also, uh, next for the production of food, there's also a demand on land, on biomass for the, circular, uh, for, for the bio based economy. And this brings along a, a del delicate balance between choices. What do I, land do I use to produce what uh, for, for food, for biomass, for, uh, for grassland, for nature? And this is the whole system transformation that we need to go through if we want to put it in practice. Well, bringing from a vision into practice, we started rethinking, okay, what in a circular system would open cultivation look like? And if you start thinking about the vision, we need to have an optimal use of arable land for food. And while finding that optimal use of arable land, uh, we have to minimize the use of fertilizers, minimize the use of fossil-based fertilizers, and nature, uh, think about the nature-inclusive cropping systems. But well, one of the responses was to come to a strip cropping systems. And this is in a photo, uh, is an example of the production system uh, currently being applied here in the Netherlands, and it's also being adopted uh, in Germany for farms. 
And in this uh, cropping system, you'll see that the crops make an optimal use of the available nutrients in the soils because you have a different rooting depths and therefore you, you will use less fertilizer. It also reduces the use by the whole crop systems. We have also known that, I still, I hope you still hear me. Uh, we have also learned that uh, in such a cropping system, you, we will receive uh, in average higher yields. Uh, so it's also from an economic perspective, a good use of the land. We do still have uh, quite some challenges and that is about, well, the best trip width is approximately 1.5 meters and our machinery is, well, to a minimum of three meters wide uh, adapted for strips. Uh, so there are high labor demands related to, to this strip cropping, which require maybe a robot, robotization innovations. There's a need for new crop varieties, which perform best uh, in, well, uh, in the strips or in at least in competition or in collaboration with each other instead of in a monoculture systems. And there will also be new skills for farmers because they are, won't be, uh, well, dealing with a, with a monocrop. They have to rethink the, their rotations and, and their adoption. So there will be also innovations in education needed. But it can be done. And so this brings a new perspective. If you start thinking about the livestock, how to change livestock, I, the, the most important balance in there is how much animal-based protein can we use from the, from the land that it's consuming. And if you look here in the, uh, in the blue star, this is where you see the balance between animal-based proteins and the optimum of land use. And you will see that we calculated with circular land use, we can still produce quite a high amount of animal-based proteins in a diet and using even less land uh, compared to the current production system. We therefore need to rethink what we feed the animal and what are the side flows. And we also have to rethink what we do with the manure that we use in the Netherlands. Also for animals, we have some good examples of, of, uh, of farmers already adopting this and show, showing that uh, there's this system is actually working. Well, as I'm also a program manager, we, we only, do not only look at the total production system, we also dive a little bit deeper into, into some specifics and just some examples of coming out of my program. Um, we have investigated the potential of biomass streams from food processing, retail and catering. And we use that for a BSF production. And we have found out that these yields could replace typically 50 to 75,000 uh, ton soybeans, which is approximately one third of our input import of soybeans, which, are, which is directly fed to the animals in the Netherlands. We have investigated alternatives for pesticides. We have found out that crushed feathers can improve resilience of sugar beets against soil pathogens. And I think that's an important insight that we now need to think about how to how to make that part of a mainstream. We have also looked at uh, adoption of new technologies and we have learned that within the EU farmers have have generally a higher trust on their peers. So they like to build digital relationship with other farmers and form communities of practice and they actually tend to change their practices based on the information provided by their by, the, by their peers which is an interesting way to think about if you want to scale up some, some tools. Well, we have looked throughout the Netherlands and we have found out that we have, have 169 pioneering farmers that have adopted some kind of circular principles and prove it's possible to be sustainable and still earn a good income. We have seen that living labs, uh, which is becoming a very important tool throughout Europe. They are key in transition processes uh, and in living lab environment, the social learning is the main function of the whole experiments. So, uh, but we also have seen that a living lab is a very rich learning environment, but we see there's a very poor exchange of ideas and solutions between the different living labs let alone between a living lab and a non-experimental area. So for the upscaling. So this is where we need to start focusing on. 
and then looking at the whole overarching cost for circular agriculture to become mainstream, we have seen that there are many interventions. They have long-term business, uh, but they have long-term business effects. So it's pretty difficult uh, also in this thing to compensate for the increased labor. So uh, a few circular business options that exist, they will indeed sell themselves, but we are uh, in need for more policy management to, to, well, to, to innovate or to, to improve the transition towards circular agriculture. And there are some options that re require regulatory changes. So we are in discussion with policy to see what are the opportunities to, to make these changes in regula regulations. So this was in very brief time, an overview of my program and the research that we are going to. If you are interested to hear more, you can attend also this conference to find more, but we'll also continue in our debate later on. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. Our next speaker is Ramiro Cabral. He is the Executive Vice President for Elanco International. In this role, he leads Elanco's international commercial operations. Romero brings a lifetime of global experience across diverse portfolios of animal health to his position. In over 20 years with Elanco, he has been a valuable member of the Elanco team, serving in roles including technical sales at Elanco Argentina, global marketing manager, beef business unit director in the US affiliate, an affiliate director at Elenco Canada. Prior to joining Elenco, he worked on his family's farm and served as a consultant in the veterinary and agribusiness industries. Romero earned a doctorate of a veterinarian medicine degree at UNI CN Argentina in 95 and a master's of business administration from Purdue University in 2005. Please join me in welcoming Romero. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Katie. Can you see the slide? Yes. Very good. So it's a, it's a privilege to be here with you. And I'll introduce a little bit of Elanco very briefly. Elanco is a global animal health uh, company. We have uh, been serving farmers, veterinarians, pet owners around the world for almost 70 years. And we innovate and we deliver solutions to prevent and treat uh, animal disease. But we are very committed uh, to the one health approach of healthy animals, healthy people, healthy planet. We have been uh, very active in our local communities. We, we were honored to be named top 20 in the change the world list of fortune because of our work on, on in sub-Saharan Africa with smallholders too. But as I move to, to the discussion today, I think uh, livestock industry farming families and us in animal health are in the intersection of these two global challenges of feeding more people while uh, cooling the planet. And we are part of the solution, as I mentioned, in the animals, outside of the animal, and in the food chain. We create, I believe in the concept of shared value where it needs to be profitable to be sustainable. And we, from our capabilities and mission on animal health, we are very focused on the point number two here on making animals healthier, make them more efficient, more productive. They can produce more food with less natural resources. 20% of animal productions are being lost to animal disease. So the role of animal health is a very important role in this journey to net zero and one health. So in the next slide, I show two US examples of our portfolio of solutions 
helping livestock farmers to reduce the carbon footprint of their milk or meat production. These are just two. We have other global examples in Latin America, in Europe. We have assessed the impact of some diseases on, on carbon dioxide equivalent emission of, of a cow with ketosis, for example, in Europe. But in the US, if you see dairy, just the use of a, of a feed additive that keeps the, the rumen healthier, produce three and a half percent the footprint and a combination of solutions in the, in the diet in beef, 9% reduction of carbon footprint. Those are just two of the multiple examples where the animal health industry can make a difference for farmers, for the animals, and for the planet. Now we in Elanco want to go beyond that. And we also want to, to work not only on innovation and, and animal health solutions, but we also provide services. And this analytics service, we've been providing a benchmark solution for beef farmers in the US for more than 20 years. Now we are upgrading that solution and we are going to launch a tool called AppLook that will use that data and will provide farmers with measurements of their baseline and the tools and advice to attack sources of emissions and possibilities with husbandry to reduce carbon footprint. But also we are collaborating here in Indiana um, with a startup that we are helping to initiate. That is, it will help us have a, an ecosystem, an economical ecosystem for farmers and the food chain to profit from their effort on cooling the, the planet and reducing emissions and carbon footprint. And this company, new company, Atian, Will, will be certifying and aggregating uh, some of these efforts from farmers and trying to keep that income within the industry, not just exporting uh, carbon credits. And the final point is communications and the narrative. And that's a part of our promise is we advocate for our customers. And, by having been born in a small town in Argentina where cattle production was the livelihood of farming families, being the son of a veterinarian and a veterinarian myself, I, it's part of my mission, but many of us in Elanco, a personal mission of speaking up for farming families who love the land, who love feeding the world, and who will be part of the solution. That's uh, maybe my closing remark here. Thank you. Thank you, Romero. Our last speaker is Paola Gavadane. Um, Paola is Director of Innovation and a member of the Management Board of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Paola owns a master's degree in food science and a PhD in food biotechnology. She has over 25 years international experience in the agri-food industry, where she held different leadership roles in R&D and innovation at corporate level. Paola collaborated with the Mass Challenge Switzerland and the Kickstart Zurich Accelerator Programs as judge and mentor. She was member of the industry board at the Integrative Food and Nutrition Center of the Polytech of Lucerne. So please welcome Paola. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? 
Yes, it works. Ah, okay. And the slides are there. So I think I can start. So good morning to you. Good morning again from Europe. Uh, as uh, Katie said, I'm the director of innovation at EIT Food. EIT Food is the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. In the next slide, uh, I will take you through our approach and some of our activities uh, that, that we are dealing with and that can create impact on uh, planet and people health. But before I move on, a few words about EIT Food. EIT Food is a European non-profit organization which is co-funded by the European Union. We bring together in a large ecosystem organizations from the industry, research institutes, universities, startups, and foundations, and all with the aim of accelerating the innovation process and to transform the agri-food system. We, as EIT Food, we act as a catalyzer, a catalyst, or an orchestrator of innovation in this uh, panorama. So, um, our approach. So, uh, our strategy is first of all, our strategy is completely aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but also with the most important policy in Europe, that are the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. And according to our agenda, we are committed to deliver impact on four goals. As you can see here on top, one is an improvement in the condition that lead to trust, more trust from consumers and citizens in the food system. The second is the direction of health, a better health outcome from diet, so from the nutrition. And in particular, here we talk about the non-communicable diseases and for example, obesity. The third one is enabling to a transition to a circular and sustainable food economy. And the fourth one is improved food system environmental impact. So moving to the next slide, this, is, this slide represents how we, uh, we, we the, the areas of impact where we see we can bring really a potential to reduce the carbon footprint. As you can see from the outside uh, circle, um, this represents the whole value chain. In the middle, you see six what we call focus areas. Indeed, EIT food is um, focused on these six areas of so protein diversification, a sustainable agriculture, and nutrition more targeted at groups of population, aquaculture, the traceability, and in particular, the digital transformation of traceability, and the circular, circular food system. And then in the middle, we have two what we call cross uh, area enablers. One is the consumer centricity, the fact that we really have con always consumers at the center of what we do. And the second one is the digitalization, which is an important enabler for all our focus areas. So as you can see around here, if you start with the top left, this is represented the primary sector. So this, the, uh, you know, the, the initial uh, part of the, of the food value chain. And these are all areas where we are active. Uh, for example, the food loss, but also all the areas of processing um, uh, and the reutilization of waste streams. Uh, also on packaging, packaging of goods, transportation and the retailing, all the way until you know, consumers and, uh, and finally the diet. And here now I, um, I can show you some of the uh, examples, some of the examples where we are active. And the first one is uh, related to sustainable uh, agriculture. We have several projects in sustainable agriculture, but this is an initiative which is quite particular and involves the regenerative agriculture. So this is practically a, a group of 14 uh, companies. You see here some of their logos of which EIT Food is part of that are you know, multi-stakeholder organization that they are working through the whole food and agri-food agriculture uh, value chain. And they come together under the so-called carbon plus farming journey coalition. We will develop cost-effective and practical solutions that will accelerate the uptake of sustainable agriculture, such as regenerative or climate smart practices. The coalition aims to keep farmers at the center of the decision making. So partners will innovate with farmers rather than for farmers. 
And in this period, the coalition launched a large scale uh, farmer survey to understand the barriers to implementing sustainable practices. And the results will be published, uh, I think, by the end of this month. This is another uh, interesting example. We are talking about an environmental label. So we aim with this, uh, with this to support uh, consumers in making their choices and taking into account not, so, not only, for example, the, the nutritional uh, component of the, um, of the food product, but also the environmental footprint. Two models are now in a test phase, and these two models, they differentiate by the methodology to calculate the, the, the let's say, the, the, the footprint. Um, EIT Food contributed, funded one of the of these initial projects that now is continuing under the leadership of Foundation Her. And as you can see, one is more a European pilot, the second is more a UK pilot. I am moving forward also to another initiative. This is what we call a cross-kick initiative. Why? Because as you can see on the bottom, it's not only EIT Food, we are part of a bigger family, but there are also other uh, EITs that are focusing on other thematics that come together into a much broader project. In this case, the project is about uh, uh, implementing a water saving economy in Europe. It is in fact uh, executed in the south of Europe and is facing the problems of water shortage and drought and the drought issues. There are uh, um, countries so they have established the uh, water academies in countries like Italy, Greece, and Portugal, where they share knowledge based on needs assessment to build capacity of local authorities, industry, farmers, NGOs, and SMEs. And here you can see what is interesting on the left, some of their KPIs, the key performance indicators of the project that are not only targeting the, the, the food system, but as you see, for example, cities like repairing leaks in public sup, uh, supply networks and also the public water consumption. The next example um, deals with the bakeries. Uh, and in particular, the, the SME, so the small and medium uh, size of bakeries, there are more than 150,000 in, in Europe. So the, the ProBake project that we are uh, funding uh, is, deals with the optimization of bakery processes uh, by a computational tool developed together with consumers that will help to minimize the ecological footprint and food waste. So it's a optimi an optimization tool that uses uh, uh, artificial intelligent technology and the digital trainings to uh, simulate and optimize the production processes of SMEs throughout Europe. And uh, taking into consideration several inputs, it is able to give uh, the contribution to, uh, to these bakeries on even multiple product processes and resources consumption, and, and uh, at the end also on the environmental footprint. I'm moving also to the last example, and this is uh, the project Metamorphosis. This is an interesting project because it is using um, it is using food waste from the food industry on which uh, insects are growing. Uh, the idea is to produce uh, insect protein from this waste stream. And uh, the first project that was running in 2019 and 2020 dealt with the production of uh, an, uh, an ingredient for uh, aqua feed, so for formulation of uh, uh, feed for salmons. And then the project evolved and Better Origin is one of our scale-ups, so one of the, uh, the grown-up startups that, we, are, uh, that we, are, we have in our accelerator program. Um, so the business model moved and moved from the aqua feed into uh, creation of uh, units. Like you see here a container on the left. The Better Origin X1 is a, is a container completely automated and powered by artificial intelligence and with low maintenance. That is now what is uh, uh, the main business of uh, this uh, startup. And in this case, it is used, for example, it's very flexible. It can be used also in, at the farm level. In particular case uh, here, uh, it was utilized at the poultry farmer. 
And finally, I come to another uh, type of activities that we are doing. Here we are talking about uh, our public engagement uh, uh, program, uh, Food Unfolded, where we ask a service to, um, to thousands of, Itali uh, sorry, of uh, European citizens, uh, different questions. I have highlighted here, and I think on the sustainability, two of them are quite significant. 85% uh, of the respondents, they think that uh, sustainability and the environment, they think about sustainability and the environment when they buy food or drinks. And 79%, so nearly 80% of them, they find it nevertheless hard to buy sustainable products because they don't know exactly in which way they can contribute to this process. At the moment, most of the consumers, they tend to uh, act on packaging or on the transport, for example, uh, privileging uh, uh, products that are coming, uh, for example, they are closer in terms of markets. And then the last thing, and then I conclude, is this other uh, question that we ask. Uh, so are you willing to pay more? I think this is a key question for food that has a lower impact on the environment. And we have quite a high uh, number of respondents that are really willing to pay more. And with this, I have concluded. Thank you very much for your attention. And these are my uh, contacts in case you want to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. So you'll notice there's two microphones in the room. If you have a question you would like to ask our speakers, please um, proceed to the microphone. I know that my guest moderator has a question that he'd like to start off with. Does, it, does this work? Can you hear me on the on the Zoom? Yes. I think it's. Uh... Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. So uh, a question for the three panelists and uh, in, in, uh, in this context of, of what we're hearing about circular food systems, uh, technologies that can be applied to animal proteins and, and then uh, with, with Paula in the last discussion around this, this notion of consumer behavior around uh, sustainability. And, and all that's implied in, in what appears to be a, a bit of a lack of trust in the, in the question of sustainability. How can countries uh, work in, in such a way that we find the balance between what clearly is society's interest in finding sustainable food systems with the need to ensure that our farmers remain viable and profitable uh, and, and that we're not asking the farmers to take responsibility economically for uh, the, the needs of society at large. And I think you know, all, all three panelists may have a very different vantage point and a different view, but it's, it, it, it's a growing concern. So how, how do you find that balance to ensure our farmers uh, are not asked to bear the, the burden of, of, of something that we all say we want uh, in this world? Maybe uh, I could ask Paula to start. Yes, I can you hear me? Yes, I'm again back. Um, this is a very, very important point, and uh, it is indeed coming up when we have consultations with our, uh, with the, the partner and the organizations of our uh, ecosystem. Um, I don't think we, I think we are really at the moment still at the very beginning. So there are no clear answers. We are starting to work with farmers and we see that uh, they are still a bit skeptic and they still um, bring us this type of, uh, of concerns. Um, I think that is only working together. First of all, it is a question of really working with them and is a question of, of training uh, farmers and I think that Saskia had an interesting also opinion on this that I think she, she probably would intervene after me. So it's really the way how we can train them, how we can educate them, how we can educate the different generations and how we can bring this into, you know, into something a concrete and scalable uh, type of, uh, of, of, of process. Um, we, we are just starting, as I say, I don't think we are there absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear if my, um, colleagues, they have uh, a better opinion on how we can solve this. 
Yeah, if I may, I'm also trying, yes, I'm trying to work on my battery at the same, same time because it's pretty low. Do you still hear me? Yeah. Um, so I do have I do have an an ID on uh, on on the whole whole principle and obviously um, the burden should not be with the uh, with, with the farmers alone and what we need to realize all together and also that includes politicians politics and policies is, is that we need new norms and new values on where we want to go to if we really want a systemic change and moving towards a way more sustainable way of producing food is really a systemic change in the way we produce, in the way we live, in the way we eat. Uh, there is a need for general agreements. What do we think will be the new normal? Where are we going to? And what will be that in that is such a system also be, well, the economic system, the balance systems, and what do we reward in that sense? So, uh, we need to agree, and that's a strong interaction between science and policy, and uh, maybe also uh, science and, 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 and the corporates uh, in a dialogue to say, okay, what, what, what are actually the planetary boundaries and what does that mean from, the, from, um, from a production perspective at the global scale and also at the national scale and maybe even to the regional scale. And from there, we have to think about, okay, what are then the principles and then what can we produce? And from there, everybody can start taking action. Dutch farmers are angry with our policy. Uh, and the reason why they are angry is because policy each time keep on, keeps on changing their, their the, the rules and the laws. And uh, so they invest in something without knowing that in the, in the future they can, can, can still benefit fit from that investment. So it should be really the dialogue, science, policy, farmers, all stakeholders in this whole thing towards where are we going together? And I think that's that will be the most important first step. And from there, uh, well, also the cost will not only come then to the farmers, but then to, to the whole of society. Yes. Maybe Ramiro, you want to add uh, something no, to that? No, <laughs> just incremental comments to those. We try to make these solutions profitable for farmers from the start. So the solution that improve the health of animals before we launch one, we secure that there is a clear return on investment. So reducing ketosis in Europe is profitable for the farmer and reduce 150 kilos of carbon dioxide per cow by preventing ketosis preventing bloat in Argentina by reducing methane emission on cows on pasture, reduce mortality 80%, extremely profitable, three to one, five to one, seven to one. So on our medicines that make animals healthier and more effective, we have a clear path to profitability. Then we do share value in East Africa where we try to bring the bottom of the efficiency livestock system closer to the most efficient systems. And that in itself is good for community development. We are helping 120,000 uh, smallholder farmers and growing that. And we try to make that a sustainable business. But then what do we do in Europe and the US with very efficient farmers and systems and that's when we need policy. And we are trying to shape these new startups that create a, a financial incentive and ecosystem for farming families not to burden with 100% of the cost of cooling the planet. Are there any audience questions? There we go. We're good. Um, do any of you have a behavior change specialist on your team? Because this is what it's sounding like. Because we know farmers trust each other. We know that you're gonna have to find somebody who will lead the pack and let the rest follow. So 
do you guys have someone working in that direction with your teams? In, in our case, we have uh, technical consultants in the field for, for improvement. And we have a corporate communications team that is very vocal, uh, helping food companies that may be competing with each other in the market, but uh, above competition uh, communication for all of us to advocate for sustainable livestock and farming families. So very active communication, very active in the field support, maybe not behavioral um, psychologist, not that I know. So if I can, if I can just add uh, to this, uh, okay, our consortia are created are really multifunctional. So there are different uh, type of, uh, of expertise in the consortia of, uh, of projects. Um, probably on behavior, not, uh, I didn't hear about project where there is someone really experts on behavior change, but as I said, the, the, the project like this example in the south of Europe, we are really working directly on the ground with farmers. So there are no big, you know, uh, uh, um, so it, it's really very practical. There are, there are uh, projects that they really act uh, on the ground and, uh, I think, as I said, this is a type of, you know, training and, and explaining simple procedures and, uh, um, you know, is this type of education that at the moment is in place. Yeah, and to complement on that, uh, behavioral change is an, is an important line of research that we do, uh, behavioral change to facilitate the transition. So this idea of finding what are the new norms and values, also behavioral change in choices of consumers uh, while saying, yes, we want to live more sustainable, but when it comes to the wallet, you know, do you really make this sustainable choice? So we do perform a lot of research on, on this circular behavior. And there again, it's, uh, it's said, you know, circular behavior is really much more easy if policy supports your circular behavior. I'm not sure to which extent you have uh, also these piles of paper with commercial coming through, coming in your mailbox, you know, seeing the latest commercials from your supermarket. Well, we have a system in the Netherlands where you can put a sticker on your mailbox saying, no, I do not want that. So what you, as a consumer, you need to do is to make the effort to order a sticker to put it on your mailbox saying, no, I do not want this unsustainable product. You could also turn it around and say, okay, the policy is that nobody gets it until the one who needs, wants to have it, puts a sticker on his mailbox saying, hey, I want this unsustainable product. So policy can have a very large influences in, uh, in more sustainable behavior, if you would want. So, yes. Oh. So to follow up a little bit on that, each of you come from a different background. Oh, I think we may have lost one person. Um, and I think that shows how, as, as Saskia said, moving to new norms over the food system will be difficult and be comprehensive. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how each of you work with other groups that have other products or other interests to bring the whole system together um, and, and more of a, a united food chain type of answer instead of just your particular interest. I can give the first, uh, the first go, uh, but this is uh, this is really the base of the the meaning the existence of of EIT food is really to bring these different actors together um, we start from you know that really is very 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 different but we might uh, call for project proposals where we really ask different actors to to come together and to come even from different regions of of Europe um, we have regions that are more privileged in terms of innovation uh, speed and regions that we call risk countries that are less privileged and we want them really to work together. We have other uh, settings, other, other you know, ways to, to bring together these actors, for example, in what we call the think tank. 
So here we, we call really the most active uh, organizations in a specific subject, like now we are working on protein diversification and really ask them to, uh, to talk about their needs and to share their needs and to find really what we call the sweet spots where one organization alone cannot make it to bring you know, up to the policymakers, for example, but if there is a common voice, we can create uh, something together, we can create documents, we can create um, supporting evidence uh, that can be uh, used in in the further, let's say, uh, you know, activities and processes of regulation and policies. So this is probably what Saskia was referring to. I don't know, Ramiro, if you have more to add. I changed my background here uh, <laughs> to show an event that we hosted uh, before the UN meeting on the COP26 around food systems. And we aggregated uh, probably 70% of the US food production companies to debate about how to jointly commit to a journey to net zero. And there was a declaration from chicken producers, beef producers, milk producers, very large companies committing to that journey and a declaration that was shared with, with the United Nations um, event. We have done it before too on hunger uh, and we are helping different sectors that are all uh, in our customer segment and also competitors to to go above and beyond the, the competition and and commit for for the good of the planet for one health. Last year we were discussing how to bring together people from different parts of the food system to to deal with some of these big issues like you had mentioned earlier. Um, if you'd like to add a little to that conversation. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh somehow I got switched off. Um, to bring people together, uh, I think, uh, well, what, you, what we see going on in, in Europe is this living, living labs uh, activities. Uh, so this is more, a little bit more regionalized, but uh, well, we have some good examples. I think Paola showed so, some examples also of the different chain parties bringing all together. Um, you can also see that in a more practical re, re, uh, way of working, and that's where we bring uh, up what we call in the Netherlands the green circles, and that's where you see uh, large corporates, uh, like for instance uh, a company like Farm Frights, together working together with the province policymakers, with science, and with farmers to think about producing well uh, carbon neutral fries for instance that, that that is one one of the lines and in this li living labs what you see is that the social learning the joint ambition really brings the br brings the people together throughout the chain increasing trust and also increasing the will to invest also for a longer term uh, yeah longer uh, return of investment id uh, so uh, yeah, that's what I would give as an example, bringing the different parties together. Mm -hmm. oh, Another question there? Yes, I have a question. Um, in one slide that Paula shows, um, it's clear that, that they try to classify the different commodities according to the greenhouse gas emission. So I just wonder how you classify uh, this impact because the methodologies are not completely clear. Uh, and maybe this classification, the future could be a, a, a barrier for exporting some products from a less efficient system in developing countries. What is your talks about that? Thank you. Okay, I will answer in this way. Uh, I am not, let's say, the expert, so I cannot give you now examples of these two methodologies. And but I can tell you that this subject is uh, is creating a lot of debate in Europe, and uh, and not only recently. These two pilots, they are still pilots, so the work is still not concluded. There are no 
you know, general adoption of, of any of the two, but this, let's say those where we contributed and those that are somehow more advanced. Now, it's obvious that already, if you think about the, the, the labeling on the, the nutrition labeling, for example, in Europe, there is a lot of debate. So there is no common voice, let's say on this. Most of the products, they have now one type of labeling on, on nutrition. Eh? but not all agree. So there will be always some disagreement with this system. This system creates a very simple link, you know, between a very complex, huge system with one color or with one number or with one letter. And so there will be always, you know, things that are not captured, things that are falling out or things that are misunderstood. Now, uh, I think that uh, once the, the main debate will, uh, you know, will be sorted out and, and we will agree on, on what is the main system and methodology to use, probably this should be seen like a real, uh, a basic indication to, to the user, to the consumers. So not be seen like, you know, the, uh, the, only, um, the only way to, to classify, but it's really an indication. So this is what I can tell you now. I don't know if anyone wants to contribute to this. It's anyway not, not yet there. As I say, it's still very, very under, very much under discussion. Other questions from the audience? I have a question from Ramiro. Um, you mentioned a carbon credit uh, program and you mentioned paying carbon credits for emission reduction through feed additives, but is there also carbon credits awarded for sequestration in soil and how do you see that working and also curious about carbon credit programs used in Europe or if that's considered. Very, very good question. I think the, the small startup that that we are helping uh, initiate in Indiana is uh, within their scope. They are going after also sequestration as a, as a key uh, action as well. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not very familiar on the how much this company will work yet with carbon credits in, in Europe, but I think maybe even for our European colleagues can, can share more on the how that carbon credit system is helping European farmers. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I can say a few words on, on, on uh, carbon farming. Um, we see in, uh, throughout Europe, we, we, we see initiatives coming up, you know, testing initiatives to, to uh, well, at least for carbon farming, uh, relating increasing the soil carbon. Yeah, the Cutter Cut Mill initiative has, has gained a lot of intention. And we see first initiatives coming up, rewarding farmers for the increasing the carbon stock, uh, stock into their soils. We also know it's a very hard thing to do to actually measure the change in carbon year over year and to, 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 uh, to make payment schemes for that. So therefore, well, these are test ups, but the European Commission has uh, set up its, uh, its strategy for uh, its soil strategy throughout Europe. And in that, the carbon farming initiative is very, a very large thing. So I will see it rising and coming up, uh, becoming more common in the next two to three years throughout Europe to really award farmers for uh, yeah, carbon, for the farming of the carbon that they do in the soils. And this is a big on, on the big debate at this moment. And I think maybe Paola knows also a little bit more about it. Oh no. I am besides managing this circular, climate, uh, circular uh, agriculture program, also managing a European wide program, agricultural source on the climate change. So within that framework, we do a lot of research, provide a lot of policy advice at European level uh, to stimulate this kind of carbon farming in Europe. Maybe, yeah, I'm not sure if that sufficiently addressed the question or you have further questions on that. With a question out to this side of the audience. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Felipe Amaro. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Animal Science here at uh, UF. 
And my question is, will producing food in a sustainable way always cost more than in the non-sustainable alternative? And if the answer is yes, how are we going to provide sustainably produced food to the developing countries that may not be able to afford the increasing costs? Thank you. You're going to take it, Paula. <laughs> yeah, Paula's got this one. <laughs> I, I think, I think here yeah, uh, we need. Uh, it is not a, a clear, you know, easy answer. Here yeah, is is a huge topic. We should really open, open plenty of discussion. Um, I don't think I have a solution now for you. Uh, we are we are of course working on it. Uh, there is a path. There is a long path to to go. Also because it's the simple targets that, for example, in Europe, they, we, we have been given by, by the European Union are still very much, uh, very far away. And uh, we still need to do a lot of work to, to implement things, to make sure that we achieve this net zero target. And, uh, you know, the years are, 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 are going on and, and we see that we are behind and we really need to do something. So before we come, um, and we can provide solutions uh, to even to to the to the more to developing countries. I think we have to to help our you know our regions first. So it's not not a, not not a solution at the moment for me. I, I don't have a solution for this. Mm -hmm. Well. Um... There are, there are many things going through my mind if I'm talking about uh, sustainable production and the cost of food and, and so on. And um, first of all, if we are now calculating the true price of food and in, including uh, the environmental impact, then the price of food is not so attractive because it becomes very expensive. However, if we do manage to totally change our production system, the true price of food will also not be that high compared to what we do now, because we're thinking, we including the damage uh, for the true price of foods that we are producing with our current production systems, and we need to change that. So that's the first thing to do. What we have done, uh, if we think about circular agriculture production, we have applied these principles of agrobiodiversity, low pesticides, low fertilizer income, also at the poorest community in Ethiopia. And what you see there is the technology level is, well, well in these areas, these are food aid dependent, we're food aid dependent people. Uh, so the technology levels were pretty low. So what we did was a combination of, well, agro, uh, agri-diversity, so, pretty, you know, not the strip cropping, but even more uh, smaller plots uh, of, of diversity producing, increasing some kind of fertilizer combined with high le good level of seeds and composting. And then thinking about the agri circular agriculture pr principles, we could easily raise uh, food production uh, up to like three to 400% in these areas really well, migrating these farmers out of the food aid and becoming totally self-sustainable for food. And we, we applied this over 40,000 farmers uh, in Ethiopia. So it, it, uh, and they produced pretty sustainable, not without fossil-based fertilizers, but still very sustainable in uh, managing, well, the, 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 the local cycle of, of the nutrients uh, and earning, uh, well, at least a higher income compared to what is currently their mainstream at that level. So there's a lot of room to improve there, but you start from different position from the European agricultural system. So also there, good examples exist. And I think Ramira, Ramira also has the proof for that. Yes, no, I, I think we have the East Africa project from small holders, but also technologies to improve the health and efficiency of pasture cattle in Latin America that help farmers being more profitable while uh, help more sustainable as well. So I think there is not always a competition, uh, but there is a need for incentives and for fair trade, I'd say.
And maybe something that has not been mentioned, but I think that the role of innovation, so keep innovating, keep discovering and, and optimizing technologies that maybe at the beginning, they still have a high price and cost. And then, you know, with, 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 the, with, the, with the time, uh, it, usually this is the cycle of, of innovation. So keep investing and uh, in innovation. This is my recommendation. Good morning. This has been a very, very interesting discussion. Um, my question is related to the fact that we're asking farmers to reduce uh, footprint and, and increase their efficiency at the same time that we, yeah, we have seen climate risk increasing in mean, the extreme events and et cetera. And I wonder if any of you is working with the idea. We have seen this year in Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, tremendous losses. Uh, are you working with ideas that will combine the two approaches that we can help them uh, reduce their footprint, but at the same time, reduce risk because it's increasing and this brings a, a, an opportunity maybe. I'm taking it if, if people allow. Um, what we need in the future are resilient production systems that are sustainable. Obviously, we need to take into account climate change. So for, uh, in areas where we have an increased drought, we need to think about uh, less, water, less water usage, uh, increased resistance against drought, maybe even resistance against uh, salinization in the, those areas. Uh, and uh, well, my answer to that would be really to think back to uh, nature-based solutions. Having a, a large agri-biodiversity will also reduce um, the risks of, uh, of, of, well, related to, 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 to climate change, uh, related to drought or, or high climate, because you have a different period of ripening, of, of harvesting of, of your fertilizers. And this strip cropping or even going, going at a lo lower scale um, pixel farming is a really good a good risk avoidant uh, avoiding approach in, in into such a system. Thinking about really finding different crops, different varieties, different species that we are used to looking forward. So what what if we have a climate change? What if we have a temperature rise? What would be smart to invest in for the upcoming ten years if we know that drought will be increasing? These types of questions we should ask when designing our, our production systems indeed, and put our innovations to that. Maybe somebody to add. Uh, yeah, in, in addition, we have in our pipeline of research and development products designed to have a positive impact on, on the planet. And by having a positive impact on the planet, we reduce the risk. Uh, so that's, uh, products designed to reduce ammonia emissions and we had one approved in the US product, product designed to have methane reductions emissions too in, in Australia and Latin America but the way that we contribute to reducing risk is healthier animals are more effective and more profitable and that's our that's our mission and ensuring that our solutions are profitable for for the farmer. May I ask you a question? Are you also then looking at the breeding programs? So what types of breeds do you? Yeah, we are not in genetics. Sure that they... We are not in mm -hmm. genetics, but there is a big opportunity in in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Same for 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 crops. I I believe. Yeah. We've got four minutes left, maybe time for one, one more question from the audience here. Uh, good morning, my name is Silvino from, from Brazil. Uh, my question is, in some countries uh, like Brazil, uh, we need, uh, we need the, the, this practice like uh, no-till and plant rotation and the cover crops, build, build up soil fertility to uh, increase the yields 
and the reduce risks and the increase the resilience of systems. You need this because you have a lot of problem with plant disease, especially with plant disease. Uh, my question is the way to improve the sustainable technologies should be show that this, this practice can help farmers increase yields and the resilience of your systems. Thank you. Maybe some more. So, so ask you, can you follow yeah. the question? Yeah, <laughs> obviously, um, you know, for all changes that we ask farmers to perform, we have to prove and tell and show them how it works and why they should adopt. You know, it, 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 uh, it is needed for them to know why they should invest their time and their, and their money. So if we talk, start thinking about a new cropping system uh, to produce that increases soil health, increases resistance of crops against uh, soil pathogens, uh, increases the resilience of the whole system, we have to show and to prove that it actually works. And that's why we have these demonstration farms and uh, these testing farms, so that far farmers can uh, not only learn from the scientists, but also learn from each other by visiting each other uh, to see what is their experience, what is their daily, how did they change their daily life, and what will be the effect eventually on their income and the, and, and, and the amount of effort they, they have to put, put in. So we should not tell, simply tell farmers, you have to do it because you have to do it. No, you have to do it because it could be of benefit for yourself in a certain way. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I hope it sufficiently answered the question. Yeah, Maybe somebody like else that. had, some of you have to, something to add, Ramiro, Paula? No, I think making it profitable. Yeah. I think the, the interest in it is that making it profitable, the way we should look at it is not only making sure you have a higher income for this one product that you get out of it. So it's not only, the milk, the meat, or the tomato that is providing a value for you. If you start thinking about a more sustainable production system, you have to think about, okay, what if I do not use these fertilizers or these pesticides? In case of the living lab example that I was just telling about with farm fried pota uh, uh, potato farmers and the province, they, they said, okay, maybe the water board is interested in a more sustainable use. And actually the water board was interested if farmers would uh, increase the carbon uh, in the soils and also reduce the use of pesticide because they would have less costs. So they would reduce the taxes for, for the water board for the farmers. And that's also a part of the whole economic system or the, 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 the household book I say for the farmer. And so thinking of, uh, economic profit, we also have to change what we look at. We look, we have to look at the whole system and not only uh, the price of the, the product they make. And maybe, you know, from a tomato, you, you can sell the tomato itself, but you can also sell the tomato straws and the strengths because you can make excellent paper out of it. Mm -hmm. It's not the only one. And in the future, at least I believe in the Netherlands, uh, if we get rid of fertilizer, fossil-based fertilizer, I think manure, which is now, you know, a cost to get rid of it, will, will gain a very high price, especially for, uh, for uh, open cultivation farmers. So, and, and these are all elements facilitating this transition. And I think the manure will be, you know, the, the, the future gold uh, in the Netherlands, uh, whereas it's now it's really a problem. <laughs> okay, um, I think we're out of time. I have the wrap up sign. So I want to thank our excellent speakers today. I appreciate your time. I know that your time zone is different and this probably wasn't as convenient <laughs> as for us here. So thank you so much for being with us. We've heard some solutions today that will hopefully um, help you as we continue in our conversations. And I believe we're up for a break. Is this true? Um, so everyone enjoy some coffee and some treats and we'll be back in a few. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.
Let's take a break for 20 minutes. Okay, so welcome back. This is the waste not session of the Future Food Forum. And we have some great speakers and panelists and time for Q&A again after this. So we'll be continuing this conversation about circularity that has just started, right? So I'm curious about this. Where did this come from and where is it going? So I'd like to welcome to introduce our next two panelists, the uh, professor that you may know uh, from the Department of Wildlife, Ecology and Conservation, Jack Payton. Thanks very much and good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to our next panel discussion uh, called Waste Away. You know, most of the discussion on the future of food uh, revolves around the production of food, which, which it, it should be, and trying to come up with answers to uh, how do we grow more food on less land with fewer inputs of fertilizer, pesticides, water. But as uh, most of you know, there's another aspect to all this and that's food waste, it, we waste an awful lot of food. And it's not just the food that uh, we as individuals, families, restaurants, et cetera, throw in our garbage, but it turns out that the way we package food, food packaging also contributes to this huge amount of food waste. And it's a double-edged sword. So not only does it take away from our ability to feed future populations, but because of the waste, we have to build incinerators. We have to create landfills. And it turns out that, that where that food waste ends up causes tremendous amounts of methane to be emitted from those landfills contributing to climate change. So we have two speakers today to address the issue of food waste. And I'll introduce both of them before we begin the discussion. Our first speaker is someone we could claim as our own, and that is Dr. Zainet Bas, who is an assistant professor in the US IFAS Department of Ag and Biological Engineering. And I say we can claim her as our own because she received her doctorate from the IFAS Ag and Biological Engineering Department. Her background includes education and research in food engineering, packaging, and food systems sustainability. Dr. Bas has been a Fulbright scholar and has worked as a senior research consultant at a packaging technology and research company. In this role, she mainly focused on sustainability and food loss, waste reduction through packaging technologies, and became committed to tackling sustainability issues in the food industry. Her current research interests focus on the synergies between sustainability and digitalization in food systems. She is also active in various circular economy concepts and applications in the food industry, such as reusable food packaging. Dr. Boz currently serves as the chair of the Institute of Food Technologists, Sustainable Food Systems Division, and as the editorial board member of the Journal of Food Science and Packaging Technology. She is also an affiliate faculty of the UF Food Systems Institute and an external advisory board member of Canada's Smart Healthy Cities and Training Platform. The title of her presentation is Harmonizing Sustainability Approaches in the Food Industry, Processing, Packaging, and Industry 4.0. Our second speaker will be Michael Ferrari, who is president of the Consortium for Waste to Syngas Circularity a nonprofit focusing on science-based solutions to return waste into an endless loop of circularity. Mike is growing the consortium, attracting industry members to align on the environmentally responsible transformation to create a world without waste. Mike also is one of our own in that he received a degree from UF in mechanical engineering in 1978. Procter & Gamble Company in Cincinnati, Ohio, recruited Mike where he completed a successful 32-year career as a global R&D director. 
including six and a half years as an international manager living in Germany. He delivered initiatives to the marketplace for some of the world's leading billion dollar brands. He is the sole and co-inventor of several patents and winner of the prestigious 2009 and 2010 DuPont Global Packaging Innovation Award. Upon retirement from Procter & Gamble, Mike founded Ferrari Innovation Solutions, coaching consumer product companies to, the delight, to delight consumers and grow their brands through packaging innovation. Mike is a guest lecturer at the University of Florida to the Packaging Engineering Program, teaching consumer-driven innovation methodology. And when he's not doing all of this, he enjoys the ocean breeze and living the life in the Florida Keys, sharing the message of environmental responsibility. Mike's presentation title will be the future of food packaging and food waste sustainability. And we'll have our question period when both speakers are finished. So uh, Dr. Boss, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Dr. Payne, uh, for the nice introduction. I'm delighted to be here and uh, speaking at this um, great uh, symposium and forum. And today I will be talking about the uh, sustainability approaches and then some harmonizing um, approaches related to processing, packaging, and industry 4.0 digitalization components. Um, so we had excellent speakers in the agricultural production and animal systems and dairy systems we also have in the afternoon. But uh, in this session, we will be uh, talking a little bit more about the other aspects after post-harvest packaging, processing, and what happens after that. Um, and I will try to convey my uh, message related to sustainability as well as waste. Okay, so um, despite the vitality of uh, foods, uh, food system is not sustainable, food systems. And modern food systems is falling short in terms of addressing the ecological impacts, greenhouse gas emissions, and then feeding a population that is growing. And an ongoing pandemic is actually further exacerbating this, this issue. And one solution is basically, is, um, is basically uh, looking at systems, uh, food system as a whole, and then taking physical infrastructures, human infrastructures, and information infrastructures as a whole, and then tackling them together. Like that. Okay. <laughs> it's not advancing, but okay. I can't see it here. Is that okay? You can see both, yeah. Uh -huh. This is no, not sure. No, no. <laughs> I have to, anyway, I'll look at uh, the screen like this. It will work now. <laughs> Despite the vitality of foods, um, as I mentioned, the, the majority of, of the foods are wasted, and that's 30 to 50 percent. And the original report by the FAO stated that it was 30 percent, but it's actually much more than 30 uh, percent, and, and that changes based on product type and, uh, and the location, of course. Um, and also 8% of the greenhouse ga gas emissions are emitted from, um, from the food waste that we actually uh, waste. Um, this is because of the linear, linear nature of our food systems. And then that's the approach is take, make, and dispose instead of uh, gaining value out of, out of these uh, valuable resources. One solution and then... Uh, a renewed interest in circular economy actually started with Ellen MacArthur Foundation recently. And then Netherlands, as, as you saw in the previous uh, presentation, is actually flagshipping uh, the circular economy. What, what is circular economy? Circular economy is actually decoupling economic growth from the um, emissions and then the environmental impacts. In that way, we have uh, both economic growth model as well as, as our environmental uh, considerations uh, assessed separately. And then the principles are regenerating natural systems and nothing is wasted, designing out waste and pollution, 
and then keeping the materials and products uh, in use as long as possible. And we can do that by narrowing the, the circles, loops, uh, slowing down the loops or closing the loops. And um, on the contrary to the common belief that it's only reduce, reuse and recycle, which was um, popular uh, a decade ago, uh, there are several framers actually that are looking at um, how we can achieve circularity in different ways and in different product life cycles. Uh, one of them is actually based on a publicational report came from that came from the uh, Netherlands Environmental uh, Association uh, Department. And then um, they, they actually created this nine R framework. So the first option is always refusing to waste, right? Or uh, as a second option, if we can't refuse to waste, then rethinking, reducing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing, remanufacturing, repurposing, recycling, or recovering. So as you can see, recycling uh, can be an option and closing the loop is, is an important aspect, but there are a bunch of other opportunities to create circularity. And I will be talking about not only waste today, but how we can actually achieve that with um, different uh, solutions or different aspects of the food system. So first, processing. Uh, in the United States, 15.9% of the uh, foods consumed are uh, moderately processed. Uh, sorry, this, this is actually not uh, reflecting the correct one, but this is actually 60%. We consume uh, our products highly processed most of the time. And then there's, um, there is limited attention on the processed food and processing, even though we use a lot of and then consume a lot of uh, processed foods. And that also contributes to uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the water use, energy use. For example, post-harvest processing uh, contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in, to the extent of 10 to 15 megatons uh, carbon dioxide uh, per year. Um, from the energy perspective, uh, we have drying, storage, storage, uh, food and beverage processing, cooking, evaporation. Uh, food and beverage processing constitutes the highest uh, amount of, of the energy use, so uh, additional energy uh, or greenhouse gas emissions come from that. It's not again, that's nice. okay. So what type of processing are out there that are emerging from uh, energy efficiency and then waste reduction perspective? Um, there are several thermal and non-thermal approaches, and then the Objective of, the, uh, of those processes are actually either pasteurize or sterilize to deliver safe foods to the consumer or transform them so it can be easily transported or uh, can serve uh, better to the consumers, such as drying. Um, and some, some examples I actually put, this is not an extent, uh, exhaustive list because there are other uh, processing methods that are emerging and that are very, uh, that have found application in different aspects microwave assisted thermal sterilization, um, radio frequency uh, sterilization, and then um, heat pump, for example, is, is a novel technology to capture the lost heat uh, through regenerative uh, heating. And then in the non-thermal, uh, we have different electrical uh, uh, systems, and then uh, high pressure, for example, is one of them. High pressure is is a novel non-thermal uh, processing method. Um, and then pulsed electric field, uh, as you can see on the top right, is, is actually widely utilized non-thermal processing method that are actually energy efficient. Another aspect is uh, to use these processing methods is to treat the products coming out of, um, for example, delivering uh, dried products coming out of the uh, process lines uh, or, generating value-added products from the byproducts. Okay. So what about packaging? Uh, when we talk about packaging, the first thing we think about is it's, it's bad, right? It's wasteful uh, and it's so visible in our landfills. Because of that, there's so much consumer backlash and, um, and, and also because of that, packaging is blamed for uh, the environmental, negative environmental impacts. 
But uh, the interest it actually says that otherwise, because the interest actually increased over time. And then packaging industry is right now $180 billion industry. And then packaged food, $3 trillion industry. And then that's increasing uh, with 5%, for example, in the next uh, five to 10 years. Uh, so how do we actually uh, prioritize? It's very dependent on the impacts, relative impacts of packaging and its protective functions. Uh, compared to the impacts coming from the food product itself. And then one uh, research actually that came out in 2017 assessed this and, and named it as packaging relative environmental impact. So the higher the pack packaging related, uh, relative environmental impact is, the higher the uh, unnecessary packaging is used for. So that actually opens up opportunities for reduction, the weight reduction, the barrier uh, properties, new material opportunities, uh, as you can see here, uh, beer, for example, has a very high uh, packaging rate of impact, wine, and mostly drinks, uh, beverages, and then uh, pasta, as you can see, because the, their packaging are relatively more impactful than the product, uh, production life cycles. When you look at the beef and cheese, uh, in that way, packaging has a, a relatively lower impact compared to other products. And then that means we can actually prioritize high impact smart packaging technologies, high barrier, maybe some of the most advanced packaging for beef, cheese, and other products that are uh, very environmentally uh, impactful. So we can actually, uh, we don't waste those products. Okay, so let's look at waste situation because packaging does not exist alone. Packaging always has a food product it's, uh, in itself. And then we don't uh, usually admit this, but we, we use packaging all the time, every day. Uh, because of that, um, I think designing packaging that can also reduce food waste uh, in, um, is, is very important. And then one way to do that is to use active agents. Uh, the top example actually shows uh, the active components that can be incorporated uh, into the, the sachets. And then we see that in the retailers and then there are advancements happening. And then also a uh, new type of uh, sensors or uh, indicators actually uh, that can tell you when to consume your product based on uh, the, the date after opening, right? So if you open it and then the shelf life is one day after opening, then it will start ticking and then we'll show you it's unconsumable uh, after a while. And also there, there's a debate about compostable and biodegradable uh, options that can be also integrated with the active and antimicrobial agents. But uh, there's a problem related to that because we don't have necessary infrastructure to compost these products under industrial uh, environments. So, uh, but there's a, a strong consumer um, demand to develop these compostable and biodegradable. And most of them do not show their uh, alignment with the ISO standards uh, based on biodegradability. So there's this greenwashing happening all the time related to that. Um, so looking at different packaging options, Refed, which is the biggest uh, uh, multiple stakeholder organization in the United States, uh, identifies several options. And then package design actually can reduce 3.57 tons uh, of carbon dioxide uh, of greenhouse gas emissions and then standardizing date labels 2.73 active and intelligent packaging applications 2.43 and then portioning which can be done also with packaging also can contribute to the reduction of food waste okay uh, digitalization as the key, key enabler of sustainability so i'll briefly mention about this because in the beginning of my presentation, I talked about the infrastructures, human infrastructures, the, the physical infrastructures, the data infrastructures, because uh, it, by using the digitalization aspects, which incorporates blockchain data, AI, and, and sensors, sensor networks, cyber physical systems, we can actually track and trace what's going on initially, because in food industry, uh, specifically for different lines, we don't monitor water use, for example. We don't monitor energies for individual processes. And then the first step is to first monitor them, right? And then uh, we can gain some insights out of that. So um, another report that came from uh, World Economic Forum uh, identified 
uh, 12 technologies, and they, they called it transformative 12 that could deliver significant impacts to food systems. And by utilizing, for example, food sensing technologies for food safety, quality, and traceability can reduce up to 20 million tons of food waste. And in the other uh, uh, stage or uh, category, IoT for real-time supply chain transparency and traceability can reduce the food loss up to 35 million tons. And finally, uh, the importance of the future workforce, because we can't just say, okay, we will implement these circular systems so you can, we will implement these digital systems, but don't think about our growing workforce and then how they will be educated, trained, and then uh, start implementing these systems. And the future of the uh, United States agri-food industry workforce is dependent on uh, from competence perspective um, and then in introduction to sustainability and digitalization components together will be important because those are two big concepts that are happening concur concurrently. And then there's also retiring generation. And that means retiring generation will take their institutional knowledge with them. Uh, and then there needs to be some sort of a transition between uh, these two. And then technologies such as virtual reality, augmented reality training uh, can actually enable that by uh, recording these things real time from the eyes of these retiring generation techni technicians or people uh, with knowledge. And then there will be, of course, upcoming workforce differences and micro credentials, but training these um, students will be important in the future uh, workforce of agri food systems. And we have a program coming up. <laughs> so that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning, or what's left of it. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, let's see, can that be in presentation mode? Okay, uh, great. So I'm honored to be here today, um, and it's well worth leaving uh, the fabulous Florida Keys to be here, one of the most ecologically sensitive places on the planet, and I'm certainly enjoying it these years. Uh, so I was here between 74 and 78, and uh, back then there were no cameras, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, in the last year, uh, I was elected uh, as president of the Consortium for Waste Circularity. Uh, the, this was formed by industry visionaries, visionaries uh, in the packaging industry that release their funding and see no other path that really solves the problem in, in packaging in general. So what I'm going to talk to you about representing the consortium is really a little different than what we heard this morning, which is farming circularity. I'll be talking about then the end of life packaging circularity and, and the inputs. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I wanna start with the problem statement. It's so much easier to align people uh, against the problem statement than to start with, here's a solution. Uh, so that's why I think this is important. Uh, the problem statement that the consortium is aligning with and, and sees uh, is that landfills are filling the urban cities. Um, the New England coast is just about, is almost running out. Uh, and so are the other major cities. Uh, and so what happens? Two things, either they're burning it or they drive it farther, just creating more greenhouse gases. Um, and landfills and incineration, according to the EPA, landfills and incineration are the third largest emitters of methane gas. Lastly, the packaging industry is in dire need of recycled material, recycled plastic content. There just isn't enough. So if that's the problem statement, then the vision that we're after is about transforming all waste uh, and processing it uh, to become circular, um, ending the whole greenhouse gas, never putting another thing into the earth, 
uh, leaving the earth and returning the earth and replenishing it back for what it was intended to be. Um, and also we're, we're really um, burdening the consumer. Um, you're asked to uh, tear labels, um, clean, wash, do a jig, and then it'll magically be recycled. That's not working. Um, so the current infrastructure has problems. And then in the end, by taking waste, we can actually uh, create a valued end product. And here, just a little formula of, if you take waste, create syngas, convert to syngas to methanol, which would then be an eco-methanol because it's not drawn from the ground, that methanol would be used to make plastics and it can go around again. Drilling down, the food industry has two major problems. Number one is packaging. So here I have some um, examples of, of food packaging and it, it's all the material classes, right? It's styrofoam, it's plastic, it's carton board, it's glass, it's uh, metals. And then also the takeout industry is, is uh, using a number of materials that over the years, all of these things have been so finely engineered uh, to be low cost, high performing. Um, so they, we've gotten to a point where those materials really are working for food. And I'll talk about, but right now we have a problem with the recycling of it. So the second problem that, you know, we missed one. Well, um, let's see. Uh, the, the second problem is basically food waste. So there's a slide in between here. Um, there's an, uh, a lot of food waste that is going into the landfill. Uh, it may be able to go to composting and anaerobically digested, but it doesn't make it there. There aren't those digesters uh, worldwide. So when you look at this pie chart that comes from the EPA, you have this is what's going into food from uh, municipal solid waste. You have a portion of paper, a portion of this uh, pie of glass metals, and 50% of this wedge here, plastic, all used for food. It's making up 45% of what is in landfill. We have to stop that. That, that is the problem. Uh, so here is where I'm extremely proud of the University of Florida, the impact it's making because uh, through, through the ABE department and uh, drilling down to Dr. Bruce Welt, uh, Dr. Bruce Welt is here today. Yes, something here. So recognition for Dr. Bruce. Uh, So um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation talks about upstream, upstream materials. And here we've had a lot of um, development taking place on alternate materials. But Dr. Boz just stated that a lot of this is very difficult. Some has been tried coming from corn for PLA materials, uh, compostables, uh, biodegradable, single layer instead of the, the, multi, the highly engineered multi-layer. Uh, that hasn't really worked. And what has been forgotten in all of this is the downstream. And this is the part that's coming from the University of Florida. Um, the downstream, which is, let's change the way we process waste. And that is really what I wanna talk about because there is science that is possible. And before we get into this, um, I do wanna show that at least 73 LCAs have been conducted showing that plastics have the lowest carbon footprint. So when you hear, oh, let's find an alternate material, typically you're going to move to the right and make things worse. So that is why focusing on changing and transforming uh, the processing uh, really has uh, advantages. Here is the vision. If we take all waste and all waste being products and packaging 
and put that through what is today's regenerative, robust gasification, uh, that will take all the organics in our waste, of which the EPA says 85% of our waste is organic and 15% is uh, inorganic. The uh, top portion of that vessel will basically convert the organics into syngas. And then syngas converted to methanol, which is used today, um, will make plastics and products that you see here on the right. When those products have end of life, it just goes through again. So we truly have circularity, endless circularity in this case. Now I'm gonna drill down into the specifics of the science because gasification has been around, by the way, for a very long time. Back in the 1800s, very early forms of gasification were used to make syngas for street lights. Uh, but since the 1800s, gasification has uh, certainly evolved and gotten to the point where it looks like this. So what I have on the left-hand side of the slide are those difficult to recycle uh, materials today. I really would say impossible to, recy to recycle materials. You know, things that um, the snack aisle, the snack aisle, which has um, aluminum on the inside for food preservation and, and film on plastic film on the outside has basically both organic and inorganic. When that is placed in a gasifier, um, the film layer, which is organic, will, the, the bonds will uh, break apart and create the syngas and move into a syngas chamber. The metal, will fall to the bottom, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It's really that 85% syngas, which has extremely high value. Um, so that then uh, goes from that syngas chamber to the next um, uh, unit operation, and that converts the syngas into methanol. And again, that's what's going around. So rather than continuing to dump into landfills, this is the system that, that we believe is right. And this is total carbon capture. There are no smokestacks. Um, so all of this is, is clean. And of course, I will say um, it's high energy. So I'll talk that uh, a little later. Um, so the top chamber is somewhere in the 1400 degrees centigrade. The bottom chamber is 2000 degrees centigrade. So it does take some power. However, I'll just leave it at this to say that there is greatly more value coming out of this system than what is going in. So the financials are, are healthy. It's a positive rate of return. No government funding is needed like solar or wind. So it's a good story. Here's what comes out of the bottom. It is vitrified slag. It is very dense and, and really contains, the, the US government uses uh, such technology to destroy hazardous materials. Uh, it, uh, these processes are on some uh, aircraft carriers that go out to sea for a number of months and collect a lot of garbage, but do not dump them into the ocean. And they put them through here. Uh, vitrified glass and slag can be used I won't say it's a great, it's a big revenue stream, but it does create um, uh, materials for the asphalt industry, the cement industry, the abrasive tool industry. So that can be used. So we've got both the top and the bottom creating revenue. Um, and also as you and I pay for our uh, municipal solid waste, that uh, the term there is the tipping fee that tipping fee would also be a revenue stream. The idea is that these chemical plants should be located at landfills. The existing logistics are there. Um, so trucks, instead of dumping into the earth, can, can dump into the uh, processing plants. Also over time, I personally envision that you can reclaim the land because those landfills are now rich, 85%, according to the EPA, with organics, so you can reclaim the, the land. And you probably have your own experiences as you drive by uh, landfills. It's not a pretty sight. 
Lastly, um, here you see from the Global Syngas Council, Syngas is made every day in many, many locations all around the world because it's a valuable chemical. Problem is it's made today all from fossil fuel. Uh, the little pie charts show you that uh, different fossil fuels are used uh, around the world, depending on what regions have. Uh, Asia largely has coal, so that's, that's how they're making their syn gas. North America largely has natural gas. So the infrastructure for natural gas to other chemicals is there. And here is how syn gas is used today, again, from fossil fuels, um, for agriculture, for uh, fertilizer, uh, for fuels, uh, and the chemical pie there that we see, that's where the methanol is made that we're suggesting could be used for packaging material. So imagine even food waste could be converted to plastic through this process. So I often um, get asked the question, well, is this working? Uh, the airline industry is the example I want to share with you. The airline industry is part of transportation is probably one of the leading causes for greenhouse gases. They don't have very many options. So they have been using and, and thinking about waste to syn gas to bioaviation fuels. From the last slide, aviation fuels are made from, from syn gas. So that's what they're doing. They have aligned to that. They have even declared that by 2050, they will be carbon neutral. And they have built the first plant, which is in operation in Reno, Nevada. Four other plants, two in Europe and a couple more in, in North America, are in construction today by Fulcrum Bioenergy. And it's basically a very similar process. They're just using syngas to make something else. So that is a demonstration point and a value point, uh, and the airline industry is aligned. We, the food industry, the packaging industry, we need to align. I, I think we're doing ourselves a great disservice by sometimes chasing incrementalism, by chasing a few other th things that are going to only have small uh, impacts on, on, on the environment. Uh, especially when I hear plastics are bad or focusing on plastic, it's all bad. So um, what I really want to talk about, it's going to take all of us, right? It's going to take industry, academia, and government to really solve this problem. Because if we're talking about ending landfills, then we're talking about bringing disruptive technology to what has been in existence of dumping into the ground for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, the um, Consortium for Waste Circularity uh, is, is aligned on all waste, and it's, al it's aligned against taking ecomethanol, which will probably be someday on the uh, Chicago Board of Trade as, as the next uh, new commodity. Um, and what the Consortium for Waste Circularity also does is fund R&D here at the University of Florida. It is the lead university that we're using. We're also associated with another university, York University out of Canada, and conducting education and outreach and bringing these to municipalities so that when their contracts are up, they can consider uh, alternatives. So lastly, all of you can, I, I, I plead with all of you, you can use your voice even if you're not into uh, packaging sustainability here. And that is join, join the LinkedIn page. Uh, this is the link. Um, have your voice be heard, comment, reshare, create awareness for what is possible. Uh, the University of Florida, Dr. Welt has been testing uh, with a number of companies, dipping their toe in the water, what their waste, how their waste could transfer into um, syngas and companies that we've talked to some uh, two and three years ago um, have kind of gone silent and now they've come back because they haven't found anything better and they're willing to test. So as we grow the consortium, 
um, will have uh, a, a greater uh, impact on, on industry and, and government, and um, uh, we'll be able to make this change and uh, have a first unit commercially up and running, although there are units uh, at a smaller level uh, up and running today. So with that, I leave you with, uh, here is the website, and uh, I want to say thank you. Okay, so thanks, uh, Zaina and Mike, for very uh, interesting presentations. We have time for a few questions. Uh, while people are walking to get the microphones, I'd like to ask the first one. Um, Mike, if you want to grow your consortium, what kind of members uh, are you looking for? So, um, I, anyone that is in a brand, uh, food companies uh, sending meat or other things to, to the uh, retail shelves, um, printers uh, that are creating labels or uh, printing on packaging because many of the inks do not today recycle, and also other packaging suppliers would be uh, really great members. Other questions? Thank you. I'm going to show my ignorance, but um, Zinet, thanks for, uh, well, both presentations were really great. Thank you. Um, you talked about glass and, and you, you mentioned that glass, the impact factor was worse. Can you explain that? Because when I think about glass, perhaps naively, I think that it can be recycled and reused, you know? So please explain. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, glass is a heavy material. Uh, first of all, and then the production itself, um, uh, glass flowing process is actually very energy intensive. And then if it's not reused, and it, it used to be reused by collection systems, especially in the uh, United uh, States. Um, so it was actually, uh, it is very beneficial when it's reused, but it's not reused. Um, uh, and then the reuse uh, percentage is very low because of its process and its weight compared to the product itself inside the beer, which is uh, filled with water mostly. So. Question in the back. Um, this may be end up being a loaded question. Um, my name is Jeannie Necessary. Uh, I work with the University of Florida and um, I'm gonna try to make this as concise as I can, but I read an article um, for a research paper last semester about uh, research showing that people don't really think about the food system and, um, and also in terms of recycling that people were um, in favor of having recycling in their communities, but then the cost of it was a barrier. So I guess my question is, how do you speak to communities about the importance of spending tax dollars on creating these type of plants that uh, recycle products and at the same time dismiss some of the notions and challenges of reporting that much of the waste that we do get picked up to recycle is actually not getting recycled. Thank you. So I can just quickly comment on that. Uh, that's why we need to work together. Um, and then we have amazing extension uh, professors, uh, faculty at University of Florida. And then that's not something I myself or my program or um, just alone, we can do that. So we should work together. We should learn to work together in convergent teams, I think. And then we collaborate that. Uh, we, I collaborate, for example, people focusing on the human interactions, human infrastructures, more uh, social scientists. So in that way, we can actually uh, develop solutions by knowing the ac exact problem and then how to communicate that. So I don't have a particular answer to that, uh, but the answer is always working together. So Andrea, are you, sorry, go ahead, Michael. Uh, just a quick add to that is that uh, I think it's very hard to sell something when you cannot explain the value proposition. And the problem with the current recycling, the single stream of putting everything in a recycle uh, bucket is that only about 30% of all of that stuff really gets recycled. 
Now, I believe that once we get to regenerative robust gasification and 100% is recycled, um, that that is a better uh, selling proposition. So Andrea, the enforcer, uh, just told me that uh, our time is up, we're running late. So with that, uh, let's give our speakers another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Payne. Uh, right now, we're gonna be moving on to our keynote session. Uh, so I'm excited to hear this one. I wanted to welcome to the stage, the actual, the real Scott Engel, the Senior Vice President of IFAS at the University of Florida. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't join you this morning. I had uh, cataract surgery yesterday. I now have 20-20 vision. And I had my post up at 8.30 today. So that was, uh, that's where I was. Well, I am Scott Angle. I am the, I lead University of Florida IFAS program. I'm glad to be here with you today. Eric Fieldwald was once a skeptic of climate change. He had traveled the world and he wondered how could humans, individuals change a planet when the planet was so big? He had the opportunity to see the vast expanse we have and he continually wondered and pondered that question, but through his travels and through seeing the, the direct impacts of climate change, the increase in severe weather events, the changing temperature and all the other associated impacts, particularly on agriculture, as someone who was flexible and willing to look at the data and consider and ponder those changes, he changed his mind about the climate. And today he is a supporter and he is a crusader of this message, particularly for agricultural audiences, which he has a direct responsibility to support. So now he travels around the world carrying this message, telling everyone that will listen through his position about the changes that he sees every day in agriculture and how our future will be affected by it. But what also makes Eric so inspirational is that he has a global vision for agriculture. He understands that despite everything we're talking about here today, we still need to increase food production by at least 50% and maybe even more. And how do we do that? In light of our requirement, our necessity to grow more food, but with less impact on the environment, and even hoping to use agriculture as a way to improve the environment and ameliorate some of the damage that has been done in the past. So we look forward to hearing from him today. There are three people I'd like to thank for making this lecture possible. The first are two individuals that, at least if you work for, for IFAS, you may have heard of them before, E.T. York and Bam York. These were individuals who were instrumental in the founding of IFAS. Uh, they're still considered essentially the father and mother of IFAS, but their legacy has continued in the decades that they left the organization. Uh, Mrs. York just passed away, I think it was last summer, but her legacy continues. The family and particularly Mrs. York established an endowment to support the lecture that we will be hearing from today. So I wanna thank both of them and their families for continuing their support of the E.T. York lecture. I'd also like to thank Matthew Johnston. Matthew, um, thank you for making sure that that happened. Uh, he's a great friend of the University of Florida. He is a graduate of the Wedgworth Leadership Institute, which is a uh, organization that continues to have um, influence around the state in ways that every day I find to be both this amazing and, um, and phenomenal. So we are so glad that you are a part of this. I know that when Eric was considering our, our um, invitation to speak today, he contacted you and said, is this something I should do? Is this, is this important? Matthew said, yes. And so Eric said, the reason I'm doing this today is because Matthew told me to do it. So Matthew, thank you for being a part of that. Very much appreciate all you do for the University of Florida and IFAS in particular. So what you're about to hear is important. Eric has used his platform as a corporate leader to try to change the world for the better. 
So please help me welcome the Syngenta Group CEO, Eric Fjordwald. It is a great pleasure to take part in the Future of Food Forum, and it is exciting to further build on our relationship with the University of Florida. My name is Eric Fierwald, and I'm the CEO of Syngenta Group, one of the world's largest agriculture companies. I am also the chairman of the Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. I'm based in our headquarters in Basel, Switzerland, and we serve farmers and customers in more than 100 countries. Our 50,000 colleagues around the world develop crop protection products, both chemistry and biologicals, seeds, crop nutrition, digital tools, and solution for farmers so they can be productive in an environmentally friendly way. Our work with academia across the US, Europe, Brazil, and China is incredibly important to us. We have been recruiting students from the University of Florida for more than three decades. Four more have already joined us so far this year. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about how Syngenta Group is helping farmers overcome two of the greatest challenges facing the world today, feeding a growing population and addressing climate change. Only a few days ago, on February 28th, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change the IPCC warned that the drastic action is needed to protect billions of vulnerable people. As well as climate change, we now also have the awful conflict in Ukraine. Global food security is more challenging and more important than ever. By 2050, the global population will expand a lot, reaching close to 10 billion people who will all need safe and nutritious food. It means in 30 years, the world will need to be able to produce 50% more food. And this challenge will be made increasingly difficult by the climate crisis we are facing. Agriculture already contributes 12% of global greenhouse gas emissions. To meet commitments in the Paris Climate Accord and tackle the climate crisis, we must make huge changes to the way our food is produced for us to reduce these emissions towards zero while ensuring enough food for everyone. This is an incredible challenge. This is only possible if we do more with less land so we can stop deforestation and even return some land back to nature. To do this, we must substantially increase yields. Here's a graph from the World Resources Institute, which helps explain this challenge. In this slide, you can see the current yield for crops like rice, wheat, potatoes, and bananas. And you can see what yields need to be achieved to prevent deforestation and yet more land being turned into farmland. In a moment, I'll explain what Syngenta Group is doing to help deliver on this. But first, climate change is also making life a lot more difficult for farmers. Weather extremes have become the new normal around the globe, and we are seeing more and more arable land lost to soil degradation. For example, in China, drought in 2020, followed by a heavy frost in 2021, cost citrus farmers in the South 70% of their harvest. In 2020, Australia had record temperatures and suffered a drought and massive forest fires that was followed last year by massive flooding that destroyed countless crops. The other trend we are seeing is that because of warmer weather, insects and diseases are moving further north. In the fall of 2019, for example, I was visiting farmers in the Netherlands. One farmer showed me his tomato crop that was being eaten by an insect that he had never seen before. Our experts took the insect and had it analyzed and found it was from Central America. Called Tuta Absoluta, it had moved all the way north 
because the winters were no longer cold enough to kill it. Fortunately, because we have a business in South America, we were able to bring solutions to deal with this insect. But this is just another example of more new and difficult challenges happening to farmers because of climate change. At Syngenta Group, we are working to help farmers address these challenges of both feeding a growing population and being part of the solution to climate change. We are doing this by putting regenerative agriculture at the very heart of our work. Regenerative agriculture means practices which improve soil health, productivity, biodiversity, and also help tackle the climate crisis. For instance, after harvesting, we suggest and help farmers plant cover crops for the winter. This helps protect the soil from erosion and adds more carbon to the soil, enriching it and reducing the amount of fertilizer needed. Another example of regenerative agriculture is no-till farming, where crops are grown without turning over the top layer of the soil. When farmers don't till, the soil gets more carbon, more microbes, and more worms. It means birds flourish, biodiversity is protected, carbon is sequestered, less water is used, and the world is better off. For example, in a Syngenta initiative in the UK, farms which used low-till and no-till saw big increases in worms and bird numbers soared by up to 1,000% over the three-year trial. We have established a global network of almost 1,000 reference farms and over 3,500 benchmark farms as part of our work on regenerative agriculture. Our reference farms adopt tailored crop protocols with the aim of increasing productivity without using more land, water, or other inputs. Across our benchmark farms, we have seen a 15% yield increase, so farmers get 15% more product from their land, 46% fertilizer reduction, 33% pesticide decrease, and a 37% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. These figures show that using modern products to enable regenerative agriculture practices can dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve land productivity. Syngenta Group is investing to create even better new technology solutions. We are spending $2 billion per year on R&D and lots more on capital to develop seeds, crop protection, crop nutrition, and digital services to address this incredible challenge. Let me show you a few examples. Syngenta Group has developed a corn called Enogen. It produces corn that makes its own alpha amylase enzyme and is therefore more digestible for livestock. Using Enogen, cattle need 5% less feed and release an average of 10% less methane so a significant reduction in the global greenhouse gas emissions of livestock. By the way, that 5% efficiency across 1,000 cattle is the equivalent to the tailpipe emissions of 35 cars. With nearly 100 million cattle in the U.S. alone, that's potentially 3.5 million cars worth of reduced greenhouse gas emissions every year. Another exciting example of innovation is Claris a herbicide specifically for farming corn, which is more effective at controlling weeds and can be used in much lower quantities and with fewer passes across the fields than conventional treatments. It's much better for the environment because only a quarter of a gallon of Calaris needs to be used per hectare, whereas the alternative needs three times as much. Reducing food waste is another important way to cut emissions from the food value chain. Take, for example, our new Duel tomatoes. We use traditional breeding methods to create this sweet and crunchy tomato, which is more resilient and has a significantly longer shelf life compared to a traditional cherry tomato. Crucially, this means less food waste at every step in the process, while transporting the produce to retailers, in supermarkets, and at home too. 
Another example of cutting food waste is our new white cauliflower. It stays white even when the head or curd of the cauliflower is exposed to sunlight. This means it eliminates the tedious grower labor of covering the curds, improves post-harvest color quality, reducing reject rates. The place where we are transforming agriculture the fastest is in China. Yields there have been very low and farmers have historically used way too much fertilizer and way too much old crop protection chemistry, damaging soils and polluting waters. So when ChemChina bought us, we wanted to bring our best practices and products to China and help transform agriculture there. China has 20% of the world's population, but only 7% of the world's arable land. Our colleagues in China have built 500 MAP, or Modern Agriculture Platform Centers, and this number continues to grow fast. Our MAP centers play a key role for farmers across the country. They bring the best training, products, agronomic advice, and other services to farmers to help them to be more productive and take better care of the environment. They enable farmers, including smallholders, to leapfrog from outdated practices to leading edge modern techniques. We teach regenerative agriculture practices, sample soil, recommend what and when to plant, what crop protection and crop nutrition to use, and when to harvest. Farmers using the MAP services have seen dramatic improvements in returns. Yields have risen, an average an 8% revenue increase for crops like corn, wheat, and rice, and a 15% increase for fruits and vegetables, with far lower volumes of, of better crop protection products and fertilizers. MAP Center staff are also on call should disaster strike. Let me give you an example. Last year, while I was in China, there was a major typhoon and massive flooding. A farmer in Henan province by the name of Du expected to lose all of his corn crop. He contacted our local MAP center for help. Using satellite imagery, our MAP team first got an accurate picture of the damage to his crop and where the water had started to drain. Then they used drones to target spray fungicides to prevent diseases from spreading and natural biologicals to stimulate growth on the corn where the water had receded. Thanks to our new innovations and our team's quick response, we were able to help him save 65% of his crop yield. So he is having an okay year that would otherwise have been disastrous. To me, the most exciting element of our MAP centers is connecting farmers all the way to consumers. We now have 58 products where we do this, across different varieties of strawberries, tomatoes, rice, and other products. In addition to the Map Beside logo, which signifies high quality and sustainably grown, there's also a QR code. When consumers scan the code, they get information about the product, the farm it comes from, and sustainability data, and even a picture of the farmer, all enabled by the use of blockchain technology. We believe this approach will be adopted more broadly around the world because consumers want to know their products are grown sustainably and where they come from. So, you would think that these products and practices are being adopted rapidly by farmers worldwide, right? Unfortunately, not fast enough. So what's slowing things down and what needs to happen to speed them up? In Europe, we are seeing further challenges we are coming out with new technologies, but the European regulatory system is very difficult to get them approved. And to keep them approved because there are significant NGO and government regulatory efforts against technology. For example, I met a Swiss farmer by the name of Marcus Suter and his son. They were telling me that they had planted green beans, but because the seed treatment, which had a very low level of pesticide to protect the young plants, had been blocked in Switzerland and the EU, even though the rest of the world is still using it, their green bean yields had fallen by 
So losing leading edge technology is hurting farmers' ability in Switzerland and the rest of Europe to deal with these increasing pest challenges. They say this is because of the precautionary principle that does not want to take any risk with technology. But I believe the much bigger risk is climate change. I have a question for you. How much do you think pesticide use on farmland has changed over the last 60 years? Some people answer this question saying that the volume of pesticide use must be up dramatically based on what they read. Well, the fact is, and this is third party data, the volume of pesticides per hectare of land has decreased by 95%. Syngenta Group has been a big part of this because of research where we keep coming out with better chemistries that are more effective and safer for farmers and the consumer. This number will continue to decrease as we come out with better chemistry and adopt more and more precision spraying technologies and as we complement the chemistry with biologicals. This surprises many people and unfortunately in parts of Europe where farmers are losing many modern chemistries because of regulators, they go back to the left of this chart and use old chemistries and in much higher volumes. Progress in Europe is also being slowed by regulators focusing on input goals, but not having output goals when it comes to reducing emissions and tackling the climate crisis in agriculture. For instance, by 2030, the EU says 25% of all agriculture land in the block should be under organic farming. Sadly, targets like these alone could make agriculture in Europe less productive, adding pressure to deforest more in countries like Brazil and Indonesia, increasing emissions. Bill Gates tackled this common misconception in a podcast with Rashida Jones. He was asked whether eating organic food helps the environment. His answer will surprise many, and it was that eating organic food does not help reduce emissions. It does the opposite, because organic food actually uses more land than traditional farming. But many of you will ask why. On this chart, you can see the importance of pesticides. You can see the average yield, and again, this is third-party data, without the use of pesticides. And you can see the additional yield you get by pesticides protecting plants from weeds, diseases, and insects. Now with organic pesticides, pesticides used in organic agriculture, you recover some of this yield. But organic yields on average are 35% lower than with the use of modern pesticides. This was a lesson learned by Sri Lanka last year when it shifted its agriculture sector to a 100% organic model banning all modern pesticides. Yields dropped sharply and food shortages meant the price of grains and vegetables skyrocketed. Sri Lanka has since reversed the policy. In addition to lower yields, you also get more greenhouse gas emissions from organic agriculture. This is because without modern pesticides to control weeds, you need to heavily till the soil this turning of the soil releases CO2 into the atmosphere. Now we sell a lot of seed and a lot of pesticide to organic farming. It's a good market for us because consumers will pay significantly more for organic. But we don't believe it's the best option as it stands today for dealing with climate change. So, what is needed in agriculture to tackle the climate crisis? Each year, governments around the world spend over $700 billion on agriculture subsidies. The vast majority of these go directly to farmers, but very little of this money is being spent in a targeted way to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions and improve sustainability. Governments need to go through a fundamental shift in the way subsidies are managed. Subsidies need to be used to incentivize farmers to adopt regenerative agriculture practices, which help to decrease emissions and improve sustainability. We need strong regulations all over the world, but they must be science and risk-based and take into account the benefits of new technologies to help fight climate change. 
safe technologies that help the most should be fast-tracked across major agriculture markets. Tackling the climate crisis also means making sure the food value chain is transparent for consumers. With clear labeling showing the carbon footprint of food products. Chingenta Group's work in China with QR codes, which I mentioned earlier, really shows how consumers want to find out more about where their food comes from. And it shows consumers are conscious their choices impact the climate crisis. And it highlights the value they place on having food which is sustainably grown. It is crucial to have this link between farmers and consumers strengthened, as it will encourage more farmers to adopt regenerative agriculture practices, which are better for the environment. Finally, more food companies need to move towards sourcing regeneratively grown products, which will help them meet their own greenhouse gas reduction targets. Kellogg is already doing this as part of a program with the Nature Conservancy, an NGO, and Syngenta Group by helping farmers to adopt and then track the use of more sustainable practices on farms in Michigan, Arkansas, and other U.S. states. These types of projects are critical because they act as a reward to encourage farmers who adopt regenerative agriculture practices which protect the environment. Transforming how the world grows and produces its food is a critical priority for everyone. We must make sure there's enough healthy, safe, and nutritious food for a growing population. And do this despite increasing weather extremes, all while stopping deforestation and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This requires farmers, agriculture, food companies, universities, NGOs, and governments to get much more aligned on what the real problem is and clear on what outcomes are needed to save the world. It means everyone, including regulators, must be much more open to innovation and new technology, particularly when it comes to tackling the climate crisis. I am very much looking forward to the panel discussion and hearing your thoughts on how we can ensure food security for all, while also making sure agriculture is part of the solution to climate crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric. That was wonderful. We appreciate your time and effort. We, a uh, lot of fascinating information there. We have him uh, on the line for about another 15 minutes. So we'd like to open it up to questions. If you could please go to the microphone, ask your question and we'll go from there. Who'd like to go first? Everyone's looking around. Okay, now they're jumping up, Eric. I'll be right with you. No problem. Hi, Eric. Thank you for the, the presentation. It was really informative to understand more about what Syngenta is doing. Um, you mentioned digital services. What sorts of things are you guys looking at from a digital services component in addition to the QR code that you talked about? Two things that I think are really important in the digital services. One is, is um, uh, our agronomic advice. So helping farmers understand better um, when to plant, when to put on the fertilizer, how much fertilizer, when to use crop protection products. And, and that way they, they have better yields and they use less inputs. So it's better for the environment and better crops and better quality, and it protects the soil health. Another really exciting area for me is, is, is this connection to the consumer. And I talked about it happening now in China. Uh, we've had food companies that have seen this happening in China now talking to us about taking it in other places. But if consumers can buy a food product and, and scan a QR code and, and get information about where the product came from, in this case, also a picture of the farmer and sustainability data, it really brings to life the, 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 the choice that they've made as a sustainable choice 
and, and get a feel for where their food is coming from, which I think is, is, is where consumers want to go. Um, I think consumers want to buy products, including food that is sustainably grown and, and, and they get more information about it. So I think those are two really cool applications of digital that I, I see expanding tremendously. Hi, um, sorry, you mentioned that China was using a lot of fertilizers and they had problems with soil degradation. So what concrete steps are they doing right now that led to this less reliance on fertilizers and improving yields, probably helping soil health also? Yeah, so it's, it's recognized as a big problem, um, both a, a soil degradation yield, pollution, uh, runoffs into water, but now also China's having a much bigger focus on, on sustainability, so greenhouse gas emissions. So excess nitrogen use cr creates too much uh, nitrous oxide emissions. So what China has done is set goals to reduce the, the, the amount of, of fertilizer used. And we're helping farmers do that by digital tools, which I just talked about, these map centers where we're training farmers and we're giving them better seeds and telling them when and, and how much fertilizer to use and better fertilizer. And so they're going from two or three times as much fertilizer, for example, per unit of corn as a US farmer to closer to what a US farmer would use. They're still using more than, more than US farmers per unit of output because they don't have as good a genetics yet in their, in their seed, but they're headed in the right direction. And what we're doing with digital tools is we're capturing how much better those farmers are doing versus the average farmer in that market area in that part of China. And then we're giving them credit um, to the, to, that goes with the, with the grain downstream for greenhouse gas emission reductions. So it's exciting to see the farmers have more healthier soil, less input costs, higher quality, higher yields, and get credit for these regenerative agriculture practices. And the way to do that is to have the, the digital tools help them do that, but then, but then, but then track the, uh, the benefits. Hi, I'm Pedro Sanchez, a tropical soil scientist, uh, working mainly on Africa now. And uh, <clears throat> there's been tremendous progress in, in, uh, in increasing agricultural production in Africa in the last 20 years, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Tom Jane from Michigan State and I published an article on science saying that, but we also found that 70% of the uh, increased production was due to land extensification and only 30% uh, on increasing yields. Now, there, there are so many, uh, so many actions, uh, so many stuff coming out of research in Africa uh, about increasing yields, but, and uh, I'm heavily involved in one of them on soil health, but the barrier is extension. With a, with a possible uh, exception of Ethiopia, that has about 50% of the extension workers in Africa, and they had a very innovative progress. The rest of Sub-Saharan Africa really has no effective extension systems. What's your view as a major food company and, and, and as a well-known value in, 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 in Africa uh, on, how should we tackle extension? It's, it's a great question and very important because Africa has the fertile farmland, the arable land to feed itself. And yet there's massive imports of food into Africa. So it needs to feed itself so, so that people can, can have enough food to eat. And, and so that uh, the helping the economy is helping people have jobs. Uh, so it's a very important uh, point. And what Syngenta is doing is we're collaborating with NGOs, the World Food Program. We're, we're, we're part of an organization called Farm to Market Alliance, which the Syngenta Foundation helps sponsor and, and is, is very involved with, with uh, supporting. But uh, Rabobank, uh, Yara, the big fertilizer company, Agra, the African uh, growth um, or organization, 
supported by the Gates Foundation and, and, and the United Nations, the World Food Program. A whole group of us um, sponsor this organization that puts what we call them farmer solution centers uh, in, in various countries in Africa exactly to do this, to, to, to have that extension capability, working together with gover the governments um, to, to be able to help farmers learn how to farm better, modern practices, but also get access to inputs, better seeds, better crop protection products, um, better fertilizer, and, and, then, and then some digital tools to enable them to, to, to grow better. And then finally, uh, connecting to, to markets better and, and digital helps do that. So we're, we're in four countries today. Uh, we'll expand that, we'll, we'll, we'll get more success there and expand that. As a company, we've got this successful model in China, which is by the way, working in poor parts of China with smallholders and then in, in more developed parts of China. So we, we've been able to figure out how to make it successful with smallholders in poor areas. So we're, we're looking at, at transferring that model as a business model uh, with partners uh, into the African market. So bring, bring that, that capability to provide full solutions to farmers. Training, the right inputs, and then the right connections to the marketplaces uh, and the digital tools to enable all that to happen. So to, to me, it's, 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 it's the, don't, don't give a man a fish, teach them how to fish and they have fish for a life. Uh, if we teach and support Africans to grow their own food, uh, then I think it's gonna be great for Africa. It's gonna be great uh, knock on effects with, with the economies there. Um, people will have enough food to eat uh, and the environment will be better off. So totally agree with you. And I think it's, it's, it's about uh, supporting them with companies, NGOs, and governments working together, and academics. Thank you, Ari. Could I ask a follow-up question to yours, Pedro? Uh, for several years, I ran a nonprofit IFDC that was primarily focused on Africa agriculture, working with smallholder farmers. And the main comment I heard was that there was an understanding of these technologies, the importance of them in Africa, but the issue of cost was always raised. Has Syngenta thought about and what are you doing about the cough test differential for different parts of the world with uh, technologies that sometimes can be expensive? Yeah, I, I, one of the things that we're doing is, is, is we're, we're agreeing across the industry that we're going to um, um, price for affordability. And so we, we combine our Syngenta Foundation together with the Syngenta business and we look at uh, how, do, how do we get farmers going? How do we get pre-commercial farmers to commercial and, and, and get them up and running um, and, and, and uh, price so that, that they can have a chance to do that and bring them, bring them the right technologies uh, that they need. So it's a very important question and, and, and our commitment is to do what it takes and our business is growing substantially. So it's showing that it is working to make that happen. And I, I, I feel like our competitors are doing the same thing. The fertilizer companies are doing the same thing. We're all putting a lot of emphasis on Africa in helping farmers get established and up and, and, up and, and successful commercially uh, with, with, um, with, with, with pricing to help them get there. Um, a, a lot of, 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 of tools, a lot of um, development, uh, extension and collaborations. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Thanks, Scott. Jack. Thanks. Good afternoon, Art. Jack Payne, University of Florida. Uh, Jack, synthetic Jack. biology has really become the major uh, research pathway now for ag, you know, starting the plant sciences and animal agriculture. And it's even now being used in conservation for like endangered species. Unlike Monsanto, that really had problems with the way they uh, did their GMO seed outreach. Uh, does Syngenta provide education to the consumer to try to explain the value of this science and dispel the myths uh, that are generated by synthetic biology? Thanks. The, the answer is yes. It's, it's, it's very important that um, we improve the education about agriculture in, in total. 
but specifically about, about, about technologies because uh, I, I'm living in Basel, Switzerland and in the heart of Europe where, where there's, there's a lot of fear and concern about technologies in agriculture and, and, and a lot of lack of understanding. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, the, 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 the EU doesn't like GMOs and, they, and they, they're, they're, they're leery about gene editing, but they accept mutagenesis as something that's been going on for 40 years in the seed industry, where you take UV radiation or, or toxic chemicals and you, you massively mutilate the, the seeds and, and scramble the genes and see what comes out of it. Um, because that's gone on a long time, they think that that's okay, but, but either adding one gene, which you know exactly what it is, or, or, or changing a base pair with gene editing of, an of a gene in a, in a plant, um, they, they're, they're concerned about. So it's, it's educating and explaining that nothing that we eat today was as, as Mother Nature formed it. We've been, we've been developing better genes products for, for, for thousands of years. And through mutagenesis for the last 40, 50 years, we've been scrambling genes and, and, and there hasn't been any health safety issues because of that. So we want strict regulation. We want to have to prove that these products are safe, but the science inherently is very safe. In fact, with gene editing, it, it, it's, it's making changes that will happen over time with natural mutations. You're just making them happen faster. So education is a huge part of it. We're, we're, we're trying to do that as Syngenta, but we're also trying to do it as an industry through CropLife International and through NGOs. So we've got a partnership with the Nature Conservancy as an example, where the Nature Conservancy is, is working with us to help explain to the public that the important issue is, is climate change and food security. So we've got to make sure that there's enough food for the world and we've got to have agriculture be part of the solution to climate change. So as we set the, the, those targets to, to do those things, then what, what is necessary to make that happen? So when, when you talk about technology solving big problems, there's more openness to understand the technology. When you just talk about which Monsanto made the mistake of, and we as an industry did with the, with the start of GMOs is, here's a great technology, take it, without talking about what, what are the benefits? What are you trying to solve? Why is this good for me? And why is it good for the world? And therefore, why should I even listen to your arguments about why it's safe? And, and that's what we're trying to do, Jack. And I think it's, it's a great point, it's really important, but I'll also just finish by saying, it's critically important that we have these new technologies so that we can have a secure food supply for everybody and take agriculture towards carbon neutral in the next 10, 20 years. Thank you, Eric. Eric Feardwall, the CEO of the Syngenta Group. Let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you. All right, we appreciate all the speakers this morning. It's now time for a break, but there's gonna be two parts to the lunch break. So the first part, you have free time for about 30 minutes, and then please be back in your seats by uh, 1245 um, to hear an excellent speaker, Mario Herrero. He came all the way from Ithaca, New York. So let's not disappoint him. And Felicia Wu also came all the way from Michigan. So let's not disappoint her either. Uh, they're gonna be on the stage. So you have free time now, and then be back in your seats in a half hour. Started with our lunchtime session, so you can keep eating enjoying your meal. Um, after this session, we're gonna move right into the next session. So be prepared for that. I also wanna announce in the back of the room, there's a whiteboard for you to put down your ideas. Write down your ideas about the future of food. So if you get a brainstorm and you don't wanna forget it, write it down in the back.
So we have our moderator. If I could ask you to please direct your attention to the stage. Thank you. Our moderator today is Dr. Felicia Wu. She's the John A. Hanna Distinguished Professor in Food Safety, Toxicology, and Risk Assessment at Michigan State University. And she's gonna introduce our speaker. Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all. Um, so it's actually been wonderful to visit from Michigan because it was all snowy and icy when I left, and I maybe can speak for Mario and others of us coming from the north. We're very happy to be here now. So, so thank you for a great several days. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Mario Herrero from Cornell University. So Dr. Herrero is a professor of sustainable food systems and global change in the Department of Global Development at Cornell, and is also a Cornell Atkinson Scholar, and I think only the second one to have been named as such. So it's a great honor. Uh, Dr. Herrero's work has touched on multiple different aspects of sustainable food systems, including the sustainable intensification of agriculture, the um, promotion of healthy diets that are also sustainable for the environment, and livestock systems. Dr. Herrero has worked across a variety of different important international commissions, including the Intergovernmental P Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, as well as Lancet's Commission on Obesity, and most recently, Eat Lancet and its newest iteration, Eat Lancet 2, which is all about healthy diets globally that can also promote sustainable environments. Before coming to Cornell University just a year ago, Dr. Herrero was working at CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Brisbane, Australia. So we're very honored to have him here with us today, Dr. Herrero. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for that introduction. And, and uh, excuse me if I'm, uh, if I'm actually uh, not letting you eat that, that delicious roll. Uh, okay, so yes, they asked me to talk a little bit about uh, sustainable transitions for the global food system. And the way I, I often start this talk is really by, <clears throat> let me see if this changes, by just recognizing that uh, we are in something called the Anthropocene, where you see this so-called great acceleration curves of basically everything everything from population and GDP, which we know, but look, everything is moving in, in a very accelerated way, like damming of rivers, water use, paper consumption, McDonald's restaurants, which just shows how uh, our, our diets are really in transition, uh, transport, and a, and, and a range of other things. This doesn't come uh, up without consequences. At the, oops, sorry. Yeah, at the end of the day, we are, uh, this is creating enormous pressures in the use of resources around the world, uh, leading to tremendous environmental degradation to climate change, but also it's having profound repercussions in our health systems. Malnutrition is rampant. We have now a, a, a large number of e equally or more people with obesity uh, than with undernutrition, malnutrition deficiencies are rampant, and, and also uh, non-communicable diseases are on the increase. These are heart disease, uh, diabetes, and so on. This is placing an enormous burden on our health and environmental systems and on the land use system in general terms. Now, I want to be a little bit positive here. And what, what you see here is that while we are against these pressures, we can bend those curves. We can bend those curves and start really making significant improvements. And this is an example on energy transitions from some of the, of the major economies. Look at what they've managed to do in 20 years, 20 years of, of energy transitions by really improving investments in, in clean energies, appropriate legislation, regulations, setting targets of where we wanted to be in energy in, in different countries and repurposing subsidies, which is something that Eric did. And look at the changes that, that, that have been possible in some of these countries. Obviously, 
uh, many of you, like myself, then start thinking, well, how are we going to do this in low and middle income countries? Because what you see here is uh, basically OECD having, those, having that level of, of success in the energy transitions. Still, look, this is the challenge that we have at, at the moment. And in our case, it's very much related to the food system. And a lot of people think, well, talk about the food system here, the food system there. Well, what's the food system in reality? The food system is basically everything from production to consumption, including our food supply chains, including our food environments, which is basically where, we, where food is made available to us, where food will have different prices, where we're going to make different choices, et cetera, uh, where we're going to have individual factors that will completely shape what we eat uh, and ultimately uh, will shape the environmental consequences, the nutrition and health, the economic success or failure, and whether everybody has access or not to these foods. There's a big equity issue here. And of course, we have a range of drivers, uh, drivers that will actually uh, are basically what, what are moving the, the world uh, all around, which is basically changes in income growth and distribution, politics, social cultural dynamics and others. But this is the food system. And what you can see here is that the beauty is that you have plenty of entry points to try to make uh, a significant transition. Different countries will have, uh, will be in different contexts, different stages of sustainability. But uh, here we are with a plethora of options to be able to, to create change. Now this, I mean, we, we're here because we're interested in, in uh, producing with uh, less emissions. Well, this is the latest data that we have from, on emissions from global food systems. Uh, this is the, the CREPA paper who, which told us that about 30% of the of the of emissions come from anthropogenic emissions come from the global food system in the special report on climate change and land we had put this estimate at between 21 and 30 percent depending on assumptions but what is very clear here is that these emissions uh, the critical thing let me see if i can use a pointer here oops no the critic oh you 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 did see it okay the critical thing here is that, you know, regardless of uh, the type of uh, country, uh, we're dealing here uh, with land-based emissions, uh, which represent the most important category of, of, of emission sources that we have here. And here we're talking about the, the three big ones. You know, it's basically a, a CO2 from land use change, uh, methane and, and nitrous oxide dominating that. In industrialized countries, what you see is a little bit of a, of a higher share from the energy and, and, and fr from the energy, especially and the waste sector, simply because, well, you know, there's, there's more cold chains, there's more processing, et cetera. So you end up having a, a more emissions from those sources. But nevertheless, look, 30%, 30% is not an insignificant quantity. And we really need to make sure that we bring this down uh, and that agriculture and food systems also contribute to the goal set by the Paris Agreement. Now, how do we do this? Let me start by saying uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is to show you a range of options that have been discussed. And uh, one of them is trying to eat healthier diets, ideally from sustainable food systems. And this is a diagram from the Eat Lancet report, which basically told us, look, don't get rid of animal products, just re reduce the quantities of animal products in places where you are over consuming, consume higher quantities of animal products where you're not consuming enough, but fundamentally make the veggies the star, of the, the star of the dish. Make the vegetables the star of the dish. That's, that's what we want. We want colorful plates, plates that have a variety of different things uh, rather than uh, 
having a, an enormous steak with a few chips and a few peas. No, it's really having a more diversified diet and making the vegetables the star of the plate. I want, I, I want to emphasize on that because a lot of people think that, that the Eat Lancet report was really all about vegan or vegetarian diets, which is actually not the case. And, and I, want, I was part of the report, so I can say that. <laughs> uh, ah, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble here. And I know that this is a very complex slide, but I want to show you what were the consequences of, of changing these diets. What you, have in, what you have here is the different planetary boundaries that we chose as, uh, to bound the study. We, we didn't want to increase greenhouse gas emissions up to five gigatons. And we also had the same for cropland use, water use, nitrogen, phosphorus, and biodiversity loss. The baseline is where we are at the moment. And red is that we are already transgressing a boundary, green that we are sort of okay. If we continue as we are with the business as usual, as you can see, we'll end up all basically in red. Now, if we, we have three things to play with, uh, increases in production, uh, reducing waste or changing our diet. If we only change diets, we do very well on greenhouse gas emissions. Why? Because we end up using less land for production. But we don't do as well in the other categories. Why? Because we still need to need fertilizers, need, a, need some land use change, need more vegetables, need nuts, need all the things that we're not consuming in greater quantities to be able to produce. And what I want to show you is that it's only when you get here, when you really try to really bridge yield gaps, half waste, and do the dietary shift simultaneously, that is when we really start finding a safer operating space for the food system. We need the three things. So agriculture and agricultural improvements are still fundamental for what we are actually uh, dealing here. Together with what our nutrition friends are doing on trying to promote healthier diets and uh, all that we've heard about the circular economy in terms of managing weights and so on. So it is a complex problem, but we need to actually work on, on all of these different dimensions. Now, livestock is central to, the, to how we deal with, uh, with the food system and its improvements. And there's a, there's a very wide variety of options to actually try to create mitigation in, in, in livestock systems. Uh, some work that we did here for Sam, for example, some, some of the simplest ways of, of dealing with this is trying to improve the productivity of, of animals. And with relatively uh, simple practices, we can move from the baselines that you find in many of these countries, which are around a kilo, kilo and a half per day of milk production, to around the, the four or five liters of milk, and this will reduce emissions intensities very significantly. Uh, you will have net increases in methane, but if you try to produce the same or even slightly higher amounts of milk, but with less animals, but more productive animals, you get a net gain in your, uh, in your mitigation practices. And this is what we, we tend to term sustainable intensification of the diets in livestock systems. And what we were trying to, to promote when I was at ILRI and when, when you know, the big dairy projects, uh, things that, uh, that Sam has funded on the East Africa dairy development projects and a range of others. So like this, there's, there's a also a very, very broad range of options. And this comes from the special report on climate change and land. Sorry if it's a little bit small, but you know, Especially in low and low, low and middle income countries, what we need to try is, is to implement smart practices, practices that will also lead uh, adaptation practices that will have mitigation as a co-benefit. And it's not that we have just one practice or so. There, there are a, a number of these which will have a very, very significant joint benefits. And it's really identifying 
the context in which these ones could be applied in individual farms with individual producers to really start trying to push for these uh, joint uh, multiple gain solutions, which is really what we, what we need to try to, to, to attain here. Now, I want to say something that, that is, could be a little bit controversial. There's also a range of policy uh, options, uh, and, and we always are, we are fantastic at writing these, you know, all the, in the global nutrition report, all the big reports have these uh, lists of what we could do on the policy side, but, you know, there's zero accountability. There's, there's never actors attached to these policies or to this series of actions. So at the end of the day, we just leave it there expecting that somebody is going to uh, grab the button and really push with it. And we need to start becoming really, really explicit and starting to account for the actions of the different sectors and so on. We are all coming with completely different values into, into this game. And we really need to start uh, trying to implement a greater accountability mechanisms based on solid metrics, based on solid uh, actions that we can actually monitor and, and learn and evaluate and change to be able to achieve the desired effects. We can no longer produce just reports with lists of potential policy actions that we don't even know who is going to, to take care of them. Now, there's also an issue around technology. You know, Eat Lancet and all these future of food studies have examined what's possible at the moment, but we know that there's an enormous pipeline coming of potential uh, technological solutions. Some call them game changes, uh, but in reality, they're not, there's no silver bullets. There's not one of them that individually will actually change how we do things, but it's going to be packages of these different options that could actually uh, accelerate how we see innovation in food systems. I lived in Kenya in the mid 90s, from the mid 90s to the 2010s. I saw the mobile phone uh, and, and what it did. I went from my Nokia 3210 to, uh, to having an iPhone, and I saw my Maasai friends having also the iPhone at the end. And you know, the revolution that that created and the ingenuity of people building all, all sorts of apps and everything tells me that, you know, if, if we put some of these, op these options out, you know, people will actually find a way of, uh, of really implementing them uh, effectively uh, in their conditions. It might not be like the recipe that we, or how we planned it, but definitely people will find a way. At the end of the day, and, and also related to what Eric was saying, you know, we need to really start having a societal conversation around what we see uh, as accelerators of, of, of food systems innovation. You know, it's about transforming, it's about understanding where we're coming from. What's, it's about gaining trust. We need to really understand our different viewpoints, accept them and respect them, but definitely try together to transform mindsets, uh, really start really uh, developing market incentives, understanding beyond the obvious, which we tend to, to often look at, at the main impacts, but down the line, you end up with all sorts of perverse incentives that have completely different uh, uh, impacts that you wanted. We, we see it in many cases and, and in the livestock sector and so on. So, you know, thinking of, of, of all these different uh, ingredients will be essential for us to really uh, change how we think about this. We've talked about the circular economy. For livestock, it's one of the critical things that we will have to do, and there is plenty of options to to do this. This is the paper that we did with, with Wageningen, uh, really looking at um, what would happen if we implemented the circular economy in, in, in livestock systems. We could end up producing up to 23 grams of protein per capita decoupled from land. This is about, you know, about 40% of a human's requirement of protein. So that's, that's very significant. You know, we could actually uh, think of having these systems actually 
going even lower than what we thought was needed through state diet changes and so on. A circular economy would be one of the things that we'll need to try in, in the next future of food set of studies that we do, because none of the results even include this thing that seems to be so incredibly promising. We need to go back to better land use planning, and this might sound like, like an old thing, but you know, the reality is that there's a myriad of opportunity costs in the use of land. And in many cases, we are not using land for its optimal purpose. There's livestock that, you know, is raised on, on arable land that could be used in more, more efficient ways. There's other places where we could actually start thinking of of planting a more nutritious food rather than cereals, where when we know that we already have tremendous amounts of kilocalories being produced, we need land for uh, growing fruits and vegetables, which are protective for uh, non-communicable diseases and so on. So this land is at the center of how we're going to deal with the food system. You saw the emissions, but it's also the emissions, the water, the nutrients, the biodiversity, Many, many things are attached to land, and we need to go back to, to thinking about this. This is an example from Tim Searchinger, looking at the opportunity costs of carbon. So this is what we account for. But these are the real ones when you really start accounting for the opportunity costs of, of, of carbon. Uh, this, this would be the emissions uh, that, that you would need to account for, which are very significant, which brings me to the true cost of food approaches. True cost of food approaches, I, I have just one, one or two more slides, just so that you don't uh, think that I'm, I'm overstepping here. Uh, the true cost of food, we've just estimated for the UN Food System Summit, that it's around $29 trillion. And what you see here is that, you know, health and environmental costs are roughly the same. Uh, but in reality, if we take into account the food prices and, and the current expenditure, we are only accounting for two, uh, two well, basically two thirds of the costs are not accounted for at the moment. So how are we going to do to actually find mechanisms for, for incorporating the true cost and true value of these products? Again, I have a, a very, I'm really hopeful and I want to really feel that we can do this in a short time step. I think that there's a behavioral change revolution occurring that we need to, to accept. This is from the Human Development Report. And just look at, for example, this is, this is 20,000 people from all over the world. And you can see that people are prepared to change their behaviors on packaging, on a uh, mending what they have, saving energy at home, and even a little bit, uh, people are starting to think about how they're going to actually consume better products and, uh, uh, well, perhaps changing what they eat and so on. So this, this is also something important, but it gives me hope because we see this great behavioral change revolution occurring. Now people are starting to think of, of holding things accountable. And this is, we, we need to actually champion and celebrate uh, responsible behavior, especially from the big companies. You know, at the end of the day, we need to put these things for the benefit of humanity. And this is a, a phenomenal example from Volvo, you know, who invented the, the seat belt that we use now, uh, was invented by Volvo. And they decided to put it out, not claim any IP, for the benefit of humanity, simply because you know the the benefits would outweigh any potential a, a profit, and this is the kind of behavior that we will need to really make significant changes, and we need to do it now, because not doing it now will be super expensive in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Herrero. Um, I
looking for the, oh, she's in the back. Um, perhaps we have time for one question. Okay. Oh, wonderful. There's time for plenty of questions then, if you could please find microphones. Um, thank you. Um, one question, do you mind elaborating a couple of um, uh, examples of how it would look the decoupling of livestock from land? Yes of, yes, of course. Well, uh, you know, for the circular economy, what we are actually calculating here is we, we make two calculations. First, how much land, how much uh, animal source foods can you produce from low opportunity cost lands, from lands that don't compete with livestock, uh, sorry, with crops? You can actually produce about seven grams of protein per capita if you use those lands that don't compete don't compete with arable land. And, but on top of that, if we used waste streams, food, food waste streams, or for example, if we were to produce microbial protein from fermentation products, et cetera, if we incorporated all that food waste into a, the production, for example, of monogastrics, you could actually theoretically produce up to 23 grams per capita per day. So those are the two main streams that we use. It's obviously a potential because you will end up having a, you know, competing uses for those resources. You could actually send them to energy. You could actually uh, do compost and a range of other things. But at least it gives you an idea of what the potential is in terms of circularity uh, through livestock. Pedro, I'm oh, no, sorry. <clears throat> Mario. What were the real consequential <clears throat> outcomes of the food summit? You know, the, the consequences of the food summit, I think uh, there, were, there were two main ones. This realization that accountability is central to the process, uh, that we have not been doing a very good, a very good job at really uh, developing metrics and developing uh, ways of, of ensuring that the stakeholders really uh, do what they need to do. And obviously that this needs a level of negotiation with, uh, with different people. Then secondly, the, the realization that uh, we need to repurpose subsidies in a way uh, that goes beyond just giving subsidies to farmers but really perhaps distributed the subsidies much more throughout the different stages of the food system. Uh, thirdly, uh, that we, sorry, the accountability, that, ah, that we really need to invest in things related to the true cost of food, which is something that we, uh, there, there's a whole set of raft of ideas on how that could be implemented. And in ways in which you don't need to actually uh, put the onus on the consumer through increased prices, you know, you could do smart procurement schemes. You could do, a, you could actually repurpose some subsidies so that you could actually uh, account for the environmental costs using those subsidies and so on. I would say that those were the three, the three biggest ones. Thank you. We have time for just one more question. Thank you. Um, Mario, great presentation as usual. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I get, I have some concerns about some of the numbers that are put up in terms of how they are estimated, because by and large, there's very little accounting for the bioavailability of nutrients, especially when you're thinking about things like the cost of the diet, when you're looking at um, greenhouse gas emissions, so if we think about someone who re goes for oat milk or almond milk instead of you know, real milk, um, that person may be getting the same amount of protein, but there are so many important micronutrients that they're lacking. Um, and there's recent information showing that when you value products based on bioavailable bio nutrient supply, you get a very different picture. Some of the livestock products and so on uh, have comparable or even less emissions and impacts 
on land, on water, on greenhouse gases than is commonly thought. So please comment on that. Absolutely. Bola, I absolutely agree with you. As a livestock scientist, I know the value of micronutrients for, uh, for uh, well, you know, for, for uh, poor kids in, in the slums of Nairobi or in, or in different places and for the elderly and such. And, and these have not been taken into account in, the, in all the calculations of healthy and sustainable diets. That is one monumental omission of, from the Eat Lancet and from all these other uh, kinds of reports that have emerged. Uh, what I can tell you is that we're doing, we're planning now Eat Lancet 2.0, it's in the, and what we hope is to really bring way more uh, livestock scientists uh, and different kinds of stakeholders uh, to bear uh, a much, much, much greater uh, influence on, on how these things are calculated. But that omission has been mentioned before, and I'm, I'm fully with you. When we really need to, we, we really need to go just beyond protein and, and energy. Basically. Thank you very much, Dr. Herrero. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to welcome our next group of panelists to the stage. And we have a great moderator as well. I wanna welcome Pedro Sanchez. He's a research professor in the Department of Soil and Water Sciences, and he's a powerhouse part of the Food Systems Institute. So Pedro, take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, to start with, I would like to <laughs> ask uh, Herrero another question. You, you nutritionists are forgetting about iodine. Don't answer it, please. But, uh, but just, just, just to start with that, it's, it's really bugged me for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, this session now, um, Farm to Fork, is, uh, is getting now into into the productive part of the of the uh, food system in agriculture what we have is three uh, <clears throat> outstanding practitioners and one i'm just about to meet now is daniel who's been uh who's been preparing his stuff here but we have them all here and uh Together, they represent different aspects of the forward thinking and action on, on improving food systems. So I'm not gonna say much more than that. And I would like to start with AJ Kawamura, a well-known, I don't know what you call this guy. I've known him for a few years, but he's been all over. And, uh, and he, he works, uh, uh, he was a uh, California Department of Agriculture head off when I met him. Now he's into all sorts of uh, <clears throat> things. So um, I will start with him. And then uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the other two also. Uh, Jamie Weisinger is director of a very large set of family farms uh, that probably produce more tomatoes and everything else. So from a real production <clears throat> uh, point of view, Find out, find out uh, what this uh, farm operation is doing, and then Daniel Friedline, he's uh, he's from Orlando, and uh, he's a, a <clears throat> project manager of the Office of Sustainability and Resistance Re Religion uh, Resilience in the city of Orlando. Uh, so we have a. a <clears throat> A viewpoint of 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 uh, an experienced um, government uh, servant and agitator and promoter of a lot of things in the great state of California. Uh, we have a major producer of of tomatoes, and we have Daniel now, who's sort of the consumer of this thing. Uh, what happens to the city of Orlando? 
So let me ask A.G. Kawamura to take the floor. Okay. Yep. Thank you. This way. Good, good afternoon, everybody. And I think I'm... Is it the top one? Uh -huh. Okay. It's not moving yet, but... Okay, go ahead. But good afternoon. Uh, again, everybody, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, first time in Gainesville, and, and it's also uh, an exciting time to talk about agriculture. Uh, my uh, presentation today is about the 21st century agricultural um, renaissance. And when we talk about a renaissance, it's pretty simple uh, for, for, you know, uh, it, it, just recently, the archaeologists, because of carbon testing, decided that they could now sit, uh, define that agriculture has been on the planet for 30,000 years, not the 10,000 years many of us were taught when we were in uh, grade school. But 30,000 years is a long time, a lot, of, a lot of trial and error, a lot of failure, a lot of success. We don't even know uh, if 30,000 is the, is the test point where Homo sapiens decided they could alter the environment and create a better food supply. And that's what it's all about. Your uh, agriculture's, if, if you want to describe it in a few simple uh, phrases, it's uh, the, the hopefully the sustainable management of life systems, the resources that are available to us and, and the um, avail availability to alter the environment to create a more stable, resilient, hopefully a predictable food supply. But obviously with a changing climate, we all, those of us that are farmers, and I farm down in Orange County, not Orange County, Florida, but Orange County, California. Uh, those of us who have to deal with weather and unpredictable weather, we know unpredictable weather means unpredictable harvest. And that was partly why many of us that had a chance to participate at COP26 and the COPs before that have uh, been banging on the door saying, why aren't we talking about uh, the global food supply? Why aren't we talking about how difficult it'll be if we have changing climate, uh, changing climate regimes all over the planet, we know that will lead to unpredictable food system supply. And that's then again, why the future of the food system is so important to chat about now. Um, I'm gonna see if this works, go ahead. You know, for 30,000 years is a long time, but all we know is uh, if we live in a world of abundance, that means we have a lot of choices. The minute we move to a world of scarcity, we move out of a world of living into a world of survival. And the minute we move into a world of survival, we can uh, understand based on history, uh, what happens when that, that's the case, because we start to really see the ugly side of humanity. So keeping abundance means, uh, means nothing more than that's the highest priority and allows us to keep our choices next. Uh, recently, many of us have had a chance to take a look at these uh, sustainable development goals from the United Nations. If you go back two years ago before COVID, I, I can tell you every conference I ever went to, when you'd ask around the United States, had anybody ever heard of the United Nations Sustainable De Development Goals, these incredible 17 goals, uh, I would say maybe less than 10% usually 5% of the population in the room would raise their hand and say they'd heard of the United Nations goals. Uh, I hope that's maybe 90% flip-flop today that all of you have heard just about uh, what the United Nations goals are. These 17 goals that would change the way we look at humanity if we could accomplish them by the year 2030. And the important thing here is that we realize that as you look at these goals, there's six, seven, eight, nine of them that have a lot to do with agriculture. So much so that you realize that if you can't if agriculture isn't doing well on this planet, you'll never accomplish these goals. And the minute you can say that and, and know that that's a certainty is the minute you can talk about agriculture in a different way. And for many of us, that's how we're starting to talk about agriculture through the lens of these sustainable development goals. And the fact that you can't approach the goals one by one, you have to approach the goals in little clusters where you can achieve uh, great positive uh, progress by linking them together. We like to say it's one plus one equals three. And the dynamics then behind how you look at changing the planet, how you look at this transformation for humanity is driven basically by rethinking, if you will, in the same way that COVID helped us uh, and the pandemic helped us to rethink and relook at the way we see our world. Uh, this is another lens to look at uh, a future that has never existed, but is certainly within our wheelhouse and within our capacity to make happen. Next. 
Um, when I talk about a, a renaissance, my um, neighbor who recently retired this last year at 96 years old, remembers the names of the horses he plowed his fields with as a young 13, 14 year old. He's born in 1925. In 1927, the global census said we had 2 billion people on the planet. He was telling me that his uh, names of his horses is uh, Baldy, Claude, and Dolly. Two big draft horses and Dolly was a little horse. That he said his uh, Japanese American, Japanese neighbors would borrow Dolly um, so he could cultivate their fields because she had small feet, wouldn't step on the plants. And so that was a good instance of precision agriculture. Um, <laughs> Uh, next. But as we look at the challenges that we have um, back then, uh, it's unbelievable to think that here's a guy that's alive today. And any of you that have uh, friends that are alive in their 90s, ask him about the coal man, ask him about the ice man, ask him about the world they lived in. We are in fast motion in the chart that uh, Carlos had, uh, had a few minutes ago, showing the acceleration of knowledge, acceleration of so many different aspects of our world uh, has not changed. I mean, it's, it's changing things rapidly, but the things that we have to fight for, the things we have to fight against are not changing. We still have the same vulnerabilities, whether it was the uh, severe freeze you had here just a couple of weeks ago. This happens to be a freeze in California from several years back uh, that really uh, actually killed a lot of orange trees, citrus trees in our state. Go ahead. And the idea that we um, are gonna experiment with all kinds of different agriculture. I've gone in my life from starting with furrow irrigation. I've, I've got 44 years under my belt and 66 this year, but the, we started with furrow irrigation uh, just with siphon lines. Then we went to sprinkler. Then we went to drip. We started to look at soilless farming. We're starting to look at uh, uh, moving from uh, molecular chemistry in our, in our crop control, our pest control to biologicals, biological predators, biological predators that might be encased in a biofilm and released as, uh, as hungry adults. There's so many interesting new technologies moving forward right now, um, but they're all put into a place by the farmers need to get that crop out. As we started to experiment with these hydroponics, we recognized that there was challenges with how they would work. Uh, we have a lot of friends. I'm a strawberry producer out of uh, California, and it's one of our main crops. And yet we're still always looking for new cultivars, cultivars that might be more salt resistant, more heat resistant. We're looking for production cycles. Um, we've been using recycled water in our area for over 30 something years. And now there's an effort to look at biosolids as a new fertilizer, uh, clean biosolids that can be utilized as a fertilizer. We know that we have a challenge maybe with the public in using something like that, but that's what we had 30 years ago using recycled water in our area. And so as we look at climate smart agriculture, you're just constantly looking for new tools that can help you be more effective in what you're trying to accomplish but also more importantly, finding tools that are cost effective, that work, and that also will give you a chance to improve what, on what you're doing. Next. Um, I'm a urban farmer or a farmer in an urban area. And I really would rather describe ourselves as farmers in an urban area. We farm uh, for the last 35 years on ground that we lease or we rent. We don't own the ground that we farm on. So we're really innovative or let me call it uh, resilient and looking at vacant lots and things that we can farm on. This is uh, used to be an abandoned golf course that we found that we could farm on next. This is uh, the old El Toro Marine base down in Southern California where they filmed the movie Top Gun. And as it was abandoned, we realized there was a whole bunch of land out there. And yep, that's us in between the runways, uh, looking at some really exciting ground that actually had not been farmed on aggressively for uh, uh, really the entire uh, 70, 80 years, 70 years or so. Um, we are dealing with and challenged by some of the contamination issues that we have in our world, especially some of the new chemical contamination uh, issues that are there. And so we're not farming currently on these bases, but we're just waiting for that green light to come back and understanding what our mitigation challenges may be or might be. But in the same way that you're utilizing uh, every kind of a square inch, I want to be able to bank a plug for edible landscaping because landscaping takes place all over the planet in every mega city on the planet. There's open lots, there's vacant lots, and whether you go above ground, whether you go up on a roof, whether you go underground, whether you go inside of a building, whether you find open spots that are basically are currently parks 
we uh, understand that an edible park is the same as park. You have to irrigate it, you have to take care of it, but if it can give you edible products or usable products, how great that is. Uh, we recognize that by taking a, a harder look at uh, the waste streams within the urban area, we're working very closely with the waste management company. In fact, on this picture, just about oh, a thousand yards just to the, your left or right, to your right, um, there's a waste management company that's been taking green waste from all over the city from the landscaping cuttings and stuff, and they make wonderful compost out of it. And by turning that compost over, then you can mix that with a manure component. Not Most of us wouldn't, as farmers, wouldn't use 100% manure as a as an, uh, uh, soil amendment, but we certainly would use an 85% green waste to 15% blend or some kind of a blend, depending on what you're trying to accomplish in your field. These are all the exciting things that are taking place. Next. I'm trying to rush through these because I know we're on a tight timeline here. And remember the guy with uh, the horse and plow? Um, we know we're just around the corner from automated tractor, uh, autonomous tractors. This is satellite. I remember when we got the first laser in our area about 20 years ago to help level our grounds using a laser that was land-based and then moving to a satellite. So now the laser's obsolete and the satellite helps drive our ability to uh, level a field or to cut perfectly good rows. And in all of these kinds of tools that we have are climate smart ag, but no one ever thought to call them climate smart ag, um, but they are. Uh, I think that's my point is I, what the world doesn't seem to quite realize, and especially the critics of agriculture, I think uh, is that they're stuck in the, um, some of them are stuck in the 20th century. They actually believe all the things that are taking place in the 20th century is still the norm today. Uh, a lot of them are stuck in the uh, year 2010 or the year 2000, uh, it's 2022. And I can only tell you that every year, every time someone calls you up and says, hey, I got a new product I want you to try in your field. There are farmers all over this country and all over the rest of the world. They're busy trying, and put, trying to put them into their field and see if they work. And there's a lot of snake oil, believe me. And there's a lot of systems that work, but they're not that efficient. There's a lot of ways to get the same products out, but it still comes down to, can you make a dime at it? Uh, next. We know and our imagination is driven by basically our uh, amount of knowledge we have. And with this enormous amount of new knowledge pouring in, it kind of gives us a new lens to look at the world with. I, I mentioned the sustainable development goals earlier. And the beautiful thing about those SDGs is that you look at those goals and you realize how would we go about accomplishing all of those by the year 2030. And it makes you use your imagination in a different way. And when you look at through the world through a different lens, your vision changes. Uh, I always like to use that quote from Mark Twain that says, you can't trust your judgment if your imagination is out of focus. And the, the problem with us right now is we need to take, take a chance to take a step back, understand that we are way far ahead uh, way further ahead than we were in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. Uh, uh, I love the, some of the presentations today that kind of get us a chance to catch us up to the, year, the, the time that we're in right now. Next, please. And recognize that in the year 2022, nothing uh, that is feasible is impossible anymore. Uh, we recognize that feasibility going to commercial, commercial uh, uh, uses is, is, is happening so fast, it just kind of makes us uh, our, our minds spin, but also our minds turn. Go ahead. Next, please. And so whether it's uh, uh, putting a light inside of a barrel because the light, you need less light to uh, aeroponically grow or uh, hydroponically grow something uh, next. Um, and you realize that, oh, you could take a bunch of those and stack them in a place. You know, our imagination can do wonderful things next. Um, we see these, these buildings going up indoor agriculture just on serpentine uh, conveyor belts that allow the water to uh, be in one place and the plants go by the irrigation station or the harvest station. There's some neat things taking place next. Not everything can be grown this way, as we know. You can't feed the world from a rooftop but you can produce a tremendous amount of food in different ways. We have a project where we're teaching the average citizen just how they might transform their backyard uh, into an edible landscape. And that's called the Farm and Food Lab out there at that old, uh, uh, that old closed down Air Force Base now called the Great Park. Next, uh, the Dutch have a lot, have just the Dutch, the Israelis, the, they just, just 
they've been able to show us so many different ways of how you're going to go about feeding the planet. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from everywhere. This just happens to be, I'm not going to take the time because I think I'm out of time. Um, uh, but this is just, uh, we're, we're growing, uh, we'll call it 52 acres, an acre a week for the food bank uh, out in our area. And the volunteers are harvesting one acre a week. Um, they're planting the crop, they're weeding the crop, they're harvesting the crop, and we're delivering about 40,000 pounds of cabbage, celery, and broccoli to that food bank that was pretty well healed, but it had this opportunity to do something like this for decades. And finally, we said, why are we growing four or five acres a year? Why don't we grow 50 acres in a, in a year and deliver an acre every day? And it's just amazing to see all the folks that want to come out and be involved with an end to nutritional insecurity. And so next, I'll finish by saying... Um, Oh, okay. Austin, this is a water bucket brigade. This is the old uh, uh, officer's housing unit at the old El Toro Marine Base. And we were growing here food for the food bank and those smaller scale projects. And it just is to tell you that uh, an edible landscape can exist in so many places. And this idea that our imagination can drive uh, us towards that accomplishment of those uh, sustainable development goals by the year 2030, what an exciting time it is and what a renaissance it's gonna be and whatever renaissance it is. So thanks. Tammy Westerster's turn. Thank you. That is a tough fact to follow. I always like listening to AG. He has such a worldly sense of what's going on. His experiences are always, are always valuable to us all. Um, I'm going to try to follow that up um, with a presentation of my own. I've got a bunch of slides to go through. I thought we were getting graded on the amount of slides we put in our PowerPoint, so I added a bunch. But I promise you, I will, I will zoom through them all. Um, so as, as you guys found out, my name is Jamie Weisinger. Um, I am a fourth generation uh, Lipman family member. My com uh, our company has been in our family uh, since the 1930s, essentially. We're almost there. We're getting there. And um, um, uh, my great grandfather started the company um, along with his three sons and son-in-laws. Uh, the ladies weren't allowed in the company at the time, but that's a whole different symposium to talk about. Um, but uh, um, so this one right here. Okay. All right. Good. Good. So um, um, it's interesting because um, I, I want to bring this more to a micro level and, and, and teach you guys some of the things that we are doing on our farm to make ourselves more sustainable and, and help our company to endure into the future. Um, I think a lot of these things that we're talking about being climate smart with our ag is going to help us sustain our companies and our people and create more profits for ourselves because really um, economics is the key here. Um, uh, all of these things that we are instituting really essentially by reducing inputs helps us um, become more profitable. It saves us costs. And so it's, it's not only makes sense for the earth, but it also makes sense as a business to put a lot of these things into play. Um, so a little bit more background on the company. Uh, you can see I had some marketing people help me out. I don't know how to do these things on PowerPoint. So thank God for marketing people. Um, uh, um, we are, uh, why, why we're called Lippman Family Farms, my family's name um, is Lippman. And, and if you've eaten in a, uh, in a restaurant or been to a retailer recently, you've probably had a Lipman tomato in the last couple of weeks. Uh, trust me, you won't see our label in a lot of places, but um, our, our customers like to have private labels and you've eaten a lot of our products in restaurants. Um, so thank you for that. And there were tomatoes on my sandwich today. So thank the Lord for that too. Um, uh, we uh, actually have experienced um, the most growth in our history in the last decade or so. Um, there was a time in the 1980s and 1990s, we realized that the company had outgrown the capability of the family. And that's why we moved, we brought professional management in and hired our first non-family uh, member CEO. We used our balance sheet to grow our company. We made um, 10 acquisitions in about 12 years. And we are now the largest open field, well, we call ourselves the largest open field tomato grower in, in the country. Um, I may not have the data to back that up, but I, I promise you. We're big. Um, we also have developed, we've also um, vertically integrated our operations. 
Um, we uh, um, not only are we in the R and D, we we have an R and D division. We are growers, we are packers. We are also have the largest um, repack and distribution network in the company, with 13 locations all over the country. Um, we are processors. We slice and dice, and uh, you'll see a lot of our products at some of the um, quick serve restaurants that you you eat at. Um, and um, we are in the logistics business. And we just recently bought a um, hothouse company, a greenhouse company in Canada. So we're all over North America. In fact, um, this is a, a list of our locations. We have over 50 locations. We have almost 4,000 employees. And um, you know, when it comes to being sustainable, it's important that we are looking forward. Um, I, you know, this wouldn't be a PowerPoint if you didn't put a definition up there. Um, but, the, but the takeaway really from this is that um, we see this issue as more of a macro issue for our company. What can we do to make sure our company sustains itself? Like I mentioned before, you know, me being a fourth generation member, how am I going to be able to pass that on to my kids, the fifth generation? What can we do to make sure that our company survives in the future? Um, so, um, you know, sustainability really encompasses a lot of different things. It's not just growing climate smart food. It really has to do with a lot of different things. And you'll see this, um, these terms thrown around a lot lately. And we see these terms. Um, you know, it, it, when we think of sustainability in terms like this, it helps us take a more, round, more well-rounded approach to sustainability. And, and it really helps us identify where our strong points are and also where our weak points are, where we can be better. Um, so um, a lot of this is being driven um, by the consumer. Um, that's you guys. And so the customers that we are doing business with, um, the retailers and the food service distributors are telling us, we want you to be more sustainable. We want you to do better. We are our, our customer telling that they want to buy from people who are doing better things. And so they have put those words into paper and into their wallets. And they are telling us that we are going to buy it from the only way we're going to buy from you is if you're doing these things. And so if you look, Walmart um, requests uh, an annual sustainability scorecard from us that we that we provide to them to, tell, to show them where we're reducing inputs. Um, and Chipotle, um, Chipotle um, audits us every year for our environmental and social um, impacts what we're doing on all of those ends. So these, these things really are happening and it's, it's you guys, the consumer that's driving it. Um, as we look at sustainability, this is a list of a number. Some of these folks are our customers, some of our competitors, some are people operating in the same space, um, but these are all companies that issue uh, sustainability reports on an annual basis. So it is increasing. It's, uh, we're seeing some real impacts here. Um, you know, as far as the customer is concerned, we do see customers saying that sustainability and, the, and, and a company's practices does impact where they shop and how they shop. We see that, you know, people want more information, um, you know, and fair trade labeled products have seen a huge increase in revenue. So these are all trends that are pointing in the right direction. Um, this uh, quote comes out of McDonald's, and it's important just because it's, it's looking at sustainability as a long-term approach to success and really making sure that it's continual improvement, that you're constantly looking at all these things and trying to get better at them. Um, you know, and this, this also helps us inspire new ideas. I mean, a lot of our ideas come from the people that are on the front lines in our company um, on how we can do, how we can do better. So these are, this, this slide just shows a lot of the areas that we consider that we that we take into mind when we're considering sustainability. All of the areas up here are important to us. And we, we measure ourselves based on all of these areas and try to improve continually in each one. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on what we do on the farm, just because um, I know that that's what you wanna hear about. And those things are important to, um, you know, not only growing the right crops, but also um, being more economical with our with our crops. So the first one is drip irrigation. Um, the uh, drip drip irrigation, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is not a new technology, but it but it does represent a huge water savings, and that's why I pointed out um, as much as 70% on a lot of our farms, which is a huge uh, savings for the Florida's aquifer. Um, 
Uh, not every farmer uses it. It is, it's, it is expensive to install and, and folks that are leasing land may not have, may not want to invest in other people's land. Luckily, um, we own all of our farms here in Florida. And so we have built those infrastructure to make sure that we can utilize drip irrigation on all our farms. Um, it really guarantees that you're not overwatering, you're not underwatering, that you're really only giving those plants the amount of water that they need. Um, some of the other things we're doing is we are uh, using soil probes in all of our, on all of our farms. Um, you know, these are probes that, that really give us a, a second by second measure of what's going on in those plant beds. And so that gives us a better uh, ability to react. Um, instead of just broadcasting inputs, we can be very specific with our inputs. Um, also, we um, recently changed our sprayers to electrostatic sprayers. Um, that is a sprayer that uses a little bit of static electricity to make the spray more effective. And so we've actually seen about a 30% decrease in a lot of our crop protection uh, products um, just with electrostatic sprayers and making sure that our nozzles are clean and, and having well-maintained sprayers. Um, the, this, this one is an interesting uh, thing that we recently did. We actually partnered with uh, UF's IFIS division, which a lot of those representatives are here today. It's good to see everybody. Um, we've had a very good relationship with the university and they've helped us improve a lot of our crop procedures. Um, this latest one, we did a full-fledged uh, trial in our fields and recently converted all 100% uh, of our farms to a, a different plant bed design. Um, it's actually a higher plant bed. Um, and we found that um, not only can we put more crops on the same amount of acres, but it also allows um, less leaching, less um, uh, improved uh, drainage, um, the, the, the water goes right to the roots of the plant. And so we're seeing improved crops and better yields. Um, it also is better on the folks that are harvesting those crops. Um, higher plant beds mean they don't have to bend, bend over as much and they can be more productive. So in a lot of ways that helped us uh, a great deal. Um, uh, one of the things um, that we've also gone to recently is uh, years, uh, for years in the tomato business, we, we grow everything on stakes. Uh, we used wooden stakes. Uh, we recently uh, moved to a fiberglass stake that should last us from, uh, you know, where wooden stakes were giving us four years, we should be able to get 15 years out of these fiberglass stakes. And they're easier to install and remove as well. So um, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of, we're getting a lot of benefits from that one. Um, with uh, all due respect to the uh, CEO at Syngenta, um, we started a research and development firm uh, uh, of our own about 12 years ago, we have four PhDs on staff um, that are solely, uh, their sole purpose is to develop new varieties for us that, that help us farm better. Um, that we didn't see enough activity in our space, in the mature green tomato space um, from the big seed companies. And so we felt the need to go out and do that ourselves. Um, uh, it's, it's important um, because we've, we've already created over 30 traditional new varieties, all that are bred uh, with uh, pest resistance and disease resistance, all of that in mind, all of that helps us reduce our inputs. Um, if we can develop the crops that weather, um, that can handle extreme weather, um, we have to do less on the farm. So um, all of that reduces greenhouse gases and makes us more efficient. Um, we also are doing a lot in software. We are collecting data as much as we can. This is something we never did in the past. Um, so now we are uh, collecting as much about um, yields and weather, harvest schedules, where are, how many people we had on a, on a field. And that way, um, we have software developers that are actually creating algorithms that can predict when our crops are going to be ripe, when we're going to need um, labor on site, when uh, we think it, it is going to be time to harvest a crop, when it is time to be done with a crop, when the next one you pick is not going to make it to market because it's not good enough, which does happen. Um, we, we, are, we are paying attention to all of those things. Um, we have these new tools at our, at our disposal and we're gonna use them. Um, one of the things that we've also done is we've created an internal accelerator team, great, um, uh, where we are looking at all of the challenges that we have and it is a cross organizational team that is not focused on one thing, but all of the issues. Um, how are we gonna come up with byproducts? How are we going to make our harvest uh, programs, more efficient, all of those things. And we are putting those things into practice all the time. Um, one of the things that I say, we look at this from a macro point of view, 
Um, social sustainability and human sustainability is also very important to us. We want to be the employer of choice. Labor is, is one of the most essential things that we, that we have at our company. And without it, we do not have, a, 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 we don't have an organization. And so we want to be able to um, uh, attract labor um, and not just from a farm standpoint, but professionals as well. Um, we work with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. I know you're familiar with that organization. We are one of the first uh, farming companies to sign on with them. They are a uh, worker-based human rights organization that has set up a framework of uh, auditable standards on how they would like farm labor to be um, treated. It is something that we always did as a family business, but this um, sets up a framework and gives us, um, puts it down on paper and makes sure that we're, we're staying it. Um, adhered to it. Um, we also make sure that all of our labor has free housing. We have we own over 6,000 beds. Um, that's important. And um, we're also developing our own professionals. Um, I, I think somebody said to me that good leaders aren't born, they are developed. And so we, we constantly have development programs going on within our organization every all the time. Um, we are one of the largest users of H2A. Our farm labor, about 95% of our farm labor comes from the H2A program, which is a temporary visa program that the Department of Labor employs. Um, that's an important note because the uh, supply of domestic labor is really dried up to nothing um, these days. And so we're, we're, able, but we're able to recruit workers from other countries to come work on our farms. Um, uh, I'm, I'm winding down. Um, uh, uh, community sustainability is, is important. We make sure to give back um, all the time. We have some very, um, if you'd like to talk to me about, I love talking about this stuff, so I'd, I'd love to expand upon it, but I am running out of time. Um, I do put the Lippman, our, our vision on here, um, just because um, if we really want to thrive, um, we, we need to be held to the highest standards. We need to try to attain that vision. And uh, not just internally, but by our, our customers, our stakeholders, everybody involved, it's important um, that we continually improve. And uh, I'll wrap up on that. And uh, thank you guys, appreciate your time. Boy, of all farm business could be like that. <laughs> Thanks very much, <clears throat> Jamie. And then uh, Daniel Friedline, you're on. All right, thank you all so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and be presenting um, and uh, to be here in front of all of you. Uh, my name is Daniel Friedline. Um, I am actually a beekeeper for the city of Orlando and I do beekeeping for high school and middle school youth. And if you think it's tough to take middle schoolers out to do beekeeping, you should try and get out the uh, job title of city of Orlando office of sustainability and resilience, sustainability project manager in local food. It's very tough to get out. Um, but besides that, um, which one is this? There it goes. Um, I do have a, an incredible um, job opportunity for the city of Orlando, and that is to be a connection, not only for our um, businesses, but also for our residents in uh, food growing opportunities. So you've heard about, a lot about the different food growing opportunities today and what's available. And, um, but here in the city of Orlando, um, we have the wonderful opportunity of, of underutilized lands, rooftops, and a lot of other areas. Um, but basically what we want to go through today, what I'm going to go through is um, what is farm to table? When we look at that, you know, you, you heard the session, you heard it announced, but what is it? And not only that, dive a little bit deeper into that. Well, what's a farm? And, and then what is a table? And what does that mean? Does it mean the same thing to you as it does to everyone else? And that's, I think what I want to get into a little bit today is, is um, not only the involvement of those large growers that are here today and the ag companies, but every single one of you that's sitting here today has the potential to be involved in some sort of program. So for us uh, in the city of Orlando, um, when we looked at this, uh, the pandemic came at a terrible time in 2020. Uh, it's, it was never a great thing in the first place, but it also came as a terrible time during our growing season. And so we had, um, you know, a massive amount of food that was sitting out in our fields. Um, you know, unfortunately, someone was hoarding all the toilet paper instead of all the food out there. And so, you know, we didn't get the food out the way that we wanted to. 
Um, so we had to start looking at other opportunities to be able to get that food and, and um, not just rely on the state for food boxes or, or just rely on, on handouts. We wanted to be proactive about it as the city of Orlando. Um, and so we tried to figure out how we were going to do that. And one of those opportunities was is, uh, in 2016, we'd actually converted over a quarter acre lot in the city of Orlando. Um, that, that lot actually now is part of our Grow A Lot program. And that program is uh, focusing on using underutilized city owned property uh, for its full potential. We heard about some large scale opportunities for that. But even on that local level, there's still the availability to take underutilized lots, start farming on them and getting that food out into the community. The benefit of that, the benefit of that is, is that you have the buy-in from that direct community. You literally can walk across the street with that food and hand it off to somebody. So you're cutting down on those carbon emissions that are involved in the food that you eat every single day. So we were able to go out um, and hand that food out to people through our community supported agriculture program that we created at this lot as well. So through this community, through this West Orlando community, we know this area is um, oftentimes uh, a little bit on the uh, food nutrient uh, low level. Um, and so what we were able to do is work with the community, get buy-in from them and understand what do you want? What do you want grown? What would you like to see? What do you want to eat? And I think those are important questions, not to just walk in somewhere and someone say, this is what we have, take it or leave it. You know, this is available. But to get that involvement, that, that community engagement for our residents, that CSA program allows us to distribute out these bags that you see here, $5 for a, roughly around an eight pound bag of, of produce. Now go to the store and try and do that same thing. You're going to come out with a lot smaller of a bag, I promise you, right? So this offers a great opportunity for us. Um, and again, we were able to allow the residents to say what they wanted to be able to start growing that and getting that food out. And this became crucial during the pandemic. So we saw a large change in the involvement of this. And we started to see that they were really coming across the street and coming from the neighborhood to be able to come in and say, you know, what do you have and what can I get as far as food? Because again, we know that the food um, became a little bit of a shortage when we looked at fruits and vegetables during the pandemic. A lot of times people were focusing on what's shelf stable? What's gonna last me? Or what's gonna be that, that food that I don't have to go into the supermarket and then wipe it down with hand sanitizer uh, and try and get it back to my house, right? This was that opportunity. But what we also focused on, I told you we wanted to be, um, we wanted to be a little bit more on the aggressive side when we looked at uh, this, this food that could be available for our residents. And so we started to look into food rescue uh, and food rescue um, started about in 2020 because the Orange County Convention Center has a very large, they have uh, 90 hydroponic units that are set up in that convention center. And when the pandemic hit, convention center shut down. What do you do with that, right? Who do, not only what's, what's been growing, but when then what's the long term of that? If you leave that equipment down, it starts to fall apart. It's better to keep it running. And so what we did is we went in there and talked to them and just said, hey, for this, for this first section that you have, can we get it out? Can I be a vehicle for you to be able to get this produce out? So we created a partnership with the Orange County Convention Center, Center Plate that runs uh, the food there, and Urban Smart Farms, who you see up there, uh, was able to donate those, those fresh leafy greens. Uh, we were able to take those out into the community and start dispersing that, which again was very crucial um, because people wanted that. They, they wanted those herbs, those greens, they're just having a hard time finding them. Again, those farms were starting to shut down and it was a, it was a point where we didn't know what was gonna go on. And so uh, Giving Hope Again was an organization that literally was right across from the CSA farm that we have. So we started partnering with them and they were able to distribute this food out. And then we said, who else? You know, who, who else might we be able to give this food to? So then when we started looking at, well, we could give it out to Orlando Union Rescue Mission. Right, the opportunity for when they invite um, some of our residents without houses to be able to come in for those uh, daily meals and to be able to access those fresh and wonderful foods that are available. Um, this is Libby's Legacy Breast Cancer Foundation. Right, I had a, I had a talk with um, the owner of this organization and as we were talking about it, uh, one of the things I found out about breast cancer is, is um, the prevention of reoccurrence through a healthy diet. 
But again, when you look at the supermarket and the availability of fresh foods that are out there, what do you do? If you're scared to go outside, you know you may be a survivor and you just don't want to risk it. What do you do? Who do you rely on that's going to get you that food? The city of Orlando said, we want to be that vehicle. We, we want you to rely on us. We want to be able to get that food to you. So we started on a weekly basis, taking this food over to them, dropping it off so that they could have those fresh uh, leafy greens. And you'll see here in a moment how we expanded that even more. We expanded that through uh, getting involved with an organization called um, Society of St. Andrews. And this is one of those points where if you do not know about this organization, I suggest you look it up. So it's one of those points where you could be connected into your communities and the surrounding farms to be able to get food out of those farm fields to those that need it. Uh, on endhunger.org, uh, the, the website that Society of St. Andrew runs, um, they have a little, a, a little uh, clicker that's on there. And you can see the amount of food waste that's going on uh, on, a, on a monthly basis. And it's concerning, right? The clicker's already at 22 billion right now for food waste. And what does that look like? Is that just on the consumer end? No, it's not. It's also on the producer's end. So when we look at that production scale, we say, what can we do to help that? How can we be involved with it to help those farmers? That if you have food that's left in the field, how can we get that food back out to those, especially those who are actually needing it? So we did that. We started working with Society of St. Andrews. We started gleaning things like strawberries, right? Everyone loves strawberries. I hope you love strawberries. And so uh, we started getting strawberries in. And just think about that. Just think about the opportunity, especially for those uh, in the city of Orlando, for those residents without houses and the availability of fresh strawberries all of a sudden and what that can do to your life. The, the possibility of just changing and creating a little smile just out of that one action. And it only takes a set of volunteers to be able to go out in those fields. It takes that partnership, that relationship with our farmers to be able to make that happen, to change one person to be able to, to make them smile. We started partnering with One Heart for Women and Children. This organization focuses on giving back directly to those that it states, right? For mothers, especially, to be able to get those fresh foods to their children. And that's who we started giving the produce to. Now, Brussels sprouts, I know you're wondering who actually eats Brussels sprouts. And the question is no one. I saw a few hands raised, but they're lying. Really, we just use that as a reinforcement to tell kids, eat your vegetables or we'll cook Brussels sprouts the next day. Uh, no, when we look at that, we look at things, uh, fruits, vegetables, all the way across the board, uh, no matter what it is, we always have the opportunity to partner with farmers and to be able to get those out. We had already gleaned uh, all the way up into the point that you see these people in this field right here. We got out, um, I think it was some three, 4,000 pounds of Brussels sprouts alone, right? And it's probably going to go to the one person that raised their hand over here. That whole field was available for gleaning. The whole field. We filled up all of our vehicles. We couldn't load any more boxes. And we still had the field all the way to the end. It got plowed under, right? When you think about those, uh, um, those nutrient-dense foods that we could actually get out to the people and the fact that we weren't able to, but there's a good side to that. We were able to, and we at least were able to go out there. 3,000 is better than zero in anyone's book, All right? Corn, um, you know, let's get back to the actual fruits and vegetables we like here. I get it, I get it. Uh, corn. Uh, we were able to do the same thing. We were able to start giving that out. Christian Service Center was another organization, and they focus on giving food, uh, especially to our residents without houses. And so we wanted to be able to provide this at any cost that we could um, from our specific corn grower that we had here in, in Central Florida. Uh, again, we got out several thousand pounds of corn alone. We started focusing on some of those same organizations that we knew were able to get out that, that um, produce. Uh, and then we found a grower that had peaches that were available, right? There were peaches that were left on the trees. They were getting ready to go in. They were going to prune all those trees, make it beautiful for next year. But you can see behind there, that's readily available food. What can that do? What, what are you able to do with that readily available food? Here's what you're able to do. Make a smile, right? With a partnership that you're able to create with farmers, with your organizations that are involved in the, in the food distribution, 
And with your volunteers that are available, you can create a smile. And that's what we want. So City of Orlando, uh, food recovery and food distribution. Uh, total uh, for 2020 through 2022, um, 35,000 pounds of food driven back and forth between, between farms, between organizations. Um, I was able to be able to, to try and get that food out to people. Um, 20 or total, 23 was 0.8 was transported. So that was a lot of um, Orange County Convention Center. That was the growers. But the gleaning, the gleaning, 12.1 thousand pounds. That's the city of Orlando alone, right? That's just the city of Orlando. Now think about Orange County. Think about Gainesville. Think about the amount of students that are here, either sitting in here or teachers that have an effect of being able to get that information out. I want you to think about the impact you can have for food and the availability of getting that food out of the fields. Thank you so much. Okay, I wish we had some more because they're so fantastic. We learned so much. But let's, now let's have a panel, a panel session. And uh, the floor is open for questions. You may want to direct it to a specific uh, speaker or, or just, uh, just ask us in general. So questions, please. There's one back there. We need a microphone. Oh, there's several over there. Hi, thank you so much for your presentations. So for the last presentation, Daniel, uh, again, thank you. So what are the short, medium, and long-term planning of those uh, City of Orlando activities? And also what are the implications for, you know, like keeping these things going on? Is, is that something that we should be aiming at keeping for the long term? Thank you. So the, the short term was mentioned on here um, was just the availability of food to give out to the communities. Um, but as we start to look at that, um, you know, you're absolutely right. We looked at the long term of that. So um, for us, we looked at um, what does that look like? We started to plan out um, and, and we grew our Grow Lab program from our one vacant lot over to now um, four, or sorry, not vacant, underutilized lots. Um, and um, so we grew our program. And that happened faster than we thought. And a lot of that was because of the efforts that were placed. Um, so the city government, there's oftentimes a lot of uh, tape to cut through. Uh, but when you see the recovery efforts and what it's doing for the community, it's oftentimes hard enough to say no to that. And so we were given those um, three plots of land um, to which we're now gonna start uh, teaching about hydroponic uh, farming out there as well. Um, the long term of that also is we were placed uh, at AmeriCorps Vista which then was able to get a job with Society of St. Andrews. And now we have a consistent relationship, so much so that we're able to place volunteer activities uh, on our websites and to be able to get more people involved. Um, the long term really is, is I think, um, to me, I, I believe uh, the government should, and especially local government, should really get out there and try and make things happen and then get out of the way. And I think that we should really allow um, the, the community to focus on um, what those actions were and see the community and see the surprise we have when communities get involved. It's just a lot of times people don't know about it. And so the long term is, is that eventually we can step back and we can allow for this to continue to happen as much as it is, as it is um, without as much of the involvement in it. Good question. Good question. Can I add something to that? I know in our area, um, 30, 35 years ago, our city council commissioned a gleaning task force because we had a lot of agriculture in our area and a lot of fields with stuff visibly on the ground. And with that commission, uh, it helped open the doors to be able to arrange for volunteers. But it wasn't until the Good Samaritan Act passed that it became very easy for farmers to allow uh, producers, I mean, volunteers to come on into their fields without as much fear for liability. So you're right, there's policy that's involved, but there's, once you get it going, there's just tremendous uh, energy to get to come out of the community. Yes, hi, everyone. Mario, come on. Thanks. Uh, those were spectacular examples of, of successes in, in dealing with uh, food production and waste. And I'm just wondering, 
what do you attribute the, your success to? What are the, the two or three key things that really determine this? And why do you think that these models are scalable? Who would like to tackle that first? It, the, one, the one, we like to call it innovative collaboration. You have a lot of natural partners out there that wanna do good things. They wanna see good things happen. And a lot of times what's happening is you don't have the activity or you don't have the endeavor that allows you to bring those collaborating partners together so that we like to say one plus one equals three, where by pulling resources together, it might be someone who has an open property uh, open property uh, costs a landlord uh, dollars to keep the weeds out, to keep the rodents out, uh, weed abatement, those kind of costs. And so when you can utilize a vacant property, it might be uh, one right here on campus. Uh, we're for currently farming on a land grant, uh, on land grant property that was sitting idle, uh, doing the looking for more researchers to come in. But we've got 40 acres that we were able to activate. Uh, for this program to custom grow food for a food bank. And it was as easy as just bringing the partners together with a vision of what you're trying to accomplish, create more uh, nutrition dense, nutri nutritionally dense products that could get to those most in need at the food bank. Thank you. We do that here too. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, it, it's interesting because um, the city Orlando, you know, obviously has been very proactive with this. Um, and I'd love to see that kind of government uh, support come our way because, you know, as a farming organization, you know, when you're done with a crop, you pick it as many times as you can. When you're done with it, you're moving on to the next. You know, your next thought is how do we get this crop cleaned up? How do we, you know, how do we pull the plastic? How do we pull steaks? How, how do we move on to the next, especially when you're, you're, you're harvesting 52 weeks a year. And so to have, you know, for us to stop and think, well, who can we partner with? How can we get them in here? How can we get enough volunteers? How can we, how can we package the product? How can we transport it to the food banks? That's a lot to think about. And having that sort of government agency that has made a point and made those partnerships and provided those resources would go a long way to making those kind of things happen. Okay, thank you folks. Another question. I hear something. I have a question. Um, thank you. And I'm very interested about the micronutrient value of hydroponics. Does it contain the same wide range of minerals that uh, soil grown product has? Thank you. The answer is yes and no. Uh, you know, it's a, 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 a hydroponics can be looked at like a patient on an IV. And so whatever's in the IV, what is, whatever's in your solution batch, and you can certainly find nutrient dense, mineral dense, all the micro micros that you would normally find in a liquid to go put through your hydroponic system. Um, so the, the answer a lot of times is if it's not in that package of irrigation, uh, chemi uh, fertigation for that hydroponic system, you'll still get a beautiful looking product, but it might be missing some of those components. But it's 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 a yes and no. It just depends on what the what you're trying to shove into that feeder line for that hydroponic or aeroponic uh, crop and what, what where whatever's also it's pulling up out of the root base that you've got it attached to if there's other minor elements there too and um to say ask for extra time um <clears throat> so we could have a, a few more minutes so please go ahead okay uh, just to add in on that um, briefly with the hydroponics, um, one of the things we found with um, Orange County Convention Center is, especially when we looked at Libby's Legacy for Breast Cancer Foundation, um, you know, why wait for the plant to get all the way to its normal and, and mature height when you can eat the microgreens? And so um, Orange County Convention Center started focusing on microgreens as uh, availability for um, those women uh, and those that were um, survivors of breast cancer. And so that allows for an uptake of nutrients. Oftentimes there's a little bit more of a nutrient base inside of that. Um, and so that's another way to be able to get it out is um, through a healthy amount of microgreens. Thank you. One last question. Yes. So first of all, thank you. Spectacular panel and set of presentations. Um, on the surface, a little eclectic. You think, what are the, how are they related? Uh, in my mind, the thread I see is community seeing how local government, local farmers, multinational corporations, a big university are working together um, to support local food systems. It, 
I want to know, have any of you um, started partnering with community colleges? That's another key component of a community. And across the state of Florida, across the United States, we have community college students that are experiencing hunger, community colleges that have created food banks, uh, community colleges that provide all sorts of technical vocational training that could be in hydroponics or something else. And of course, community is just in our name. Uh, I'm a community college administrator, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> so anyways, I'd like to just hear more about the work you've done with them or not. I can quickly say that uh, those are some of the greatest resources that are kind of not maybe fully engaged or, or brought into the system. Uh, FFA chapters at the high school level have facilities that are growing a lot of products or potential to grow a lot of products. We act, had a chance to activate a six acre farm on a, on a high school in our area, uh, FFA chapter. And the food bank actually is then underwriting all the production and they're getting all the food out. When you see the whole student body come out to harvest cabbage or watermelons or butternut squash, it's pretty, pretty neat stuff. So there's wonderful resources that can be realigned, if you will. Uh, and anytime you see vacant lot, you know, I, I look for vacant lots to farm on because uh, that's what I need to find to be able to farm on. I don't own the land I farm on. There's all kinds of uh, uh, potential for edible landscapes is the point. And community colleges, a lot of times they have a hort division, a horticulture division that actually is sitting underutilized and they, instead of growing flowers and stuff, they could be growing transplants, for example, for any program like uh, our friend here has. Yeah. I'll just to add on that um, for, for our, especially with our community colleges. Um, so we do partner with them, um, able to get volunteers from them. And I think that's a big side of it. Um, the opportunity for those volunteers to be able to take food home themselves is another big piece of that. So they're able to take that food home. Um, but then also, as you know, we had talked about what are some of the uh, long terms of this The long term is, is that we're able to set up more educational opportunities um, on our underutilized pieces of land. So then we're able to teach about hydroponic farming, which is available at, you know, Valencia Community College is right downtown. Um, and so we're able to then teach high schoolers about hydroponic farming. They then go to um, hopefully go to a, a college, be able to go to that community college and then focus on it. So they have more experience in it. And so, yes, we are trying to then put that puzzle piece together. It just will be a little bit more long term, but love that. OK, I got to wrap up, says uh, Lady Boss here, Andrea. So um, I'm very pleased. I'm very lucky to have this panel. You guys did, did extremely well. It's practical. It gives you uh, it gives you an optimism for the future. This this couldn't be more grass, grassroots, and you've done it. I know you've done it in California for a year. I think start in California, of course, but uh, <laughs> now we now we have it here. So thank you, uh, panelists, all of you, and uh, I think it's time we go down and let. Uh, my dean of research take over. Thank you. That's right. We have uh, research coming up. I know a lot of you are researchers in the room. So you want to stick around, but maybe you need to stand up and stretch for a second. So stand up, see if you can touch the ceiling, use your imagination, use your innovation to get to the ceiling and then have a seat right back down. If you need to take a bathroom break, you're just gonna have to go on your own and do that or uh, a drink break because we are continuing. We are on a, a tight schedule with some of our speakers needing to leave immediately after the session. So if you could please take your seat, thank you. So this session is about research matters. And so we have the Dean for Research from IFAS, and that is Rob Gilbert to introduce our next speakers. But I think we have a, a rowdy room going on right now. Let me, let me ask, how are you doing? Good, how, no, come on, you're better than that. How are you? Do you wanna sit down? <laughs> you can be quiet while standing up. So everybody, quiet. Thank you. Rob Gilbert. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to moderate this session, um, which is called Research Matters. And if you've received a COVID vaccine, you know why research matters, all right? And in the um, agricultural sector, we've done a phenomenal job um, through the green revolution of increasing agricultural production. And now we have a, a greater challenge in increasing productivity and sustainability at the same time. Uh, our presentations today have shown we need every tool in the toolbox to be able to do that. From basic research on uh, topics like sustain, uh, um, yeah, a bio, you know, basic biology and genetic tools to applied research that leads to impact uh, for our growers. For example, we heard with the Lipman presentation on, on beds, for example. Animal agriculture is another theme that we've heard throughout the day. In the first presentation from Dr. Adeshogan, he mentioned the goal of reducing, um, of making livestock carbon neutral by 2050. But a lot of discussion on where we are now and where we need to go on that. The session uh, this afternoon will focus on animal agriculture. And um, our presentations will include uh, methods on how to reduce and mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, how to sequester soil carbon, and also a presentation on how faculty international engagement can improve productivity and impact. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker to you today. It's Dr. Nicholas DiLorenzo. He's a professor in animal sciences at North Florida REC. Um, in Mariana. He comes to us from Argentina. He's been with UF since 2010 with a program focusing on beef cattle nutrition, improving efficiency and minimizing environmental impact. Uh, he's a former Florida Cattlemen Association Researcher of the Year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Di Lorenzo. Thanks a lot, Dr. Gilbert. Thanks everyone. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with such a distinguished roster of speakers and um, thanks the committee for inviting me to, to attend this. So I'm gonna try to focus a little bit on the commodity that I'm more familiar with. Um, if I can get this. I saw everybody else struggle with this, so it can be, it, it must be, I tried it two arrows, so. Sure. There. Okay. Well, um, beef is a commodity that I'm more familiar with, and I know we've been discussing a lot of different things today that pertain to uh, food production in general. But you see in the top left a scary graph, graph that everybody's been talking about today. Uh, how we're going to have to feed the world 259 billion? It is the uh, I think Bala said was the greatest challenge that we have, or somebody said I think the UN. Uh, Mr. Gutierrez said one of the greatest challenges. I, I couldn't agree more. We've been discussing this all day today, right? Uh, but then uh, what's interesting about that is where that growth is going to come, which countries are going to fuel that growth of population. And you see two distinct groups there, uh, Africa and Southeast Asia, are going to be providing a lot of that growth. And that's that creates opportunities when we look at where that protein is going to come from. We know that as the income increase, in some of these countries, so increases the quality of the protein that they produce. There's a whole institute uh, here at UF leading with that, uh, dealing with that and, and having fantastic amount of research related to the impact that the quality of that food has on those uh, growing populations. And on the right side, I have, like I said, the, the crop or the, the um, commodity that I'm most familiar with, beef. And you can see that there is a tremendous opportunity. That's a, a pretty outdated um slide yeah, at least one one next i'll see if i can get this going but it basically shows different amounts of production for the different countries you can see uh well an updated version of that that i put today with 2021 data and what it comes out of that is as far as beef goes u.s uh, still a top producer with 20 percent brazil uh european union china so what I see when I see here is a tremendous opportunity given some of the, the things that I know about US beef production and, and the familiarity I have with some of those countries too. Tremendous opportunity for increasing the sustainability of the food production systems in, the, in general, not just in the US. So uh, next one, please. So this is something that I thought uh, this graph was gonna be shown many times today. I'm actually relieved that I'm the first one to show. Uh, this is something we talk a lot, right? Agriculture in the U.S. is 10% or represents 10% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And I say this a lot. I, I get to sometimes uh, help teaching one of the classes that deals with method, methods for uh, methane emissions. And I like to use this slide to put in context what 
greenhouse gas emissions from livestock represent at least in the US. And that 10% of agriculture, if you put in 40% uh, uh, of that, knowing that 40% of those productions are actually livestock or due to livestock, and that livestock could involve manure, involves uh, mostly enteric methane, and that's uh, largely what I might be talking today. That, that number, that 4% of the total US production, it's a number that's it's four or three, 3.9%. It is uh, a number that's been said many times. And what, let's just not be uh, fooled by that small number in terms of the percentage that contributes to the entire uh, US, uh, the entire US emission, because the main reason is transportation, electricity, and industry are pretty large numbers too. But the size of our livestock industry is pretty large. So when we talk about 4%, of emissions come from like the livestock, it may seem like a, a relatively no number, but what I do often is I like to put that in the context of absolute numbers. So the US livestock sector emits per year 262 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year, which that may not seem, or, or that may seem like a lot, but when you put it compared to, for instance, Spain, that is equivalent to more than two thirds. In fact, it is more, it's like 80% of the total. And that includes industry, transportation, everything in Spain. So basically, and let me say that again, the US, produce, the US livestock sector produces about 80% of what Spain, and I picked Spain for comparison purposes in an industrialized country, what Spain produces in a year. Okay, so the point of this is there is a huge opportunity to reduce that. And that's come to uh, what we're talking about doing our part. I think there's a lot we can do, at least here in the US, to do our part to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. This is perhaps the most unfair slide that I have uh, because it's a big summary of everything that we've been doing. And you can see the title, Assessing the Impact. I try to put together everything we've been working on over the years. And why I say it's unfair, um, and I'll, I'll get to that maybe in the third point, but Let's first, uh, let me tell you that I started working or my group started working in 2013 with greenhouse gas emissions. So since then, um, we were able to work with a technique that you can, well, you can see cattle wearing those yokes. That's the one technique that we have that we've been using to measure greenhouse gas emissions. And we were able to publish the first report ever published in Florida uh, in vivo of measurements of uh, met enteric methane, particularly enteric methane from cattle. That was, uh, that was conducted in 2015, the very first measurements, and I'm gonna show you some of the outcomes of that. And since then, we continue to work many, many different projects with greenhouse gas emission mitigation. And when I, when I was telling you that this is unfair, it's because in this one bullet, what I say is additives, chitosan, which is a derived, from, it's a derived from this exoskeleton and insects. We've been trying numerous things, non-protein nitrogen, garlic, probiotics, uh, IGY, basically egg-derived antibodies. And every one of those words is almost either a thesis or a chapter of a thesis of one of my students. So it's quite unfair for me, but for, for, for a matter of time, I'm not gonna have time to go into that. But I know when they see that, they think, I cannot believe he just put one, one word about my whole four years of uh, my PhD. But, but uh, it, I just want you to be aware that there's a lot of work behind that, every one of those things. And we've been trying Different things were more or less success. We also had uh, the last point there was ecosystem services. We also have worked a little bit on ecosystem services and management, which is an important part of that. Thanks. So, one of the first um, projects that we did when we that we were able to publish, I was telling you before, in 2015, basically shows something that we already we were testing the technique that that we were using. But we were mainly testing um, the effect of the diet. We were able to show something that now is very well known, that basically a high grain diet has the opportunity to cut it by a third, at least from what we measure, compared to what we call a high roughage diet. It wasn't strictly a forage-based diet, but a high roughage diet produced three times more methane emissions than a high grain diet. And that is opportunities to, to improve that and to work at the dietary level one word that you will hear me talk a lot about is uh, intensities of emission. And I truly believe that is something that, um, that we're going to have to tackle if we want to increase the sustainability of the enterprises. And I just wanted to highlight one project that was funded by USDA, one of the, and some of the collaborators are here in the room, where we were looking at evaluating two compounds. Don't worry too much about the warning. Uh, Bismuth soup salicylate is basically the active ingredient in Pepto-Bismol. So we were trying Pepto-Bismol for cattle. 
Uh, that one didn't work so much, but the other part of it, the nitrates did. We had some uh, some success with that. Uh, that work was, uh, we finished all that project and we published it, uh, completely published it last year. And this, if I have to summarize it again in one slide out of that, that four-year project, it is that when we replace urea, and if you're not familiar, urea is a non-protein nitrogen source, quite cost-effective, by the way. It is a great way for us to put uh, protein into diets. When we replace that, a compound that is very commonly used, particularly in the Southeast, with nitrates, we were able to decrease methane emissions by 11%. And that was measured using the system that you see in the picture. Those are actual pictures from the study. So we were, we were quite happy, uh, I would say, uh, happy but not content. We even made the news, uh, that project, uh, we, uh, we had, there was a crew from a news channel in Tampa, uh, Fox 13 came with more microphones than I ever seen. Uh, spend, I, I, many of you are more, a lot more uh, used to the media. Uh, they spend about two hours with me in the field, sweating. You can almost see my face, not the best shot, that, but you can see that I was suffering. Uh, two hours, and then a month later, they tell me that the piece was going to air. So I was very excited. I, I sit in the couch, and the whole thing lasted six minutes. So all the two hours that I know it's not surprising for many of you, but I was quite disappointed. I talk a lot on the microphone about uh, that project. But anyway, just to try to emphasize the doing our part, I think uh, hopefully I go back to that number. There's a lot that we can do in the, in the animal uh, agriculture industries. Uh, we have uh, those large emissions due to our lar large sector. So here's a few things that I, I put in there of, of compounds that I'm working with. Some pictures there, you can see one of them is cattle eating hemp. That's not my project, but some of the projects are involved in that. Uh, seaweed is another uh, area where there's been some improvements. And I was very pleased to hear from previous speakers and uh, particularly from Ramiro from Alanco, some of the solutions. And I agree with many of the statements made, particularly about the, the profitability and how some of those technologies need to show return on investment. I was very pleased to hear that because I think that's, that would be one of the ways that we're gonna move forward in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation. We've been trying novel probiotics, polyclonal antivirus, basically we have a, I have a student for a whole year growing uh, bacteria or actually uh, methanogenic archaea in a lab, it takes a lot of, a tremendous amount of effort to grow, to then inject it to chickens, we collected the eggs and fed them back to cattle, hoping that we'll have, and we have some moderate success with that. But that whole thing summarizes four years of a PhD student. That was one of the projects. And we continue to work. Some of my students in the room here, they continue to work with different strategies, uh, tannins. And, and a lot of it involves additives that hopefully, besides mitigating uh, methane, at least will have an impact on the profitability. And, and, and the context of everything has been discussed today. And I think we had wonderful discussions. The key word that I'm taking away is something that many of you know, and if not, uh, you need to be aware of emissions intensity. And that is the amount of emissions per unit of a product. I think in the context of the growing population that's been discussed today and the strategies that are being devised, that we cannot lose sight of this emissions intensity approach because any strategy that we're going to develop in the future is going to have that component of reducing the emissions without sacrificing production, because we have a big task to do in the future. So, um, with that summarizing, uh, I'm just gonna go through a couple of the points that, that I, I talked today, and then I have one more slide after this. Animal source pro, uh, foods will continue to be important. I think, I hope I made the point that those two grow, growing areas of the globe that really are going to need this animal source foods. And I really enjoy the discussion about the, the, the micronutrients that was before. I think there's a lot of work uh, done in that regard that show the impact of the animal source foods. Uh, the US livestock system particularly for certain characteristics which involve maybe confinement and some of the finishing phases, they are uniquely positioned to apply some of these technologies, and we have a lot of support from the allied industry to develop those technologies. So I think coupling the, the fact that we produce 20% of the, the global beef with the opportunities that are an incentive to adopt technology, I think that would be something uh, really interesting. Um, 
promising uh, strategies in the pipeline. Again, uh, Ramiro from Alanco touched on some of those today, and there's many more that are about to become available. I think we're looking at a great future in terms of uh, strategies to mitigate methane. And I want to just to, to wrap up emphasizing that emissions intensity, that is again, the per unit of product will be the key metrics that will harmonize those two components. That scary curve of uh, 9 billion by 2050 that we're going to have to feed and the amount of uh, the, 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 um, the need to harmonize that with the environmental impact that, that beef production may have. So um, mitigation strategies is an active part of our research portfolio today and continues to be. I've been amazed at the amount of uh, engagement from the private sector and even from the funding agencies, USDA, to, to tackle this. So we continue to work with the scientific community on that. And, as I was talking about the scientific community, I do not want to finish without extending an invitation to all of you. If you're if you're a, a soccer fan like I am, this is like the World Cup of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It happens every. It's actually better because it happens every three years instead of four, uh, and you don't have to bribe the country to host it. I think that nobody wants to host this. So, but we are very fortunate that we are going to host this uh, in Orlando this year. So I want to extend an invitation. Many of you here are aware of this or even involved actively in this uh, project, June 5 through 10 uh, in Orlando, 2022. There's going to be a great forum for discussion of the latest uh, research on greenhouse gas emissions and animal agriculture, as well as policy and many of the other important topics. So with that, I want to end by thanking uh, all the students that made possible all the data collections. I didn't show much of their data. At least I wanted to acknowledge that these are the people that, that collect all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lorenzo. You look much less nervous in front of us than Fox News. So that's a good thing for us. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Maria Solvera. She's a professor in soil and water science at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center in Ona. She came to UF from Brazil uh, and joined us in 2006. Her program focuses on cycling of nutrients in soil and plant water uh, in grant, grassland ecosystems. She's published more than 120 refereed articles and garnered more than $6 million in grants and is a UF Research Foundation professor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Silvera. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Appreciate the invitation. And Nicholas, let's not talk about soccer, please. I'm from Brazil. He's from Argentina. We have a big we are big rivals. Uh, his meaning is pretty good, but soccer-wise, mm. uh, Dr. Argent, I'm going to put my timer so I don't go over. I tend to get a little uh, excited when I share my research, and today they gave me only 15 minutes to talk about my research. I can barely start my research. So anyway, we're going to talk about soil carbon. A lot of people, a lot of the uh, previous speakers uh, mentioned soil carbon. And I want to share very briefly some of the research we're doing in terms of uh, improving soil carbon sequestration, in, uh, primarily in pasture-based beef cattle production. And I can tell you that we're not only carbon neutral, we're carbon negative. Um, so native and cultivated pastures in Florida are sink for carbon. And um, us and some of our partners that are also here present, we've been able to use research to uh, quantify to what extent these systems can be carbon sinks and what we can do to even increase the net carbon accumulation. So carbon, yes, is a real problem. <laughs> Changing slides. Uh, soil carbon, I think for soil scientists, very easy to understand, but for this general public, I think it's, it, it sounds very easy to increase soil carbon stocks, but the reality is this is, we're talking about a very heterogeneous matrix that consists of materials on the different stages of the composition. So it's plant-derived materials that goes into the soil. They are deposited either uh, via above ground or below ground, and they undergo this microbial decomposition, and eventually they become part of the soil organic matter. And the soil organic matter I'm using as uh, synonymous for soil carbon. So in terms of laboratory analysis, there are well-established methods to measure soil organic carbon. However, when you look at quantifying soil carbon, so changes, especially short-term changes in soil carbon stocks, that becomes very difficult um, because of a variety of reasons. The spatial variability associated with soil carbon, what depth do you measure? So as we move into the future and carbon, soil carbon credits become something more um, 
um, predominant, I think uh, quantifying and using different techniques, including laboratory modeling, remote sensing, will have to be an integral part of this uh, process. So soils contain fairly small amount of carbon, soil carbon, probably 1%. In our soils in Florida, it's 1%, maybe 5% is richer soils. But carbon, I think we all agree that plays a significant, um, has a significant impact, not only in terms of climate, but also the, in terms of productivity, it improves soil chemical, physical, and biological properties. But there are some factors that determines to what extent carbon can be sequestered in the soil. Some, are, some of these factors we cannot change. For instance, um, um, climate, soil type, and what we are measuring when we talk about soil carbon and the measurements associated, we're measuring this balance between this difference between carbon inputs and carbon out outputs. So anytime that we're talking about management strategies that can potentially improve soil carbon sequestration, we are eating either in a very simplistic manner, we're either improving inputs or we are reducing the uh, losses or the outputs. So that's the only way we can increase carbon. And like I said, to what extent we can increase carbon in the soil will be determined by a number of factors. One is climate. Whoops. It's moving by its own. So climate, every uh, for each in decrease in 10 degrees Celsius, there's a two or three times increase in soil carbon. What that means is subtropical and tropical regions are um, usually contain low, lower carbon stocks than um, temperate regions. And that's due to the clim climate uh, conditions. There's no way we can change that. Another factor is soil type or soil texture. So you think in terms of Florida, those folks, students that are here, we have extremely coarse, coarse texture soils. I had my PhD in soil science. When I moved to Florida, I have to relearn everything. Soils here contain 99% sand. So what that means is uh, these soils offer very limited uh, protection against degradation. So yeah, we produce a lot of biomass. Those biomass, the biomass can be incorporated into the soil, but the biomass disappears quite quickly. So it's a challenge for us in subtropical environments, moist and um, warm environments to accumulate carbon in the soil. Another fact is management, and this is what the rest of my presentation will be focused. So on cultivated agriculture soils, management can play a, a much more important role than climate and soil type. And that's what I'm very briefly gonna, let me see. Okay, I'm good, good in terms of time. Uh, some opportunities. And I want to go back to revisit. I'm glad that Dr. Lorenzo went before me because remember he mentioned that number. I wrote down the piece of paper, 262 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. That's the uh, contribution of the livestock uh, sector. Dr. De Lorenzo, correct? 262, okay. So if we look at this management practice that can potentially increase soil carbon, they, can, they also have some co-benefits, whether it's productivity or resilience to climate change variation. But uh, I'm using this data from, from Follett. It's a relatively old, oh, okay, maybe with the mouse. Uh, it's a relatively old uh, citation, 2001. But in a very, um, I think, conser oops, conservative approach, he estimated that by simply implementing what he calls improved management practices, and I'm referring to uh, cultivated and native uh, grasslands in, in the United States. You could increase carbon sequestration by those numbers, 10.5 to 34 million metric, uh, million metric tons of carbon per year. So for each metric ton of carbon accumulated in the soil, that removes the equivalent of 3.67 uh, tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So if we go back to the number that uh, Dr. DeLorenzo presented, by just implementing those improved management practice, and if we, if we look at this high end, the 126, it's almost half of the livestock emissions by just improving the way that we manage grazing lands. So how we, how we accomplish that? One of the things, and I'm very briefly, this is not a comprehensive list of all management practices that can be used. I'm just covering some of the things that we are looking at the, from the research perspective. So fertilization, for instance, I mentioned that Carbon is, is the balance between inputs and outputs. So if I want to increase inputs, I have to increase uh, biomass, crop productivity. Uh, for pastures, perennial pasture, most of the carbon comes from below ground. So either through more production or selection of varieties that have deep root systems, those are some of the things that we can do to manipulate and potentially increase carbon. 
uh, fertilization is usually associated with nitrogen, but I want, what I want to say is that um, we look at we have to look at especially from the research perspective and more holistic approach. It's not only nitrogen, but it's through what I mentioned fertilization as a, a proper soil fertility program that can optimize uh, that crop productivity. However, there's some trade-offs. Uh, some of you might be thinking, well, nitrogen, nitrogen, there's a lot of nit nitrous oxide emissions, ammonia emissions, air quality, water quality related issues that are often associated with fertilization. So we have to look at the, from the both perspective, what are the trade-offs? Am I increasing carbon, but am I creating another environmental problem? And I'm not gonna share any data. I'm gonna just share a picture with you. You can, this is a uh, uh, paper that was published in 2017 with a warm season species. If you have to guess which system can sequester more carbon, I don't think I have to present any table. And this is not nitrogen, by the way, this is potassium. So it's not only nitrogen, it's a, uh, again, going back to the more holistic soil fertility approach to improve uh, carbon sequestration. So when farmers, I had a phone call two days ago, and the farmer asked me, the ranger asked me, how, how can I increase uh, carbon sequestration? It's by increasing forage production. And exactly that's what I'm showing this picture. Um, so very quickly, uh, introduction or reintroduction of some species. So in this particular project, there were two graduate students involved, PhD students. We look at the conversion from, this is a native for those who are not from Florida. This is how a native uh, range of land in Florida looks like. So if you we didn't have our land, all the amusement parks, this is how Florida would look like. Uh, and by the way, these uh, na native ecosystems were subject to fire, periodic fire. So we looked at what happens when we increase int intensification. So when you look at from your, or from your right to your left, you increase the level of intensification from the native to a silver pasture system to a cultivated. So this is our warm season grass from Argentina, native to, from Argentina, but they're actually good. <laughs> So there's, I'm not gonna have time there. Like I said, this was the subject to PhD thesis and those, some of the publications, but bottom line is by increasing uh, the intensification, growing from the native to the cultivated pasture, what, what happens, I increase the biomass production. I also increase, in, uh, so it was a system approach. There was a couple of differences between those systems. One was the, of course, the species, changed, we manipulated the vegetation, but we also changed the nutrient input. So the native never receive any fertilizer. Cultivated grasses where we had that uh, holistic fertility approach. Oh, things are moving by on its own. On its own. Dr. Arjun, are you moving the clicker? <laughs> oh, okay. No, I thought he wanted me to go faster. Um, now I wanna move forward. Yes, yes. Uh, so bottom line is that transition increased carbon stocks by 50%. Believe me, if you cannot see there, I'll be happy to share the publications. But not only when we talk about carbon, when we're talking soil, uh, carbon stocks, we don't look at necessarily the longevity of the carbon, which to me as a soil scientist makes a whole dif uh, big difference. Because if the carbon is not stable, that means any disturbance, whether it's climatic disturbance or change in management, overgrazing, can very easily revert back that. Uh, soil accumulation. And that's exactly the next, next table shows. Oop. So if you look at this uh, particular, again, carbon is one of the indicators of lay biocarbon in the soil. There are many ways to characterize lay biocarbon, but I wanna show you that as you increase intensification, you, <laughs> believe me, you increase the lay bio fraction. And therefore what I mean is there is any type of um, disturbance even though the native has less carbon, the native ecosystem has less carbon, is more uh, resistant to decomposition. So we need to be careful. There's some trade-offs. You increase carbon stocks, but the carbon can also be easily susceptible to mineralization. So fire, another interesting um, tool, tool that we can use to increase carbon sequestration. And I wanna highlight here, a very interesting collaborative uh, project that we're doing as part of a large USDA. Okay, don't move. Uh, some of the collaborators. So this is, we are part of this long-term agroecosystem research network. It's also called LTAR. We have our partners here. We are a uh, joint site with Archibald Biological Station. We have a couple folks from Archibald, Dr. Betsy Bouton. Uh, I think Hillary was here too. But anyway, we have, we have the privilege to have this very interesting piece of equipment here that costs, you're looking at over $100,000 investment. And we have two of these. These are called Eddie Covance Towers. So we're, I'm, 
all that I said so far was talking about soil carbon sequestration. And I mentioned those trade-offs when you use some of the management practice nitrogen, you can emit uh, nitrous oxide. So this is one of the few techniques that we can use to measure the complete balance. So this, these towers have carbon uh, dioxide sensors. They also have methane sensors. So I'm able to uh, measure how much of methane the animals are emitting, but I, uh, how much of the carbon is being sequestered by the plant by photosynthesis and how much carbon is being uh, stored in the soil. So what it really matters is this balance, the balance between everything that's being emitted and everything that's being sequestered. So we look at the impact of fire. Fire is a very controversial management tool. We can see what happens when we have the system and the day that we burn. Oops, okay, well, we're gonna move to this one. Uh, so day zero, day five, you can see the green up. 18 days after the fire, the system is a significant proportion of the plants are already greening up. So the reason for that is because the system evolved under these periodic fire events. So this is something that was part of nature and we're just reintroducing fire to these ecosystems. Not only this, this plant, by the way, is called palmetto, has a lot of medicinal properties, but also the native grasses. Next one, please. They grow pretty, I, I think if you're careful, you can actually see them growing because you see this is day, day five, day 18, the difference. And I'm putting a ruler here so people don't think I'm manipulating the, I'm not good at changing image, but yeah, really, you can see if you go, drive every day by, you can see the uh, grass growing. <clears throat> but the point is we wanna see to what extent and if fire were causing any change in the ecosystem carbon balance. And that's the next slide that I'm trying to move, please. So this is paper recently published. I think it was the first publication since Nicholas mentioned that he was the first. I have to claim that my own was, was the first too. I know it was really the first that to document this uh, net ecosystem carbon balance. Again, we're using the eddy covariance uh, technique to measure the balance between emissions and um, sequestration. And if you look at this last time, I'm, I'm not gonna have time to explain exactly what we're measuring here, but if you look at this, and you're gonna have to trust me, this is the difference between photosynthesis and emissions. If it's negative, that means it's a, this ecosystem is acting as a carbon sink. If it's positive, that means it's uh, emitting more carbon. And as you can see, and we measure this, we've been measuring this for, we continue to measure since 2016. By the way, if anybody's interested, this data is being streamed to a network that's publicly available, a Meriflux. There's two towers in ONA. You can download the data, do your own calculations, hopefully get to the same numbers that we got. But the point is native ecosystems are net. So not only people, uh, some of the speakers were talking about carbon neutral, we're carbon negative here. We're carbon sink. These native ecosystems are um, carbon sinks. Even the year that we imposed the fire, which is highlighted there, is 2019. Uh, so first time that we documented this, my timer is telling me that I have to move. Uh, finally, I'm gonna not even share the data. Next one, please. Uh, impact of grazing management. If you are scientists or if you're interested in doing literature research and you put the words grazing, uh, soil carbon sequestration, you're gonna get a ton of information. And if you're trying to filter through, you're gonna see positive, neutral, and uh, negative impact of grazing. So where we stand. The, I think the issue when we look at the literature is that grazing is loosely um, define. So I can manipulate a situation where grazing can cause a negative impact because maybe I'm overgrazing, I have too many animals. Or I can simulate a situation where carbon can be increased by grazing. So it's how we define grazing that dictates the direction extent, and extent of that response. I'm not going to share the next slide because we don't have time. Another paper published. So limitations. We don't currently have policies and financial benefits for producers to adopt uh, practices that incentivize carbon sequestration. Um, there's some companies that have been recently established in Florida and they're talking about $13 per metric ton of sequestered carbon. And I think those are not very highly um, economically uh, attractive to producers. So the direction magnitude of those practices and the extent that carbon, soil carbon responds will depends. So there's a lot of uh, modeling efforts that are being used in Florida to estimate. So if we use cover crop, well, we're gonna run this model that was developed in Colorado and we're gonna tell you how much extra carbon you are sequestering in your soil. And that's how we're gonna pay you. Uh, I think there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that approach. And we have to have research to validate those models and maybe adapt those models to our conditions. 
I mentioned the unintended consequences. I'm talking about carbon, but I said, well, not fertilization, for instance, can have some um, unintended consequences. So we, look at, we have to look at a more uh, comprehensive approach. Time and scale, carbon sequestration is a long-term process, extremely difficult to measure unless if you are lucky enough to have some of those towers. And if you are lucky enough to have those towers, you have to hire somebody that knows what they're doing because the tower will be collecting data, but you have to have a very strict QA, QC protocol to make sure that your data um, is meaningful. I think that's my last point. Uh, so the other limitation is in a climate, in a scenario where climate is going to change, our potential, our soil's potential to sequester carbon will also be impacted. We don't know the direction of that. We don't know if it's going to be in a positive direction or a negative direction. So that's why we need to research to help answer some of these questions. With that, I'll be finished. Thank you so much. Okay. It should be working. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, we're working on the clicker repair. Our final speaker is Dr. John Arthington. He's a professor and chair of our animal sciences department. Uh, he's been in that role since 2019. He also has administrative experience as a former center director of our Range Cattle Research and Education Center at ONA. So he has broad administrative experience mentoring faculty uh, throughout the state. His research and extension programs focus on management and nutrition of grazing and beef cattle. He's uh, written over 100 refereed publications and he's as an associate editor for the Journal of Animal Sciences, please join me in welcoming Dr. Arthington. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. And Dr. Adesogan, congratulations on this meeting and the Food Systems Institute Innovation Lab and your team. This has been, been a lot of fun. When Bola came to see me in my office and talk about uh, giving this talk, Maria said this doesn't work. It does, it does, it does. About giving this talk, I, I said, well, I, I don't know. What kind of people are going to be there? And he said, don't worry. You'll be, you'll be fine. You'll enjoy it. We have a good agenda put together and everything. And, and some of you can relate, and he knows if you've had friends growing up and maybe from children to adults that are scared of clowns, I'm terrified of vegetarians. So I wasn't quite sure, and I started off sort of in the back a little bit, and then uh, when we were uh, moving along, and Mario was uh, giving his talk over lunch, seven-foot-tall Dr. Hattisogan gets up and confronts him about his livestock data, and I thought, uh-oh, it's going down. <laughs> and I was looking around for a door somewhere, but everything worked out fine, and no problem. Now we're still all here, so years of therapy is working out fine. So... Bola asked me to talk about uh, the University of Florida and the commitment to international programs and how those programs impact the quality of scholarship that our faculty produce. And so I, I've always, and others have heard me say this, I define scholarship as intellectual thought that's validated by peers and communicated broadly. That's a simple approach. And for land-grant institutions, that takes in the three mission areas that we're committed to, research, teaching, and extension. And so whether we have domestic programs or international programs or an appropriate combination of both, we have to take those into consideration. And I'm so proud of the work that faculty in our entire university does, but more specifically what IFAS does to address uh, international agriculture. Uh, for both food and plant sciences. And so I'm going to show you a few um, topics here now and uh, discuss these with you. So it's not uh, difficult for us to talk about the moral obligation, right? And so I don't think many people argue about this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that particular topic. But I will tell you about advancing science, about how our programs recruit the very best minds, not just in the United States, but around the world, and how today and in the future, those relationships and collaborations produce even better science from uh, uh, the, the relationships that result from that. And then, of course, sometime down the road, uh, both today and tomorrow, that increases trade partners and increases overall business viability for for U.S. institutions. So I just want to talk, start by uh, kind of going through some of the programs. I'm a little bit more 
uh, familiar with. But uh, Dr. Jeff Dahl and Dr. Corwin Nelson, they shared some of their activities with the Rwanda project. And this, this has some combined aspects, both in, uh, in the moral obligation area, but also advancing science through the train the trainer idea. And what they've done in, that, in their trainings there is, is uh, taught producers how to do a better job with, uh, with milk hygiene and the milking process, and then getting that milk to collection points in a more efficient process to increase overall uh, productivity of these smallholder farms. Uh, there's a professor there named John Baptiste de Hatoya that uh, is now the principal investigator of some of this uh, work at the University of Rwanda and has advanced that further in this train the trainer aspect and was recently uh, recognized by the International Food and Agricultural Development Organization with an award for the work that they do. So it's just one example of how this train the trainer approach goes, but it also advances science. And so uh, these collaborators, uh, Dr. Dahl, Dr. Adesogan, Dr. Nelson, and the others, they work together in uh, the, the world's most uh, largest impact scientific journal for dairy sciences, the Journal of Dairy Science, for a special edition with multiple uh, peer-reviewed articles that were published in that journal. And it's not just dairy science. There's also uh, agronomic work that has been put into a special edition uh, in the Journal of Agronomy, or I'm sorry, Agronomy Journal, which is the top tier uh, uh, journal for that society and global food security. And so advancing science and doing it in a way that's, that follows the peer review process and makes that data available to everyone in the world is uh, an important outcome. And so the area I wanna talk about now is, uh, uh, is, is probably unique, not unique to Florida, but certainly I think we do it the best in Florida. I grew up in Indiana, and so I was trained as an undergraduate with uh, cool season grasses, uh, legumes like alfalfa, corn, temperate breed cows, and then I came to Florida where everything is totally different. But you look at our graduate students that are training in the departments in IFAS, and many of them grew up in places where they didn't study corn, they studied sugarcane. They have Bos Indicus temp uh, uh, tropical breeds of cattle, uh, warm season forages that are common, commonly grown in the Southeast and particularly in Florida. And so the, the advantages that these individuals have because they've lived and grown up in those areas is uh, uh, pretty difficult to describe to you. Uh, and it makes a big difference. And so there's a gentleman from Brazil, who's recently retired named uh, Jose Vasconcelos. And he did a um, postdoc, this professor did a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin with some friends of, of, of mine, a friend of mine and, and others in our department. And that one individual for, in the area of livestock systems, both beef and dairy, started a wave. And he would send his very best students to the United States, many of them to Florida, to have an internship opportunity in their senior year. Some of those best students stayed and went on to graduate school, many of them earning doctorate degrees. Today, many of those are professors in institutions throughout the United States with collaborations across not just this country, but many countries around the world. Uh, this is uh, an individual, many of the, some of them uh, uh, trained in my program and is an example of uh, how this collaboration is growing and the impact that it's having today. And so, as I mentioned before, a lot of them have these undergraduate experiences very different than a person growing up in the Midwest. And many of them have moved on to faculty roles and institutions uh, here in the US and they're making contributions now. So I wanna give you another example in the area of student achievement. And this is uh, Dr. Jason Scheffler, who was involved in the Livestock Systems Innovation Lab with an Ethiopian project where he took a graduate student over with them and they worked with them on HACCP systems and looking at methods to improve both the both hygiene, uh, product development, and then storage and distribution. And an interesting uh, result of this, Terry Langford was the MS student that worked with them. And I just wanted to share with you a, a comment that he made. And he said, you know, you can train graduate students 
in the world that we have here today, but giving them these opportunities to take what they know today and, 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 and train people in lesser developed areas makes them think outside the box. They can't just take the traditional ideas that they've learned in the lab and in the classroom here. They have to think about complicating factors that they might not have thought about before and then come up with creative solutions to apply. Now that it sounds interesting of how it could work there, but just think about how that works in their lives, whether they go into business enterprises or back into academia and science. Now, Jason was quite successful after this work and he obtained a, uh, a Gates Award grant and was able to take on other students to train in this area, all from that initial experience. And so the area of student achievement and advancing science makes a lot of sense. This, uh, if I haven't convinced you yet that this is important, I work with a lot of uh, beef cattle producers. And a lot of times those beef cattle producers wanna know, why are our taxpayer dollars being spent helping people abroad? And I'll work with them through some of these examples that I have there, but here's one that hits home a lot. And that's working with beef cattle production systems in, in my area that are very similar to what we have here today. You don't see a lot of Boss Indicus genetics uh, studied in other states around the nation, but you do here in Florida and you do in major institutions in tropical and subtropical regions around the world. If you look at those red cattle on your left, those are called Malawian reds. And uh, it's an amazing animal that's been adapted in a very harsh climate, adapted over generations. And I often say that uh, those cattle are just one Texas A&M animal breeder away from total disaster, right? Because they have taken on the ability to, to resist parasites, to resist heat pressure, to be able to have top maternal skills for pred predation. And, and there are genes and animal husbandry systems that make this different. And we, and, and we work today on discovering those adapt adaptability traits and how we can include those in, uh, in modern production systems here in the United States. And the other picture, those Nolori cattle from Brazil, working with our partners from Brazil, we've recognized that Boss Indicus cattle, that their ester cycle is quite different. And they respond differently to ester synchronization protocols that we use today in modern reproductive biology systems. And so some of that science is applied today. Producers in Florida utilize it to improve the reproductive capability of their cow herds. So I'm just gonna conclude with a couple of pictures. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, Animal Sciences Graduate Student Association and probably three or four countries, including the United States are, uh, are present here. I can't imagine the experience that these young people have studying with each other and then graduating and having those collaborative relationships for years to come. This is uh, an example of uh, Dr. Antonio Fasciola's lab. Probably this one picture, Jose, you'll have to tell me if I'm true, represents five different countries training together in his laboratory in the Department of Animal Sciences. Very impressive. So again, I, I took this uh, last quote from uh, Dr. Adesogan, and I just want to mention once again that uh, the Feed the Future uh, Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems is really the house. It's the engine that made a lot of this possible in uh, the animal sciences department. But in terms of trade, uh, Senator Marco Rubio from here in Florida made the comment that 11 of our top 15 trading partners were once the recipient of aid. And so this isn't something that's way down the road. This is things that are happening today. Results that we're investing in today that are making a difference for not only producers in Florida, but producers around the world. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and thanks again for having me. All right, let's open the floor for questions, please. I'll start out while you're thinking, and I'll start with you, John. Uh, we have a lot of graduate students, assistant professors here. How do you start an international program? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I'm gonna have to uh, 
I'm going to have to use my own personal example, and then, and then, because uh, that's what I'm thinking about the most right now, how others are impacted. But it was somebody that gave me the opportunity to travel abroad and to meet others. And uh, when I made those first relationships, we kept that friendship going and we started collaborations where they were possible. Today, I think the opportunities are even more broad, particularly at the University of Florida, where we have the Food uh, Systems Institute, we have the Livestock Innovation Lab, where they're consistently putting out calls for people with specific areas of expertise to work with them on, on projects. So just show up and get involved and, and if, if it's something that you're interested in. Uh, yes, I want to know that if we have different cropping systems like cereal cereal cropping system, then cereal legume cropping system, which one be having a better positive impact on soil long-term, soil carbon sequestration and soil organic carbon content? I can answer that. Uh, I haven't been specifically evaluating um, cropping systems. I'm more focusing on, uh, more, my research program is more focused on uh, grazing land, but that, I think that's well established in the literature. Going back to that slide that I showed, the, either you increase the inputs or you decrease the losses. Uh, cropping systems tend to have lower inputs, and also depending on the tillage management, the outputs are also greater. So I think there's a well established in the literature that converting cropping systems to into grazing land systems have often resulted in increases in carbon sequestration. But even within the grazing lands, there's uh, opportunities to increase even further, depending on the management that you use, the grazing management, the fertility management, um, species selection. So there's still room for improving after that point. But also soils have a, a finite ability to sequester carbon. So we're talking about these things that we think it do continuously uh, to increase without a limit, but there's also some limitations. The, the soil reaches a point where it becomes saturated. I'll ask a question for you, Dr. DiLorenzo. Um, you showed uh, a number of different management practices and reductions of methane. Which of those are most broadly applicable uh, within Florida and beyond Florida, do you think? Great question. Uh, and the applicability, it's, it's one thing we often uh, forget. The, the, I actually started with the uh, urea one because the replacement for urea is something that we do a lot here. And we have ways to deliver that, whether it's in the mineral and the, as a supplement. But that's that's the one point that we often tend to forget. How we we develop really good technology sometimes, but the applicability, especially when we look at Florida, we it's it, it mostly extensive system. There's a lot of opportunities on the feedlot side, but we don't have a strong feedlot industry here. So a lot of the strategies that I try to research at some point, we always with my group would discuss. How is the applicability of this? And fortunately enough, we have a, a really good group. Now John is, is taking the, the lead on that, but we have a, a scientists that have developed uh, the whole idea of supplementing minerals in Florida. So the mineral supplementation is one thing that most uh, cow calf systems in Florida do not forget. So a lot of the things that I developed, I looked at the possibility to include them into those mineral, uh, trace mineral salts and tried to deliver that because we're not gonna have like in other production systems, a grain car or a feeder wagon delivering that product daily to cattle for most in most operations. So. Thank you. Well, I had a sign, someone told me you had two minutes, and I had a sign we had three minutes. So maybe the longer we talk, the more time we'll have. <laughs> no, no, okay. Well, in the interest of time, then why don't we uh, thank all of our speakers again. Thank you so much. Thank you again. And uh, now we're going to move on to probably the most interesting session. That's what I'll call it. Uh, and I want to welcome to the stage the Dean of uh, the IFAS Extension and Director of the Florida Cooperative Extension Service, Andrew Johnson, to introduce our panelists. And after this, there will be a short break. Good afternoon. Our time has certainly been well spent today. We've had a, a wealth of information that has been shared. So it is certainly my uh, privilege to be here and I'm excited for the next uh, discussion that we will have. 
Um, and I would like for you to, uh, to welcome our, our two panelists, uh, Dr. Robert Bertram and Dr. Samuel uh, T. I'm going to say T since I've been struggling with that name all day. Uh, just a brief little uh, background on both of them. Uh, Dr. Rob is a chief scientist in USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, where he serves as a key advisor on a range of technical and program issues to advance global food security and nutrition. In this role, he leads USAID evidence-based efforts to advance research technology and implementation in support of the US government's global hunger and food security initiative, Feed the Future. Welcome. Our next panelist is, again, Dr. Sam T. He leads the, uh, the Deputy Director of the Livestock Team for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he leads the program's livestock portfolio, overseeing implementation of the foundation's strategy for animal health, animal production, and animal systems. Before joining the foundation in 2012, Sam spent most of his career within the pharmaceutical industry working in clinical development, regulatory affairs, business development, and external research alliances. I wanna start our, our conversation uh, first by uh, pointing out or, or asking a question of Dr. Uh, Robert. Rob, what are some ways USAID is working to advance food security globally while at the same time reducing the carbon footprint? Can you hear me if I, oh, thank you. Thank you, Andra. <laughs> uh, so it's a really interesting question because the, most of the farmers in the places where we work, where extreme poverty, child stunting, other kinds of malnutrition are endemic, um, these areas are areas that already tend to have very low emissions, right? So they don't have mechanization for the most part. Many of them don't use fertilizer. Uh, uh, there, there's many aspects of the food system that are uh, relatively energy non-intensive as opposed to what we might find in more developed regions. Having said that, if we look at the emissions intensity, and that's come up a couple times today, in terms of what the carbon footprint or greenhouse gas footprint is for the unit of primary production, it's very high. So here's, here's the way I'd like to, to propose we think about it in, in the poorer countries. Uh, you, you can pick, there are many, many examples, but I, I think we can think about helping farm families increase their productivity in ways that increase their income, improve their nutrition and their environmental sustainability. A lot of the last session, you know, we heard about soils and such, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, but to do that in a way that bends the curve. In other words, so it's not about re reducing their emissions, it's about reducing the emissions intensity. And when we do that, we can also make them a little less poor, maybe even get them out of poverty altogether. We can uh, you know, help them uh, 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 get the services they need, school fees, healthcare, uh, but also a quality diet some of which may come from their own production, but much of which is gonna be purchased. And, and um, so in doing that too, the other thing we can do is make that more productive, higher productivity system, uh, provide more affordable food to their neighbors, 
many of whom are also very low income or the village down the road. Uh, so, so we see this as a, um, it's, it's completely consistent with the idea of, of, of mitigation because it's putting them on a different path, but it is not putting the burden of what's happened in the rest of the world on their shoulders. Sometimes I think you've heard the term climate justice. I think that's what this refers to, the idea that we in the North who you know, have huge footprints in a relative sense uh, should not be looking to, uh, and it's not just the North, but wealthier countries should not be looking to these poorest countries to sacrifice uh, 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 in terms of uh, emissions, but, but they can do it in ways where they don't repeat a lot of the mistakes that we've learned elsewhere. So uh, maybe I'll stop there, Andra. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sam, can you speak to just a little bit of the mission uh, behind the Bill and Melinda Gates and the strategy in regards to animal health, animal production, uh, and, and the animal system? Sure. Um, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure, and thank you for the invite to be here today. Um, so Gates Foundation, as most of you know, was founded on the principle or belief that all lives have equal value, and therefore every person, wherever they live, should have uh, the chance to have a healthy and productive life. That's how, that's the belief on which it was founded. Um, and then in the first five to six years, you know, it was primarily a global health organization focusing on disease, to prevent diseases that were killing children. And they started with rotavirus, um, you know, enteric diarrhea, uh, where, you know, Bill and Melinda read somewhere that half a million children were dying um, of diseases that they hadn't even heard about. You know, they, were having, they have just had three little kids and which were totally preventable. Nobody even knows about it in the United States, whereas half a million children were dying. And so that's what triggered them. Six years later, when they looked at it, what are the sort of root causes of this health inequality? Uh, and, and they had a list and top couple of the top two were poverty, malnutrition. And when they looked at poverty and malnutrition, which sector can solve that? And agriculture came on top. Um, so that's when we got into agriculture. And if you know, you know, most of you know that, you know, every country in the world, if you look at the history, except for, you know, few countries like Singapore, every country has developed economic growth has come from agriculture. So hence in 2006, we entered. And then when we looked at, um, you know, what did the farmer, you know, mixed crop livestock farmers do or pastoralists do? Um, we came up with about 60% of the poor people, you know, categorized by the World Bank, dependent on livestock for their um, living. So hence we looked at it and there's a saying, chickens are like your ATM, goats are like your checking account, um, cows are like your savings account. You know, that's how people live and they accumulate wealth. Um, in the animal. So it was very important part, which was missed in our original strategy. Hence in 2011, that there's a um, intentional uh, effort that was made in, in a decision that was made to uh, work on livestock. Um, and you know, again, when we looked at agriculture development, you know, ODA that is going into agriculture, despite the fact that livestock in the developing nations we're giving, you know, contributing to about 37 to 38% of ag GDP. The donor money was less than 5%. So there was a discrepancy in, um, who, you know, what was being funded. Uh, you know, it, there was no, there was a disconnect between the contribution and the support. So Gates Foundation decided that we will lead by example based on the evidence and at least commit 20% of our agriculture spending into that. And I'm happy to say we are about 22%. I'll stop there. <laughs> well, adding to that, uh, uh, Sam, so, so we, we, we've heard about transitioning uh, from agriculture being part of the problem to part of the solution to climate change. So, so what does this mean for farmers' income and what does this mean for nutritional diets for consumers? That's for me or Rob? Rob, do you want to have a go? Sure, I'll give it a try. Well, I think 
one of the really um, one of the main threads that has come through today is a lot of what we're talking about is being smarter and using resources more efficiently, whether it's energy, biomass, better genetics. Uh, this, all of this has been, a, 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 I think, a theme where we're, we're not necessarily sacrificing productivity, we're increasing productivity, but getting more from less. And frankly, that's what the world needs to do. Uh, uh, we need to uh, figure out how to manage the more resilient land resources in ways that help protect the fragile hillsides, the forests, the wetlands. So I think, Andra, part of the answer is that by being more efficient, we can be climate smart and we can, we can actually uh, reduce emissions intensity, even sometimes in, in some of the higher uh, uh, input systems that we talked about today. So, so, so the potential is there. And when we do that, it's, it's an economic uh, win for farmers and ultimately for consumers because it, we, we're all getting uh, more from less and we're doing uh, less in terms of that externality, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions that you know, is, is one of our, our, our main theme today. So, so I like to think that, that there's a real um, alignment between our, our climate objectives and our environment objectives that isn't necessarily a, a bad thing for our economic objectives either, because we're, 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 we're using knowledge and new insights and better inputs in ways that uh, uh, make the whole system uh, more efficient more profitable, but also more climate friendly. Okay, um, I'll sort of share opposite, you know, the, the way we think, and I'm a veterinarian, so I'm biased um, in what I'm going to say. You know, like humans in the old days, um, we, you know, people had lots of kids because there was no guarantee that they will survive beyond, uh, you know, they will grow up because, there was no assurance of the health systems were not there. So they manage the risk by numbers. And at the moment in animals, that is what's happening in the developing countries when they do not have any certainty of how many animals are going to survive and how, you know, these are my livelihood. This is what is going to give me a living. When I don't have the assurance that these are going to live, they are managing the risk by, through numbers and putting up with very low productivity and just managing it as long as they live, then I can monetize that. So first of all, you know, we think if you can give that insurance that, okay, you can prevent diseases, you can reduce the um, killer diseases, you know, diseases that um, causes mortality, um, then, then that gives them the incentive to maximize the returns from their assets, livestock assets. So, so first step, you know, you need to, sort of stop the leakage of value or asset based. So this is why we work in animal health. And then once you have got a certain assurance that, okay, now I have a certain level of insurance that these animals are going to live and therefore I can invest in feed and improve their genetics to increase the productivity. So the farmer wins and you know the, the, he or she is also contributing to improving the emission intensity by increasing unit productivity. Um, so that's why we work in animal health, then animal production, uh, which includes feed and uh, feed and uh, genetics. And in the feed, you know, in terms of climate, one of the things, you know, as we have heard today, when you look at ca you know, cattle methane excretion, it's about 90% comes from uh, related to feed. One is, you know, half of, roughly half of it is feed production the other half is enteric fermentation. So one of the, the, the two areas that we have just started working in is how can we sort of convert uh, technologies that can be used to convert crop residues that is going to be wasted anyway, or burnt and you know, cause even more problem into valuable feed or alternative feed, like you know, we've heard about black soldier flies and you know, protein alternatives. So that is, you know, all, so that we don't have to inc include the land usage, the food versus feed um, competition issues in the formula. 
Secondly, how do we reduce enteric fermentation? And the professor talked about um, earlier on the various technologies that are coming and the key being, you know, at the moment, for example, 3NOP has been just uh, um, registered in US, Europe. You know, at the moment, the claim is that it will reduce 30% methane excretion. There is no average daily gain benefit. Now, in the, in the developed world, people can pay for it and get green credits and monetize that. In the developing country, when they are trying to survive, there is no such thing. Um, so unless you get a, a return on investment in terms of faster growth or you know, improvement in average daily gain, it's not going to happen. So that is what, is what we are trying to chase. You know, the economic benefit, not only just methane reduction, um, because of the, you know, as Rob has said, it's unfair for us to expect the poor farmer to pay the tax for the mistakes that we have made. Um, and then we also work in what we call the systems and advocacy. You know, again, the global south, the voice of the global south is not in the conversations. The global north, based on the data, you know, extrapolating the data in the United States or Europe or um, Australia and New Zealand, they, you know, we are sort of ex extrapolating the say, using this data to calculate or estimate the burden from the developing countries. It's so not true, you know, 60% of the land is apparently in the United States used for feed production. 30% we heard today from Saskia in Europe is used for feed production. That is nowhere close to in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the thing, you know, really shining the light on, you know, we are all scientists, you know, let's not just, you know, sort of um, take a blanket view about, black and white view about um, these numbers. You know, let's bring some precision and, and relevance to the continents or geographies that we are speaking about. So that's an area that we try to in, get involved in. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Um, keeping in line with that, what, what are some concepts we need to keep in mind uh, when we try to reconcile global food and nutrition security with the challenge of climate change. Thank you, Andra. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, one is that we shouldn't see adaptation and mitigation. These are the two big things that the global climate community grapples with. We shouldn't see those in opposition. And unfortunately, a lot of the energy in the world is on the mitigation side. How do we reduce emissions? And you can understand that if you look at the models. They're, it's scary. <laughs> but on the other hand, we can't ignore the fact that many people are having, and this includes ranchers and farmers in our own country here in the US, but everywhere are adapting to, to changing conditions. And, and in the developing world, uh, if those many of those changes are also occurring in, in affecting people who don't have a lot of adaptive ability. But the, 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 the beauty of why these things are not separate is that almost everything we do for adaptation involves carbon. We heard about soil carbon today, we heard about biomass, we heard about uh, uh, a whole range of, uh, of, of uh, efficiency, you know, water use efficiency gains. But uh, so, so I like to think that almost everything we're doing, with the possible exception of genetics, is, is, is also mitigation when we're doing adaptation. But even with the genetics, we can shift the balance on some of those, the, the feed utilization and so forth. So, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I think, um, it, well, I, I just wanted to build on what Sam just said, because it's such an important insight. It's a question of reducing risk and raising productive potential at the same time. And what does that do? It drives investment, not just on farm, all along the value chains by the private sector, looking to say market products and such, anything that spur, spurs investment is, 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 and these are the, many of the systems we work in are so undercapitalized. So we need to think about how to get investment in there. And finally, Andra, I would say, you know, we have global challenges like climate change, but we have local contexts and they vary and local solutions. So just keeping that in mind that it's not one size fits all, you know, 
people in Malawi, many of them would dream at Mario's Lancet plat, plate, you know, with the, that much meat and dairy, because some of these people eat meat once a year uh, at Christmas or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's just making sure that we, we don't uh, let our perspectives and our uh, uh, ideas necessarily get transplanted onto people whose situations are very different. So I hope, I hope that's uh, helpful. Thank you, Andra. Sam, did you want to follow up? No, no. I'll... No. All right. So I, we want to give just a few minutes for you guys to, to wrap up if there's any other things you would like to share. And then I think we'll have time for just a, a question or two. Well, I'll say something else that came out today. You know, getting more soil carbon requires having more nutrients in the system. Okay, so the, the humus has a much higher ratio of nitrogen to carbon. So let's, I get, fertilizer is the perfect example. And, and look, I'm all for agroecological uh, principles, but sometimes we hear about capital A agroecology, which means no external inputs. Well, this, is, this just isn't practical for a lot of the world. You're, a, a, a farmer, when she's getting 800 kilograms of maize per hectare in a monomodal rainfall season in Africa, if she doesn't have some sort of inputs, and it's not inputs alone, it's also growing some nitrogenous, nitrogen uh, fixing trees. It's, it's diversification, it's many things, but let's not take anything off the table. And that goes with, for science as well whether it's uh, a new uh, therapeutics for animals uh, that reduce risk and incentivize investment, or maybe a gene edited crops that allows uh, greater efficiency in terms of uh, uh, some, some key process that underpins uh, overall uh, system productivity. So that open mind, uh, you know, let's, a lot of the world needs mechanization and irrigation in order to reduce their bend their curve on greenhouse gas emissions. So again, it's all, you know, where you sit, we need to try to put our, our, uh, ourselves in other people's positions. Thank you. Um, if I have to say something uh, to, just to conclude, you know, it's had been, it, has, it has been a real privilege to be part of um, effort, you know, Food Systems Institute here and, and the richness and the, and the expertise and the breadth that you have. Um, yesterday we were talking about the tea, the depth and the breadth of, of uh, expertise that you have in this university. Um, and and I also see that, you know, there's a desire to sort of not just um, serve, serve uh, Florida or the United States, but the globe and particularly the developing world. And I, I would really encourage you to um, build relationships, you know, I know as an as a institution, research institution, educational institution, um, your success is defined by, um, you know, how much money you generate and, you know, how much you publish and all that. Uh, but I think, you know, there is a real opportunity for UF as a whole um, to sort of take a slightly longer view. You know, I, I know that is, that is not a long term without a short term, but at the same time, you know, take a longer view and build relationship with developing country universities. You know, as, as an institution, um, donor institution, we are coming under tremendous pressure for, you know, not really directly helping, um, you know, universities and capacities, research institutes in the developed, you know, developing world, LMICs. And it's, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. We, we really struggle, you know, there's not enough capacity, scientific rigor or expertise for us to go and really do what, what is possible these days. Uh, but if you can really build those networks and real solid partnership, and uh, you know, people like USAID ourselves and you know, fellow um, funders are looking for those opportunities where we can really directly build, but know the expertise is being provided by universities like UF. So I'll with that thought, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Sam or Rob?
one here sure. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting presentations and for putting things in context. I think we always think of where we are and how we see things, but it's really important to see how other people live and what a climate smart agriculture might mean to them. And, and Rob, I thought your point was very good about the developing countries have produced few greenhouse gases yet are bearing a large part of the burden, yet they need to increase their agricultural production. Now, um, one way is how you get there, and we don't have to follow the same trajectories. And I think that's our chance as a global community to figure how to leapfrog, like Africa really did the cell, the cell phone revolution, um, money through banks or through cell phones, they did that. And so I think as a group, how do we have a different trajectory that is already a climate smart agriculture? And I think that's a challenge of universities um, getting together as well as companies. How do you form that? And so I'd like to ask the question about digital agriculture. You hear that all the time. You say Africa's not ready for it, but then maybe that's where you leapfrog. So I, I say that just to be provocative and to get some examples, because I know USAID and the Gates Foundation have big programs in digital agriculture. Thanks. Thanks, Cheryl, for that question. Um, absolutely. Uh, we're very excited about the applications of digital. You know, when we talk about sustainable intensification, I think that got mentioned a couple of times today. That's as much about knowledge as anything else. Right, and these kinds of, of, of value chains and market systems involving animal source foods, involving fruits and vegetables, they're all way more knowledge intensive than some of the just the traditional grain crops that people are used to going or, or they're new for people and there's a lot of opportunity. So absolutely, I think it's a, there's a consensus in the community that, that digital, whether it's about uh, market prices whether it's about weather forecasts, whether it's about pests and diseases, uh, any kind of other uh, uh, um, in, knowledge input that helps a farmer make better decisions is exciting for us. Uh, maybe I'll, is that uh, an adequate? Sam, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I can just um, share a couple of examples and, and I completely agree that you know, digital has the promise and potential to really transform. India is way ahead, um, in our opinion, compared to Africa because of the digital infrastructure. Um, but that's not an excuse not to do that. So um, I won't go bore you to death. You know, there's an organization called Stellabs uh, in Bangalore that we work with, where they have digitized the whole uh, dairy uh, dairy sector. You know, for example, they are trying to formalize. You know, seventy three percent of dairy, you know, being a number one dairy producer in the world, 73% is still informal um, supply chains. Um, so what they have done is used IoT platforms to really digitize the whole process, um, measuring quality payments, including loans, because, um, you know, by doing, you know, using IoT and having dynamic data collection, they are able to inform the banks, the, you know, how much milk they are pouring every day which is their kind of cash flow and what kind of animals they have, which is their asset base. And they've worked out algorithms for credit worthiness of farmers. And so the whole financial systems are changing. In Africa, there are sort of early stages of scale, you know, sort of verticals beginning to happen, not rather than a comprehensive thing. And we are trying to now with G, uh, GIZ in Germany, we are trying to, um, we have got a program called Size, uh, which is essentially looking for digital entrepreneurs. Um, and what we are doing is, you know, paying them some money to train them to become investable by traditional venture funds. Um, hopefully, in the next few years, we will see some transformational entrepreneurs coming and changing that paradigm. Cheryl, I just wanted to quickly add, you talked about not repeating mistakes. Some parts of Asia use 400 kilograms of nitrogen per year. African, African farmers use less than 5% of that. 
So we don't have to, we, we can avoid those mistakes and we, so we can be smarter. And the tools that we've been talking about can help all of us and especially farmers and, and actors along the market systems be smarter. I know they're waiting to get rid of us. So. And can I just say also, thank you the way Sam did it. We, we're so grateful for the partnership we have with the University of Florida and, and the Livestock Systems Innovation Lab and um, the capacity, the partnership, solving issues together and building capacity. It's really unique and it's really appreciated. And uh, so thank you for all you're doing to advance the cause. We want to thank our panelists again and, and, and thank you for uh, paying attention. <laughs>
But we're going to get right to it. I have two great friends with me today. Um, to my immediate right is Jose Rossignoli, who is Vice President for Global Sourcing at Roberts, Robbins and Fresh. He's a two-time Gator with degrees in animal sciences and food and resource economics. And next to him is Libby Putnam, who's a sophomore studying agricultural ag 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 I can't talk. It's too late in the afternoon. Agricultural education and communication and family youth and community sciences. So my first question's for Libby. Libby, what have you heard today that excites you about your future as related to food systems? I would just start off by saying that everything today has excited me in some way, shape or form. I think like you said, everything that we've heard today has related to at least one, if not multiple, if not all of the 23 majors that we have at the college here on campus. Um, I think it's inspiring to hear from all the different ways that we can get involved in the food system. Um, I think that as a student, I feel uniquely positioned um, that there are so many opportunities within the, within the food system. And as uh, Dr. Her Herrero said um, throughout his presentation, or as we saw just how broad the food system is, and um, as Sam mentioned, there is so much breadth and depth when it comes to the opportunities that exist for students here. Um, even when it came to the animal sciences panel, um, that's not my department. However, when I put on my ag communications hat, I started to see how big that gap that exists between consumers and producers, how big that gap truly is, and um, just how professors and faculty here on our campus are working to eliminate those gaps every day and create, um, create opportunities to be able to communicate with directly with populations. Even um, Dr. Sanchez said that, um, how do we fill those gaps when it comes to extension? And so um, finding ways to connect with um, students and faculty and community members, I think that's what excites me most is how, how many ways there are to get involved, no matter what role you choose to take on. Great, thank you. Jose, my, my first question for you is, what have you heard today that speaks to the types of skills that students will need to bring into their careers? Yeah, um, thank you for having me, first of all. I, I would say that um, it's, it's not only what I've heard today, it's also I think I, I come influenced by, my, uh, by the line of work in which I am in, which is supply chain and, um, and fresh produce specifically. Um, but you know, there is a significant amount of food waste driven by supply chain disruptions. And, and that's one topic that I think we were not able to, to touch on. And I would like to expand a little bit on that. And if there is one thing that we have realized in the last 18 to 24 months is how fragile those, those global supply chains are. Um, and they are not just related to COVID and they're not just related to their current war. Um, I can go through various examples. I, I remember in 2017, um, we were importing 25 containers of pineapples from Costa Rica and the one bridge that goes to the port basically Felt. And um, we had to uh, find different ways of bringing that product. Um, 2018, there was the LA uh, labor strike in the port of Los Angeles. And I remember having 35 containers of mangoes that were coming from Ecuador that were just becoming puree um, um, on the coast. Um, and last week, for, for a matter of fact, we had about um, 400 containers, not us, but in general as an industry that were going from, um, uh, from Western Europe into, into Ukraine and Russia, they could not cross. So all that product got dumped in the, in the Polish market. And that market was completely overfloated. And a lot of the product that was being harvested and, and intended to be sold into that market now is being wasted. So the amount of, um, of food waste that, is, that, it's, um, that happens because of these disruptions is, is, is huge. Um, so to answer your question from a, from a human talent perspective, I think it's a, there's a huge need for people that can react rapidly, rapidly and creatively to, um, to these unexpected needs. And it doesn't matter where you are. If you are into, uh, in, if you're in the in the in this in the seed or or packaging or uh, nursery um, or fresh produce or livestock, I think there is a, a, a very important need to have an, a, at least at a very minimum understanding of what are the supply chain touch points of what you do, so that you can start thinking about secondary supply chains and and um, and emergency plans. Great. Well, taking that a little bit further, Libby, um, what opportunity have you had 
in your classwork or other experiences to um, grapple with uh, maybe uncertainty, um, uh, need for resilient um, kinds of approaches or flexible approaches? What opportunities have you had so far? So I would say that one of my favorite programs that I've had the chance to get involved in on campus is the Global 2050 Challenge Program. And so it made me smile seeing all um, the presenters who were talking about the sustainable development goals up here on stage. Um, that, course, that coursework is uniquely um, positioning us to both understand the breadth of the challenges that our globe is facing um, and then getting that hands-on experience to maybe pick a passion area and then target it that towards gaining that experience. So for example, um, throughout the first course, um, we even got to hear from um, Dr. Bola who spoke to um, livestock systems, but we heard on a range of topics from everything that was going on locally within Gainesville, um, on the state level, the national level and globally. Um, and not only did that give me um, an adequate tools and more than adequate tools toolkit to be able to really understand um, what my role was when it came to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but then in the second course, I was able to actually work hands on with with Feeding Florida um, to help develop a strategy plan for their 12 member food banks. And that's not something that I think I ever imagined having the possibility to do as a freshman in college. And um, we focused on building that tool set that helped um, understand what, how do you truly make changes, um, whether that's behavioral changes as some people spoke on earlier today, it's organizational changes, or just how do you get populations to invest themselves in the solutions that you're trying to bring in? How do you get that buy-in? Um, and so those are some of my favorite experiences that I've had that touch on sort of change management as well. I say you work for a global company. Um, we've heard a lot about global food systems. So what are your best suggestions for students getting those global competencies um, both in and outside the classroom? Yeah, I, um, I had a lot of um, exposure during my undergrad and graduate program that I really feel benefited me into going into the uh, public sector and the professional area. I, um, um, I remember when I was doing my uh, graduate program, there were two, um, uh, two projects I got involved with. One was Project HEAL, it's a, it's a health-based, um, project that took me to the Andes with a group of veterinarians to um, uh, to vaccinate cattle and grade the communities with um, help as a liaison with some communities, um, dentists and, and MDs. Um, through the USAID farmer to farmer program, I ended up in, in a farm in Nigeria for four weeks, um, one summer. And um, there are many, many uh, organizations like Chemonix International, Lano Lakes, Libby and I were talking about Lano Lakes has a foundation that, that has these type of, type of programs. I would say just getting as much exposure as, possi uh, as possible with those available resources. Um, that's how I think it starts. Um, the, you know, and, and, and when I ask myself why and how it's helped me, um, I go back to the consumer, and specifically as it pertains to developed countries, um, consumers are very obsessed with, um, with uh, um, I would say, with consistency and year-round availability. And it's specifically in the, in the fresh produce space, you need to combine production and supply from various countries in order to be able to supply that uh, convenience factor. Um, and the more internationally exposed you are, the better suited to, to put those pieces of the puzzle together. So that gets to another point that I think we heard a lot today. We, we heard a lot of science, certainly, but we also heard a lot about the human dimensions uh, related to the food systems. Um, some talked about consumer-centric companies, talked about the need for understanding behavior change theory, uh, talked about the need for local solutions. Uh, Libby, you're in human dimensions type majors. How will you connect with scientists around some of these issues? I think it's really under, important to understand um, how to gain that community buy-in, and that comes with understanding the challenges that families and communities are facing um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a lot of what we focus on in my um, Family, Youth, and Community Sciences coursework is understanding both the challenges that communities are facing, but then what's sort of going on within the individual level, the household level and the community level um, that allow you to really understand um, what is the best approach for moving forward. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, another thing we heard about several times and was was one of the last questions of the last session was digitiz digitization. I can't even <laughs> say that, boy, it's the end of the day. 
Anyway, digital economy there, how's that? The University of Florida has embarked on an artificial intelligence initiative um, that many of us are aware of. For either of you, how will artificial intelligence um, change the face of not only agriculture, but our education systems around agriculture? What do we need to be doing? What do our students need to be doing? What do our faculty need to be doing to prepare our students to really work in that digital reality? Uh, far from my area of expertise, but um, uh, when I think about um, uh, category insights, consumer behavior, um, demand planning, a lot of that work is being done um, already. I just don't think that it's not automated enough. It's not dynamic enough. And I think that um, artificial in intelligence would really accelerate that, um, the, you know, the effectiveness of, of those tools um, to get there. Libby, any plans to take a course in artificial intelligence? Not yet, but I do know that we are offering a certificate for anybody in any sort of undergraduate major. Um, when it comes to like just digital technology and how, um, I guess digitiz digi the digital economy <laughs> is affecting the food system. I know that um, last semester I had um, hands-on experience with seeing sort of how they're approaching um, using these tools in order to assess hunger. So for example, Feeding Florida um, is finding a way to quantify hunger down to like a the neighborhood block, which is incredible when it comes to how you're trying to approach um, making sure that food gets into the hands of the people who need it most. So that was something that I found inspiring, but I know that there's so much going on um, on campus um, in multiple different fields when it comes to plant breeding and um, horticultural technologies, animal science technologies as well. So yeah, there'll be a lot of opportunities. And I think the the challenge is that we need people adept in all phases. Uh, we need people who can develop the applications uh, we need, obviously, users of the applications, but I, I think our sweet spot at the University of Florida is in the middle, is developing people who understand their discipline and can talk to the developers and, and develop the applications that are needed for, for their particular industry or their particular future. So I think that's where our sweet spot is for our faculty to incorporate you know, what are, what are the, the needs in, in AI in particular disciplines and then help students be able to, to do that crosstalk similar to the way we learned to talk to programmers in the 80s, right? We all had to be able to talk to a programmer way back then. <laughs> Uh, so a couple more things as, as we um, wrap this up. One of the things at the end, um, we heard a lot about sustainable intensification of, of agricultural systems, but then there at the end, that idea of knowledge intensification, what does that mean to you, knowledge intensification? I would say that knowledge intensification would mean just finding opportunities to gain exposure to anything and everything. And so I was telling people, all, I've been telling people all day today, like just sitting here and hearing all of these presentations, um, getting that exposure to areas and departments that I might not have otherwise been exposed to um, makes me want to add another minor or makes me want to take a class with the professors who were speaking because it makes me that excited um, to gain that extra additional level of depth um, in an area that I probably wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to. And um, I think that as a land grant university, um, students, it's a, it's really a privilege to attend a university in which you can see um, different areas of special, special specialization um, and expertise on just a variety of levels. You can go back to your um, home area, whether it's in Florida or another state, and you're able to see an extension office and then maybe you've had exposure to 4-H, but then you're here on campus and you're learning from your learning from faculty who are doing research outside of the classroom as well. And so it's all very exciting to know that um, you're maybe hearing about the same topics, but it can range so drastically. Do you have any comments about that? No, I'm just excited about the um, uh, uh, synchronizing and calibrating a lot of the definitions. I can tell mm -hmm. you that when it comes down to sustainability, um, if I ask 10 of my top uh, 100 customers what it means for them, everybody will give me a different answer. And so you're trying to solve for a problem that means different things for different people and it's very difficult to scale it up. Um, so bringing, bringing um, university, university knowledge together to, to standardize those definitions and, um, and then push them forward to the industry through extension, um, it, it actually helps a lot um, to be able to execute. 
Well, um, to me, I think what it speaks to is our commitment to lifelong learning. And again, another hallmark of the land grant university that, that we are lifelong learners and, and we realize that our education doesn't stop when we, when we finish that first or second or third degree or minor or whatever it might be. So final thoughts, um, Jose, I'll ask you first, what's a takeaway and important piece of advice for students? Um, I would say following the theme of food systems, just to be very open-minded. Um, I went through uh, my personal experience. I started in, in animal science and I am international supply chains nowadays, right? So food, food system is so broad that um, I think one has to be very open-minded and embrace the complexity and how the breadth of, of specialties that there is within these, um, these amazing system, um, ecosystem, if you will, um, because you never know where you're going to end up. So trying to absorb the knowledge um, in every single event and in every single opportunity, even though you don't think that it is what you are majoring in right now, I, I think that it's, it's going to be key because you, you don't know where you're going to end up. Libby, what would, you, what would you give as a piece of advice for those entering freshmen, like maybe your sister starting this fall? <laughs> Um, my biggest piece of advice was it would be to never be afraid to reach out. Um, and that um, pertains to both people here at the university, but also industry professionals as well. Um, I don't think I've ever been turned down from someone that I reached out to over LinkedIn or email, um, because I think something that I have found um, to make me so happy about being involved in the food and ag industry is that um, it's just so the passion for helping others and investing in students um, is so evident, whether I've been seeking an opportunity on campus or I've been seeking an internship or something like that. Um, but if you don't take that opportunity to at least try and ask and reach out and network with other organizations or other um, individuals, then you're never going to know what it would be a what if. Um, and so my biggest piece of advice is to just take the chance, um, reach out and um, enjoy everything that this roller coaster has to offer because I don't think I have all the experiences that I've had up until this point in my college career. I don't think I would have expected half of them to happen, um, including being on the stage right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well said. Well, we started the day hearing about some of the things that President Wright said so many years ago about being in uncertain times, uh, having circumstances beyond our control, but putting forth the greatest possible effort. And I would say in the food systems area for the most rewarding careers. Uh, I think my advice to, to the students in the room and the educators of future students, these leaders, these future leaders, they will be the ones setting the new norms and values. And that's one of the things that we heard strongly today. We need to uh, have some shifts in those norms and values to make a significant difference around the world world. And the last thing I'll leave you with is the idea of innovative collaboration as really the strength of what we do here in UF IFAS and in the college, and that that's really the key to changing the world. Let's thank our panelists. All right, thank you for that uh, final panel because we're ready to wrap things up. This is the wrap up session. Um, so we have two astute scholars on stage to help us synthesize and make sense of all the information we've heard today, right? You're gonna, you're gonna fix all of our problems right now. Right, Cheryl? Yeah. So um, would you mind introducing yourselves? So I'm Cheryl Palm. I'm a professor in the Department of Ag and Biological Engineering and the Associate Director of the Food Systems Institute. And I'm Gina Master de Casa. I'm the Associate Vice President for Operations, and I am not a scientist, but I'm going to tell you what I learned today. Okay, so we've uh, come coming to the end of an extremely interesting day on the topic of reducing the carbon footprint of food systems. It would be difficult to summarize the different topics. I think the panel before us thankfully summarized many of those points. So it helps us to make our 
statement a little bit shorter, but here's how I would like to sum up what I heard today. We need to produce more food while addressing climate change, reducing the carbon footprint that helps keep or improve profits of farmers and businesses while keeping the prices of food down. Wow, is that a challenge? I think we heard some great solutions today, some about land, some about packaging, some about livestock that were quite surprising. Um, but uh, what we did here is it's really gonna involve everybody, farmers, scientists, consumers, civil society, private enterprise, and policymakers. Currently, the discussions among those groups are not very good. They're often totally disconnected with different targets and different ideals and very different perspectives. And we really need to change that communication. And I think we heard that several times today and it was very nice that Libby's uh, majoring in that type of discourse. But I would like to now just uh, bring Gina into this conversation and she can add more about what she learned, but also how she sees the University of Florida contributing to this challenge. Sure, so first of all, I, I certainly learned a lot about the science and where we're headed. I learned a lot about the role of policy and policy making and regulations and how we can certainly do a better job if we can use the latest innovations to convince people in that policy realm to look ahead, try something new. And even when um, the young man was here from the city of Orlando, just the role of local government in making change. And the reason I even had heard of what they were doing in the city of Orlando is I went on an extension tour from Seminole and Orange counties, and they were part of the conversation. And there are so many ways we can make all of this happen. But what I wanted to talk a little bit about, and this is really giving credit to our students, is the amount of things that have changed at the University of Florida in, in just our operations. So I've been here 24 years. Um, I remember things like the big argument of whether we could get bins to recycle things in. It was huge when it finally made got here. But what's happening now is our dining facilities are, are providing different kinds of menus because consumers want them. They want, you know, it might be vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, some, um, there's religious menus. There's so many different ways that our, our customers, our students are wanting different resources. Um, it was students who really drive the efforts on campus sustainability and our office of sustainability. They're the ones who got things like composting to happen on campus, which once again, wasn't overly revolutionary, but it was revolutionary for a place like here in our dining facilities. Um, more recently, I've seen a lot of interest from, uh, from our students in farmers markets and access to local produce. And so there's a couple of places they get them. Our, we are through Gator Dining. There's some farmers markets on campus. I went to one last week featuring um, Florida strawberries, working with the Florida Strawberry Association. And we had all kinds of IFAS presence. We had students there, they were trying different kinds of strawberries. Um, a few were afraid to try the pine berry, but it was their loss because the pine berry is pretty great. That's the white strawberry. And, and then, you know, community supported agriculture systems where you can get, you can get a, a weekly or biweekly box. Um, there's meal plans with local produce, but the interest in local is forcing change in the providers to our dining facilities. They want to respond to what we want to hear. And you, now you can go and see on different menu items, where it, where the source came from, et cetera. And you heard a lot about the possibilities of being more transparent and where did it come from? How eco-friendly is this? These are the kinds of things that we could change not only by demand, but also in policy. Um, so there's certainly a lot of things. The final thing I'll say is, you know, just with the Field and Fork Farm and the work they do, really it was an experiment to see, will students really wanna do this? And the answer is yes. And they come from all kinds of majors. They aren't necessarily from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. They might be in all kinds of disciplines, but they want to learn more about it. And one of the things we're able to do is take excess produce from many of our farms, including the campus farm, and give it to those in need, mostly primarily through the, the Field and Fork Pantry, the Hitchcock Field and Fork Pantry. But we do it all over the state as well. But once again, 
the amount of food waste, I think, was something I took away as a big aha, not only as an overbuyer. Okay, yes, I have. I like to grocery shop and buy things, but just the packaging, all of that stuff to me really hit home. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that tells a lot that maybe it's the students. We all think the young are going to drive the next revolution. And I think uh, this next generation is already in charging in charge of the climate revolution. And so they can also do it through the kinds of food they want, the kinds of packaging that's required, and the whole food system that will be needed for that. So the other one, I, I just want to ask you a little bit more about how do we get this all to happen, all these different groups of people talking together. We heard from Saskia about the, the living lab. And I'd like to know a little bit more about the Florida Research and Education Centers. Are those living labs or what might need to change to make them living labs so they address these food system issues? I think this is really the future of where we're going. We already do provide living lab type opportunities because we will do demonstrations. We'll have extension programming. We will bring people in. I know there was, for example, today there was one at our Tropical Research Center about finger limes, by the way, which cool. Um, so I think there are opportunities to just make sure that people get exposed to the way uh, all these food systems work. So not only is it about educating citizens, but it's really also educating policymakers. And I know that we have an open invitation all the time to have visits from elected officials and their staffs because they are truly blown away when they get to see something real in action. And so we always have to remember, you may know how to grow something or how the food system works, the average person does not. And so finding ways just to tell that story either informally or in a formal presentation, I think are, are important. Okay, so that brings me how to tell stories hmm. so that people, not just people in this room, but outside uh, in our communities understand. And so today we heard about livestock, which is usually public enemy number one. Livestock gets slammed for everything. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, diabetes, chronic diseases, pollution of all types. But today I heard very different stories um, that there's great possibilities for turning that around. But yet I heard some conflicting or somewhat confusing. Circular agriculture, it said, livestock off the land. But then we heard circular agriculture, livestock on the land. And then that cows should not eat people food. It should be eating grass for what they were meant to be eating. So do you see that confusion? How do we, how do we go about this as scientists? We're all telling these stories and, and they are a bit confusing for me as a scientist. Well, they all could be mutually accurate to some extent and yet conflicting in the recommendations. So I think this is one of the stories that I see often on social media. Um, and it is, you know, whether you eat meat or not, whether you consume dairy or not, it, this is a real part of our world. So looking at ways to not only make things better using science, but be able to communicate the story. And, and you know, I, I, I enjoyed seeing Dr. DiLorenzo on, on, Fo on the uh, Fox News and you did look a little, um, Oh, you, you were ready, I think, to wrap up your interview. Um, and that is okay. But I, what you were showing them was how you measure um, with a yokes around their neck and, and how it all works and how you do this, the science to collect the data. And I'm sure most people don't even have any idea how you would collect that data in the first place. So just getting people exposed to all of that is really important. Um, I think that's one of agriculture's largest challenges is it doesn't always get to tell the, the best story all the time. And those who need advocates just need to keep continuing to tell the story, give tours, reach out. Okay, one, one last little bit on this, and you started to say it measurement. So we heard accountability a lot today. We heard about targets. You need data, and this is why people call things science driven. You need that science, the data behind it, you need the targets and the way to actually measure some progress or not towards those targets. And, and so I think that's a key part of the university system is to really help how people can reach targets by measuring them. You'll never reach them if you don't measure them. But the problem is it costs. 
there are costs to monitoring. That's why very often it's not done. We find uh, companies will say, we had 500,000 farmers that reduced their greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll say, well, how do you know that? Oh, because we taught them to do this. And so it's very often, um, you know, good intentions, but really it's not gonna change the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere unless we know that they're actually doing that. So I think that's a challenge uh, to our scientists. What are the proxies? What are some of the more uh, remote sensing, other types of ways to gather this information so people will be able to do it and afford to do it? And we can monitor ourselves, we can monitor each other. And, and so that's one of our challenges. I agree. And in fact, you heard when Jamie from Littman Farms was speaking about all the things that have happened in his time and how much data they collect and all these new things that they've done and invested in over time. It is incremental. You, these are businesses. They, they want to do what they can to maximize their returns. But at the same time, they're using data to get there, not just all, all the things in your memory. And in fact, I think someday they're going to be able to really show their future generations. This is when we started collecting data and the, the younger people are going to say, what do you mean before you started collecting data? Um, because the, the, a lot of agriculture was either you wrote it down or you just knew. And so I think you're right. Okay. So we have one minute left. It's been a long day. It's great to see most everybody is still here. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody, uh, the speakers, the panelists, moderators, DeWarren, there's Andrea back there, Jim. Just thank everybody, uh, all the student volunteers who took notes, who gave you badges, who worked yesterday carrying things around. Um, but before that, I'd like one final question. It's, it's about food waste. We're about to head to a reception. Um, but it was very interesting uh, data we saw mm -hmm. today about packaging and the, the carbon costs of different packaging. So Gina Master de Casa, I would like to ask you, I mean, I saw wine and pasta as the worst in terms of packaging. So how is Italy gonna solve this problem for us? Well, the good news is um, Italians probably just, uh, you know, they make the wine in their house and they just reuse the same bottles like my grandfather always did. And you're, you would make the pasta fresh every day. So get on it, stop buying dried pasta because you don't need all that packaging, right? I think that's a very good solution. And the beer solution I can't solve today, but uh, I think it's gonna make me look differently when I do go to buy some beer and possibly the other things. Okay, so thank you very much, thank everybody. You. Thank Call you. It a day. Thank and you. I wanted to say thanks to the Rights Union crew. I know you've been working hard back there. All right, so we're ready to wrap things up. And I would just want to invite uh, my boss, Bola, to come up and say a few final words of thanks to everyone. And uh, I'm grateful for your attention. You've really been a great audience. So one more round of applause for yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for being an excellent MC. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank our keynote speaker um, to have the CEO of a major agricultural company devote time to record a presentation and then attend live um, to answer questions is very unusual. So we're extremely grateful to Eric, um, to Matthew for making it possible for um, him to speak to us. We, and he gave such an inspiring, insightful talk. So, Thank you for that. We want to thank all our speakers and please bear with me, I won't mention you by name. Many of you traveled from near and far. Some of you spoke online. Some of you had bought your tickets and then unfortunately had COVID last Friday and couldn't make it. But you still gave your very excellent presentations. Um, I've heard so many good things about today and it's because of the wonderful presentations that were given by all our speakers. I wanna thank our moderators. I wanna really appreciate you. Um, we had President Fox here in the morning. I want to appreciate him. Appreciate uh, a vice president, senior vice president Scott um, for um, you know, his constant support. I, I can say that um, without any hesitation. 
thank our deans. They've all spent, uh, Gina, our associate vice president, spent the whole day with us. These are extremely busy people. And so for them to have made this a priority means so much to us. Thank you very much. Uh, chairs of some of our departments, uh, John and um, uh, Katie and so on, were moderating or speaking. Some of our faculty, Nicholas and so on, with Maria, Zinette, very, very thankful. Uh, my friend Mario, Mario and I go back, and we were in grad school at the same time in Britain, and he said, Bola, I'm going to speak online. I said, Mario, you're coming. And he did. Yesterday was his birthday. Can we just say happy birthday to him? I want to thank our board members in the Food Systems Institute. So Matthew is the chair of our board, Felicia who moderated, Sam from the Gates Foundation, um, Rob from USAID, and uh, John Ellenberger from Lando Lakes, he had to leave yesterday, uh, this morning. So thank you so much for making a point of being here. We really appreciate it very, very much. Um, an event like this is not possible. I often say I get to be the figurehead um, for the Livestock Lab and the Food Systems Institute. And you may think that's good or bad, I don't know. But there are some phenomenal people, ex truly exceptional people who are behind an event like this. And the first one is Commander Andrea Bone. Thank you so much, Andrea. The second one is Kathy Bester. Where's Kathy? Kathy is often behind the scenes, but just like Andrea, she, she does a tremendous amount of work. And Kathy was very ably supported by Shannon, who joined us recently, side working. So we're extremely grateful to them. The Warren, thank you so much for helping us. Um, so there was some, and also the AV crew at the back because there was some trepidation. How are you gonna pull this off with a whole session with virtual speakers, keynote presentation, virtual, but well, you guys did it. So kudos to you, thank you very much. And finally, we had some others who supported um, uh, Andrea and um, uh, Cheryl, um, Kathy. Um, so Jan and Cheryl and Kay, Taryn, Saskia, thank you for the Tremendous support. Thank you to Jim, our MC. Thank you all for coming. Have a safe trip home. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Future of Food Forum. Thank you. Andrea says now there's more food, so please go for it. Yeah, get a drink ticket. Uh, there's a reception right now, or it's going to be starting in a few minutes, so you can get a ticket for uh, some wine. Don't let it go to waste, and go Gators!